And welcome to the stream, everyone. Sorry for the lateness, uh, last minute technical issues. Um, how's everyone doing? Hello, hello. Uh, yeah, thanks for coming on, Zarek and uh, Patricia in private sessions for the first time. Welcome to the stream. It's been, a, it's been a while. I think last time we, we were on, uh, you, Zarek, and, and Pat and I were on uh, back last February. <laughs> it's been over a year. Yes. We do this more often. Um, we were talking about starfield and it's also my birthday and also america's birthday i guess um yeah just easy to remember <laughs> yeah easy to remember it was funny i was actually i was born probably two hours after the premiere night of back to the future the original which is odd but whatever and i always remember oh. it, i always thought that movie was kind of like my movie because they keep on even the sequels keep on referencing to 1985 which is also my birth year which is really funny Anyway, um, yeah, thanks for coming on. And uh, our, our topic of the day is general, you know, modern gaming stuff, but probably going to be talking a bit, quite a bit about uh, the upcoming Bethesda game, Starfield. And I know uh, uh, Pat and Private Sessions, they've been doing a lot of Starfield research. You're going to be doing a big uh, video on that, right, Pat? Yes. Uh, I'm going to be doing something, too. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, there'll be a fast first impressions thing, and then two months later, kind of a full deal. Yeah, I think um, how we've talked about it is me and Pat are going to be uh, sharing resources and stuff like that, sharing clips and stuff. So, yeah, I played Outer Worlds. He's played Elite Dangerous. I've played all of the above, and I probably won't be making a video on it so much as I'll be live streaming it on YouTube. Like, assuming that, you know, it runs decently. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Big assumption. I was talking to people yesterday, and, uh, they're all like console players. And I was like, you know, Starfield's going to be 30 FPS on Xbox, right? And they were oh, looking God, at me no. like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah. And also the, the AMD uh, partnership. So DLSS isn't going to be natively supported with Starfield either. So have fun, everybody who bought those, uh, those expensive yeah. GPUs. <sighs> that's so that's so annoying like I, I i i was in an argument on twitter about this um because i mean i'm gonna that if i were to play the it first out, mistake holy yeah. crap <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the second only to arguing on reddit right um but uh no i was like this person it, it's really annoying but when you when you're arguing with like an amateur game dev because then they think they know everything um which they know probably a lot more about the game dev than i do but at the same time there's just objective things you can reference reference and they're like you know, oh, that they have uh, a thousand planets, and you can you can drop you know cheese wherever. It was that. Did anybody else see that terrible IGN video, or uh, where they had like a TikToker um, talk about why Starfield's going to be thirty FPS, and that's that's okay, and that and why that's good, or whatever. <laughs> no, someone needs to link me that. Yeah, I love I love clipping this stuff. I hate that I'm in the console war algo though on Twitter now. Oh no, that sucks. Oh. <laughs> R.I.P. Yeah, you talk about Starfield one too many times. You're going to end up hearing about Sony fanboys. Yeah. Now, PlayStation like uh, PlayStation Two was one of the best consoles ever made. Like, in, as far as like good games to bad games, it was it was amazing. Uh, but like, consoles to watch stopped being good when you had to number one install stuff on it. You couldn't just put your disc in and play. And number two, the day one patches like they, they it lost its advantages and just became a um, a streamlined computer like that. You can't you know, you don't have freedom on. And I, I think the console war is silly. And I think that the the mm -hmm. Xbox people don't they underestimate how much they're really contributing to the to it being as incendiary as it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I thought we were kind of done with that. Like after the the mm -hmm. only war I thought would actually mattered was probably um, I'd say from SNES Genesis to maybe maybe Xbox PS3 because that was the last mm -hmm. time where exclusives and and those kind of things ever, uh, mattered. I mean, PS PlayStation doesn't really even have exclusives now. <laughs> They're barely even. Uh, so I mean, Microsoft's trying to buy half the industry. That's fine, but. I, I, I don't really I don't really see the the benefit in arguing, especially from a technical standpoint. I have both the PS5 and the Series X, and it's you know virtually identical in terms of performance. The only real difference is just interface and and controller at this point. From at least from what I've seen. 
I'm the algorithm's worst nightmare. I, I mean, like, because I, I like indie games, you know, the, the stuff that doesn't matter from a hype cycle perspective, like that, that's mm -hmm. all the stuff I'm excited about, like a hundred different indie games and S Steam demos and stuff. Yeah, I need to reset my Twitter algo and stop talking about Starfield so much. Yeah. <laughs> well, speaking of Microsoft, um, the whole uh, FTC lawsuit has been very interesting, if yeah. not just to hear Microsoft basically shit talking themselves and being like oh we yeah. lost the console war we had to do all of this stuff we had to buy all these companies because like sony was just beating our ass and we don't even talk about nintendo yeah it's <laughs> that that was kind of that was delicious yeah yeah which is ridiculous because nintendo is doing excellent but it's not considered a direct competitor to the other two because they're just <laughs> doing their own thing nintendo it's kind of like the only console I own because it's a party game system. You get you get uh, what what the, the 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 children call them normies who don't um, who don't know how to play video games. Invite them over. They 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 can play they can play Mario Kart and shit. You know, it's, it's a good console for that. Mario Party's fun. Yeah, absolutely. You can yeah. play Outer Worlds on the Switch. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that, that's kind of actually kind of Nintendo kind of branded themselves as that ever since the N64. N64 sucked for RPGs. I think that yeah. I think in total, the N64 had four RPGs. So it was like an absolute bomb for mm. single player games for the most part, RPGs, but for party games and multiplayer games, it was great. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, yeah, we're modern gaming. Don't you love games that uh, that come out with an immediate apology? You've seen that tapestry of like apology letters that every oh. every game comes out. Yes, <laughs> it's like a default template in Photoshop or something. Yes. Yeah, let me start, let me find the modern gaming tapestry. I think I can share it on the on the big it's, screen. It's actually on your Discord server. Like it's on your best of Discord. Channel. I will not go to that right now because I aren't no screen capping capping Discord, but I'll find it elsewhere. Yeah. And the best part too is now you have chat uh, chat GBT to write the apology for you. <laughs> Eventually there'll be a design GPT and and you know I won't have a job and everybody will be happy. Yeah. This is a smaller one. Ev eventually, that. it's like a year away. We're gonna already have that shit. Pretty crazy. Yeah, yeah actually, this, this is nuts. Like I'm looking at it right now. Like. Oh. <laughs> 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 a lot of these games aren't doing particularly well either yeah <laughs> i can't i can't load uh yeah i can't load graphics or anything. Nuts. oops okay. how many how many That's, destiny ones do we got there we in go. there oh there's no destiny ones all right <laughs> did they did bungie do that with destiny one i feel like that predates the trend De destiny two they've they've done a few oh, of those yeah. with yeah yeah it's it's ridiculous it's just like you kind of expect it nowadays where you know you just uh and and forspoken wasn't i don't think it was that terrible i think they just basically cl shut down a month after or i mean uh they didn't do anything specifically wrong other than releasing a a, a mediocre game but i think that was the, the studio shutdown one right thank you for yes. the players who oh. enjoyed forspoken i i yeah. think that um when you compare it to a lot of other games that are in the same arena ignore the story ignore the obnoxious main character for a second mm -hmm. it's it, it is it commits the cardinal sin of being boring and lackluster compared to its uh, contemporaries that's what i think yeah it seemed like a decent uh it actually reminded me a lot of uh final fantasy 15 in terms of just like the magic system and stuff like that it seemed like an okay game i just everybody just shared the the cringe story and dialogue clips and just kind of dismissed yeah. it Forspoken is going to go down in gaming history as the turning point against millennial writing. Like that's hmm. that's its call to fame. Yeah, it needed to get to that level for people to realize, like, oh, this we don't want this anymore. Please stop. And you have uh, Starfield and Emil over there sweating, like, oh crap, that's my entire writing style. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, Borderlands. Yeah. Borderlands is done. How much damage control has been done since Forspoken? <laughs> Didn't they uh, bring the interesting NPC person from Skyrim, the Skyrim mod? I think, I think so. Yeah. Uh, I never actually played that mod. Is it particularly quippy? Um, only like two out of the many, many NPCs are quippy, and the ones that are 
they're fitting. We can, uh, yeah, like, we can call that a character yeah. defect rather than yeah. just bad, bad writing. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. Like this one of them is, for example, a buffoon who's like a con man who, um, you know, he he's actually been tried and found guilty a couple times already trying to like defraud people. So it's like, yeah, of course he's quippy. That's uh, <laughs> yeah, that's his personality style. Yeah, some of the dialogue they they and this is the thing. Like, uh, I'll I'll just come out and say that I think it probably from a production standpoint only. I'm not talking about the game at all, but from a production standpoint only, the Starfield Direct is probably one of the best produced uh, marketing pieces I've ever seen for a video game. They did a really yeah. good job okay. of editing and everything like that. Like, I'm, uh, I'm not discussing the game at all. I'm just saying that from like they they the 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 footage talks to what they're speaking about. Well okay, shot, 76. nice cameras, things like that. Oh, 76. <laughs> no, it's over. A little, you know, we're, a little you know, sliver. Cut the cam, there. cut the cam. Yeah. So I kind of have to disagree. I, okay. I would say that you're right in the sense that it's good marketing and that it's doing its job, but it's horrible marketing mm -hmm. in terms of actually giving us quality information. It's all hype, but yeah. That, that That's not what it, that's for, though. It's, it's well, strung you look together... At, you yeah. look at the stuff that they did for Oblivion and Skyrim. I mean, yeah. Skyrim is basically just a 45 minute unedited sequence of Todd Howard on a stage live playing the game. Yeah, yes, I'd much prefer that. Their yeah. job isn't to give you quality information. Their job mm -hmm. is to, to sell people on the game. It's a marketing piece. So I agree it's well produced, but the, the main thing that annoyed me about it was the editing. It, they cut very fast and they placed oh, everything... Yeah in segments so the clips that i'm going to show you later um are from three different parts of the direct that i was able to piece together how mm -hmm. traveling in the game works because yeah they just cut back and forth and back and forth and it's an assault on the senses so that you watch it the first time and it's like yeah it looks it looks fine which was my response live and then it's when you actually look at it that like i completely missed that cowboy town was going to be a thing on the first watch <laughs> yeah yeah, I did a I did a meme uh, a while about a while back um, where they showed uh, seemingly an earlier version of the same town, like in an mm -hmm. earlier build of Starfield versus what it is now, which is like Western cowboy hats, you know, dust and everything like that. And before it was very stark, starkly lit, you know, spaces and everything like that. And uh, I, not to hype my meme, but it was like you know, oh wait, I thought we we're NASA punk. It's like we're howdy punk now. <laughs> the partner yeah. like, shoots the other guy. <laughs> I've been I've been describing it as Red Dead Redemption Town and Cyberpunk Town. Yeah, wow. yeah, really weird. And then there's like those weird uh, alien costume dancers that remind me of like a really kind of lame version of the. Um, I totally spaced out and wanted to sound. What's what's that kind of scummy town or scummy uh, asteroid town in um, uh, Mass Effect where you meet? Uh, mm -hmm. Trinity. I totally forgot the name right now, but um, Omega. Yeah, Omega. There you go. Someone's in chat said they're amazed anyone pre-ordered this game after '76 release the way it did. Um, I'd first like to mention that uh, Austin was responsible for the bulk of '76. <laughs> uh, Montreal are uh, sorry, Maryland. Maryland are the people who are doing this. So, yeah, uh, there was a man named Austin who made the entire game from scratch. He's he's been fired mm -hmm. now. There's nobody else responsible. <laughs> yeah, it's funny how pervasive that little tidbit is because even I believed wow. it uh, yeah. around the time yeah. of launch, and then you actually like look into it, and it's like, no, most of these people were Fallout Four devs, and some of them switched yeah. to Austin, but it was still the yeah. Maryland team. Yeah, well, the Maryland ma team made the world itself. Like the entire mm -hmm. sandbox was made by Todd Howard's team. Like so, if if you see floating plants and shit, that's on Todd Howard. Mm -hmm. Bethesda's very good at controlling the uh, the narrative. I think yeah. the most effect the mo the biggest sign that the um the direct was very successful was that the takeaway a lot of people got was the sandwich meme, and uh, like the lady stacking all the sandwiches yeah. in the ship and everything. And it's like yeah. that would come back up later when more news about the game was coming out, like that. Yeah. Oh, you're not, you're only going to have jetpacks. There's no vehicles and stuff like that. Yeah. I was seeing people talking about that alongside Sandwich Lady and, oh, there's mm -hmm. no fishing, lol. And it's like, Bethesda knows how to release uh, information to, like, th they know what's going to be an effective smokescreen. To I be have fair, a, I, I would do the sandwich thing in my game. I have on my screen the Fallout 76 credits, and mm. in red are their positions on in the Fallout 4 credits. 
So <laughs> the management st- team it mostly looks like a Fallout 4 reunion because it mm-hmm. was. Yeah. Absolutely. Someone said I'm coping. Oh, you don't want to know my actual opinion on the game. <laughs> based on all the the material that's been released oh boy yeah a couple of really telling segments here and there i've got a whole bunch of notes because uh, i rewatched it again this morning just to get a fresh memory but uh yeah i know the uh, i'm really curious about your thoughts on the how uh travel between plants is going to work because there's a there's like a three second segment in this in this latest uh video here that shows there's a landing button on this planetary yes, screen it's right now it's right now. Yeah. Yeah. Let you me see if I can it. pause. Did I just pa- did I miss yeah. it? Yeah. Just but go then, back like five seconds. You'll see the landing screen. And set, then, yeah. set landing target. Yeah. Um, yeah. And there's actually a, a secret. A uh, little bit after this, there's a part where wow. they're they're landing on New Atlantis. It's called. Yeah. Yeah. It's all and, in my clip thing. It, it it's this screen, them landing on Atlantis, and then them taking off. Mm-hmm. So I have it all like kind of sorted in that video. But Todd Howard has set a custom destination in one of the other clips. Mm-hmm. so they're very opaque about how it works mm-hmm. and i've got some game clips from other games to kind of showcase what it's not going to be and what it's probably going to be mm-hmm. uh, the most interesting thing is this is not the pilot seat this is a navigation terminal that's inside the ship yes so anything yeah. to do with planets has nothing to do with flying around in space the cockpit's just for the space segments and then you just set a planet to land on and i guess a loading screen happens Mm-hmm. yeah that's my and they might hide it behind something cool like in destiny they had the kind of uh you know light speed cinematic which would actually be a lo- just like that it looked like a loading yeah. screen um but the is this the part this is alpha centaurus yeah this is them coming up on alpha centaurus and there's actually a bug with the landing uh ui element it oh, really? uh, flashes on and off repeatedly instead set of landing SPS target screen. yeah yeah this is it set landing target um and then which they're being yeah. sneaky because they're implying that they're in the cockpit and he's sending a landing target but that's the and same that that navigation looks terminal. yeah that even the landing looks like a cutscene unless that's just like a, a fancy it a cutscene. no it's it's a cutscene it's we cutscene. know it's a it's a cutscene that's over on top of a loading screen yeah. so essentially the space is outside of the segments where i'm assuming you can free freely fly around in space in real in time space, as yeah. well but, but not but, on, on not on the ground not, so, not the atmosphere. so effectively, space is its own universe, its own big, like low detail map that you low that you can yeah. fly mm-hmm. through, and landing and takeoff is essentially fast travel. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, yeah the, it's essentially just a door on your ship mm-hmm. that takes yeah. you down to the planet. That's right. So it's not nearly. I mean. No Man's Sky has a ton of problems, but No Man's Sky was still impressive in that they they had a seamless transition from space to to ground. Oh, okay, so that's the first clip in the at forty seconds in my little clip show is okay, No Man's Sky it and how it's how its world works. It'll be a short little sure. montage. For, you of, said forty seconds. Yes. All right, let me pull it up. All right, forty seconds. All right, so it starts on you start on one planet, and you can kind of look around. You can interact with stuff. Um, and then when you go to your ship and you get in, there's no loading screens. You don't have to enter an interior. You're just in the cockpit and then you can just take off and fly to a different planet. Yeah. Um, I did shorten the flight time between planets, but it is going to have the takeoff from atmosphere. Um, it's like fast forward. You'll notice a hitch when you get to space in no man's Mm -hmm. sky, if you're going fast enough. Yeah. You might, you might see the frames drop. Yeah, it, it it unloads and loads yeah, uh, during that time. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. It's loading there, but this is still like a seamless environment. There's yes. no loading screens. There's no loading doors, as would be the case in yes. a typical creation engine game. Now, Elite Dangerous does the same thing when you're leaving a planet. Like when, when you're on when you're doing uh, Horizons or um, Odyssey content, it does the same thing. It, it hitches for a moment. Uh, while it, mm-hmm. it you can it see it starting to hitch yeah. here yeah exactly. yeah so it's like it's like lod almost like it's like loading more it's like it's actually like an algorithmic uh seed i think every planet has a mm-hmm. has like a yeah. has like a, a seed and it generates the entire planet in real time based but I on think that the static important seed. thing is that elite dangerous and no man's sky both try to create the illusion that these right. are seamless and, yeah. and they they do it fairly well 
in Where, terms yeah, of experience it's seamless and there's a yeah. funny no man's sky moment here yeah. so they did an update after i did my video which this is the same <laughs> save that yes. that added the sandworms that they were going to market yeah and so oh. the way that they are going to do it is they've literally stapled it to just the first planet that i go to <laughs> oh this is a corrupted update. planet by the way it's it's yeah. full of uh titan worms and uh xenomorphs it's great so no so matter I'm where you go sure it's going to happen yeah no yeah this is just like it's very arbitrary that like the very first planet oh yep here's that update we want to show you you can see me kind of confused and like looking around at what's going yeah. on <laughs> that's, it, that's the funny. moment right there yeah. yeah but uh yeah so no man's sky is seamless traveling some loading screen hidden loading screens going on in atmospheric transits but for the most part mm -hmm. you can walk circumnavigate a planet get in a ship fly to another planet and circumnavigate that one without any loading screens true and, and that alone like considering the size of their team yeah the game was a mess on launch i played on pc at launch and it was it was a mess but that was an incredibly impressive experience the first time it happened mm -hmm. you were like wow this is really impressive all right and, now this is my second example which is the outer worlds uh, the Outer Worlds is more akin to a traditional Bethesda game. So the right. we're in Emerald mm -hmm. Vale right now, we just went through a door. That was a 10 second loading screen. Now yeah. we're on a ship that's in, in space. space. This is a completely separate <laughs> player. Space. Yeah, it's a little you instance. Cannot, yeah, you can't no clip off of Emerald Vale and get to this spot. Yeah. And then you're going to see me. This is a navigation terminal that instantly teleports you to the different loading areas. And then eventually I'm going to travel to a different planet. This is basically Skyrim's map with extra steps. It's the same so, exact thing, basically. Starfield is this, but instead of setting the different planets in the solar system that you would fly to, you can actually just fly around. This gives me Knights of the Old Republic vibes, honestly. Yeah, and they probably yeah. had similar uh, problems team. with that game because yeah. they just didn't they didn't have as much. Okay, and then another another loading screen, and we're on a different planet. So mm -hmm. not a seamless experience. 20 seconds ish of loading screen and 10 seconds of travel time but you know you can't no clip and end up in emerald veil vale from this spot. right and then this is the game that i think it's most going to be like which is oblivion uh yeah. so <laughs> here's me traveling from cyrodiil <laughs> to a place called frostfire glade a prominent side quest here tears of the savior so the why i picked this spot is that this is a space an open world space that exists on the map but you cannot reach it without going through a loading screen, which is mm -hmm. how I envision Starfield's going to work. This is a effectively a completely separate planet, and you're going to see me show off that we can run towards where the Imperial City was. We're never going to find it. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, it's a and and the, and famously because of the, it's a they switched from Morrowind was PC platform first. They switched to Xbox platform first for Oblivion. They're running into memory issues with with how big uh, Imperial City was going to be. So they actually had to divide it into different zones, and they had to make uh, the city its own exclusive, you know, set not of just, zones. It's not just memory issues. I've I've been playing around with some Oblivion modding lately, and okay. I can tell you that the scripting engine just plain quits. Like if uh, mm -hmm. too many NPCs are doing something on screen at once. Okay. The famous story with Morrowind on Xbox was that they reboot the Xbox on loading screens. Yeah. <laughs> because it's faster than actually Morrowind's loading system. That's so crazy. all Starfield is doing over this is putting a ship takeoff animation between these screens. Now, this is where I'm going to this is my example for how the proc gen is going to work, which is that say you select a random spot on a planet, are you going to end up in a procedurally generated place actually what i think is going to happen is it's most akin to an oblivion gate where mm. you select a spot it picks from a list of templates which is how oblivion gates works there's seven mm. templates that each gate can randomly correspond to there's some preset ones but this one's a random one and then when it loads the player space this is a handcrafted area even though it's been radiantly selected mm. and so that's why i nicknamed it radiant location yeah that's a good name, by the way. Yeah, in No Man's Sky specifically, uh, when you go to a particular, let, let's say you go to an observatory, every observatory is going to use the exact same outward appearance, even mm -hmm. though the number of rooms in that observatory might be different, and the location of a barrel in one observatory, there might be a desk 
in, in a different observatory, but it's, it's, it, these are all corresponding nodes, right? That's how No Man's Sky generates its quote unquote locations. And so I suspect very much in Starfield, we're gonna see a similar thing where, oh look, it's another abandoned mine. Mm -hmm. Oh look, in place of that mine cart, there is now a desk. I you think know. they're going to be a little more clever with it. I, there's probably mm -hmm. going to be like a couple hundred, if not, say, a thousand templates okay. that will be selected when you pick a mm -hmm. spot on a planet. But it is going to be uh, for the Indigo fans here, like Daggerfall, mm -hmm. where it just, oh, it's loading city template F for this no. spot. And that's uh, what you're going to get. Did you hear Todd Howard saying that it'll be different for depending on uh, who goes there? Like it's going to generate on the fly or something like that? Yeah, I heard something like that. That was weird. What's your read on mm. that, Pat? Um, it sounds exactly right. That's been my speculation is two people can go to the same. Like, say you pick a random spot on mm. that Alpha Centauri planet that New Atlantis is on. Yeah. Two, for day one, hour one, two players are going to pick the same spot intentionally just to see if it loads the same thing at that yeah. spot. Um, so yeah, so that I, means that I there's going to totally be... So, so Plant's going to have like a basic like a template or a seed, but mm -hmm. what your experience of that planet will be will be completely yeah. different. So it'll, yeah. it'll almost kind of be... It'll kind of be... Because it's a single like player this game. The, this on screen is the natural terrain. Yeah. And then say that it decides that there needs to be a quest location here. It just takes that prefab building that they handcrafted and plops it down into the environment mm -hmm. uh, intelligently. Because, yeah, like Elite Dangerous and No Man's Sky both generate their planets in, in terms of seeds. So, like, every player who goes to that same planet, that same spot on that same planet, will see the exact same thing. It looks. Which, yeah. I want to be clear here. I'm not. I'm not uh, insulting Bethesda for this. I actually mm. think people are massively over worrying about this mm -hmm. particular aspect and not what's actually going to be Starfield's killer, which is the fact that there's like 15 loading screens per quest. <laughs> mm -hmm. And also just the downtime. Um, I, this was the trailer that kind of made me think like, ooh, this is this game's going to have a lot of downtime. Um, well, yeah, like, and I was getting a lot of NMS vibes as well from this trailer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because this clip, you'll see him, he's walking to the base, right? And there's yeah. very little you can do to augment your speed. There's the boost pack, but it lasts like five seconds. So there's a minimum walk time that's going to be to everything because there's no kind of ground traversal uh, mechanical system that they've put into this game. I'm yeah. also glad that these mud crabs understand the, the, that they're threatened with guns here and decide to like, you know, yeah. oh, oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, both No Man's Sky and Elite Dangerous both have uh, like ground vehicles. So that's another thing we're looking at is the fact that they like ta uh, the Bethesda has repeatedly said the boost pack is your way to get around. And it's like, mm -hmm. how long does that last again? I yeah, it, I mean, it's literal seconds. Yeah, I'm curious how long they expect most players to spend on a planet. Are we talking like minutes, hours? Like, I feel like that's a very important metric to understand. Yeah. And yeah. how many planets are players expected to uh, visit? And I'm willing mm -hmm. to bet we're going to see a, uh, a statistic that comes out, you know, a year or two after launch where they say like, oh, only like, like 90% of all players only visit about 20 planets or something. That means the planets are just so enjoyable that everybody wants to visit. And it's like, uh, yeah, or it could mean that people realize that they're all monotonous and they just stopped going to planets after a point. No. Yeah, that's like a big part problem with NMS is that um, is that beyond just mining and uh, scanning guys, which they actually showed in the in the Starfield Direct, like mm -hmm. almost shot for shot exactly the same thing as you do in No Man's Sky, where you scan rocks, you scan plants, you scan birds. Um, Very similar in quantities of things as well. You would expect there yeah. to be more than twelve, which is like the upper limit for No Man's Sky, but yeah, yeah. it really is No Man's Sky in that aspect because it's the same number. Yeah, I'm I'm seeing a lot like presentation wise, very oh, different. A square oh, shotgun. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, uh, we we need to. I know, I know you looked at that one before, Perfect. but but uh, yeah, just wow. not only the, not only the square shotgun, but shooting unfired bullets from from a, a square hold shotgun. Yeah. Oh, wow. Very emblematic of the of the game. Yeah. Very iconic for uh, the contrarians out there. Are, are are there any gun nuts in, I could identify what kind of bolt that is? That's probably like a, is that a nine millimeter or a... It, no, it's a rifle round, but it's, okay, rifle. Um, it's something that they've made up. All the rounds they've listed so far are made up rounds. 
Yeah, no, it's just funny. I, I and then there's no no possible reason why you would fire a a circular bullet through a non circular no, no, no. <laughs> rifling. I, and I also, don't know why you would? Yeah, I don't know why you would want square uh, uh, square barrel, anyways. Yeah, and the, and again, the the bullet the bullet is still in that shell, means it's unfired, and also it's a shotgun which uses um, shells which have little you know car tiny little whatever yes <laughs> it's funny okay can you rewind that really quick to where sure. he just put the i, I want to yeah there right there <laughs> yeah what the hell <laughs> oh my god so it's got... in the most recent one they cut out the part where they reloaded the same gun so oh, there's, yeah. no the guarantee, there's no guarantee that uh it's been fixed oh yeah. no they my. showed this gun again in the recent showcase but they conveniently cut right before it was going to reload like the frame that you would have seen if they fixed it or not they cut and this is yeah. why we have sandwich lady in the second uh in the second uh, gameplay reveal geez. because yeah because this like dominated twitter and stuff for like a mm -hmm. week everybody's just making fun of this fucking thing it's just also funny too because it's got the the classic i don't know about you guys but every single bethesda game has like weird uh, light exclusions and weird just like uh, why are these bullets completely dark while everything else yeah. is well lit things like that um, 34 and a half minutes into the uh recent starfield direct is where they show off the shotgun again oh yeah it's funny that they reuse the same footage you think they're just like okay put it's that not, in, in a deep it, dark folder it's not, it's not even the same footage it's just um it's new footage of the same gun but they didn't show us if they fixed it or not 34 minutes you said 3430. Okay, this is a good shot too. Uh, 3430. Yeah, in the environmental storytelling shot. <laughs> yeah. It reminds me of the uh the old school like Fallout 1 and 2 death screens actually. Mm. Okay, 34. This it's is just, just It should be the, the right area. It's a different weapon, but he's going to switch to shotgun in the next room. Yeah, it's going to like an SMG. Yeah, at this at this rate they're obviously offering a lot of ship customization. There okay, there's shot, shotty. Yeah. Come on, He's open it up. Second, open second it up. Second shot. Open up. Oh no! Okay. He opened we, it. We went frame oh, by frame to look and see. All right, let's let's do it. They cut it he right before it, it opens up. up. Pop it open. Uh, it's still come got on. the square barrels. I know that. Yeah. Okay. But open what it. kind of bullets go in it? Oh no! Nothing. nothing you don't see the bullets. Oh no. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My. They didn't want. They didn't want to sh actually ha go through that yeah. again. Which you think they would like go out of their way to show that they fixed it. That's crazy. Like that's free PR. Hey, we fixed this bug. They yeah. definitely. It's because they didn't. They they probably didn't. No. They probably just cut it. It's probably like nothing comes out right now. Which is insane. Uh, you know, actually, come to think of it, uh, there are a ton, a ton of mods devoted, like in Skyrim, devoted to the um, to to like turning the weapons into non paddles like because you know like mm -hmm. you have a sword and and the, if, if you look at the sword they look like like a, a freaking metal paddle or something they don't they don't look like actual swords so i i suspect it's gonna be modern community can fix that one yeah, yeah. I'm, ar I'm already hearing about that yeah it's such a minor detail yeah. nobody's gonna notice we don't have any shotgun show assets on hand oh wait we made fallout i think yeah no, no no we don't have any square shotgun shells one one of my favorite uh for favorite quotes from the uh, direct was the weapons design lead saying that his favorite weapon was using his fists. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you, you know, actually, that's a good point. During the direct, I noticed that a lot of people were saying a lot of things, but that the like the, their job as it is listed in the side <clears throat> didn't correspond to what they were talking about, really. <laughs> Like, Will Will Shin's the only example, and the part he praised was that he likes the ending. <laughs> he likes when yeah. it's over. You, you know, you know what's funny? Uh, that that whole uh, supercut of everybody's favorite moment in the game or part of the game. The first guy says like, "My favorite is," and then he gets cut off, and somebody else gets mm -hmm. to say it. <laughs> I yeah. thought that was oh. kind of funny. <laughs> Did that really happen? It, yeah, it's, it's cut where like they won't hold a shot for more than five seconds. Yeah. I have a feeling that that, um, let's go back to that other, I don't remember what that was called. That, you were, um, I'll get you a timestamp where you were at. Let's see. It was the official gameplay Square reveal, right? Now. Yeah. Official gameplay reveal. You were probably four right minutes and 54 seconds in. 54. 
because that's where the, that's where in my notes it marks the. Oh yeah, you got that noted, right? <laughs> yeah, right there. But uh, yeah, th this is they even cut a lot in this in this trailer. But this has actually like long, fairly long cuts, like yeah, maybe a minute this, or two. This is more honest, and it's still like, what didn't they show if the square shotgun made it through? Yeah, oh. and it seems like the direct was a direct response, ironically, to uh, this trailer being too revealing. And they're like, okay, let's not show the longest shots you see are like maybe seven to 10 second shots of like yep. scenic kind of visual porn, basically. But all there's the action one, is, is just absolutely blended. There's one gameplay sequence near the end that's about 15 seconds long. Okay. That was them being daring. Yeah. Uh, and so this has been my message the whole time with the Starfield marketing is silence speaks. <laughs> what they're not saying says a lot about the state of the game. Yeah. Yeah. Because if there was praiseworthy things to talk about, that's what they would be using to try to sell everyone on the product. Case yeah, in totally. point, if they fix the loading screens where it's not going to take 90 seconds like a typical Bethesda game at launch, mm -hmm. um, Todd Howard would be on stage shirtless, screaming from the rafters <laughs> with no microphone. <laughs> that they, the, the loading screens, guys, they're only 10 seconds. Meanwhile, they like subtly slipped in that, oh, by the way, you need to, you need to have an SSD to play this on PC. Yeah. Just FYI. Yeah. They said that. <laughs> They just need I to get the guy snuck that in there. But I mean, uh, Cyberpunk said the same thing. Like they're no longer going to support SSDs. But um, like it, you know, it, it'll probably work. It's just we are no longer testing them on SSDs. So this is the requirement update. They should just get the uh, Joseph Ferris, the guy who did um, uh, Brothers: A Tale of Two Sons, and uh, you know, Takes Two, and and other games when he went on went on stage. What was that for? Uh, um the way out and he just said like you know he flipped off the the camera saying that he should have won like an award for his game and <laughs> saying like you could do everything or well, maybe not everything but you could almost everything almost <laughs> yeah, like everything, no filter yes. yeah <laughs> like no filter yeah so i've been focusing on the loading screen stuff because this is not what they've been talking about and they have on mm -hmm. screen my my detailed breakdown based on stuff that they've told us that you can give or take two, but that's still 15 loading screens from I start on the ship with a oh, quest man. to I end on the ship having turned the quest in. Yeah, especially if you have to go somewhere to get to talk to the quest giver. And yeah, then like, because you know, they're not going to use the phone. No, everybody this forgets is... that phones exist. Yeah. And, and this is the thing that kind of it kind of. They, they acknowledge a little bit in the Starfield Direct where they, they want to balance between like realism and Hollywood. They're leaning pretty heavily into Hollywood. I would actually have really right. liked. I would have really liked a hard science um, space uh, exploration game. Like I mean, I guess it, that's basically more like a leader, right? But Elite. um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, like they they the NASA punk is is skin deep. They they really like. It looks like they have space magic in this game. <laughs> Does it? Is that not right? Yeah. Like they, there's some no, sort of no no no. That's that's the brilliant part. Is right at the end they awestruck us with oh yeah and by the way there's gonna be space magic like like yeah. literally last <sighs> 10 seconds yeah yeah and there's the whole alien mystical artifacts like you know uh cosmic mysticism and everything like that and for me i actually find when you apply physics to your game and uh like you have mu when you only hear the muddled sound effects of things that are that are directly in contact with you when you're in space in a vacuum mm -hmm. like you hear like a muddled like do, 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 do from your guns or whatever not that you would really hear that I'd probably have laser weapons right but you have like a do, 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 do from your guns but everything else is quiet that's actually eerie i find that quite eerie when you when you can't hear beyond yeah. your uh your ship because th there is no conduit for which the sound to travel as cool as the uh you know as cool as the sonic weapons and uh uh attack of the clones star wars you know episode two where it doesn't make a whole lot of sense and yeah. yeah, I just find that the whole NASA thing is very much just a, an aesthetic, not really, they're not, they, they, they like their, they, that kind of rule of cool, like a new, a new frontier, you know, the logistics of making cowboy hats and, and leather and everything like that in a new frontier. No, like a, a new undiscovered planet, that would be very much, you're basically got your spacesuit and maybe like a sleeping suit. If you're inside of an airtight container, you would not have like fashion or makeup or any of that kind of crap so it's just yep they kind of want to have that cake and eat it too that's what i'm kind of saying so i did notice at the beginning that uh like my, my initial reaction to poking at the direct was uh oh look 
it's uh, what looks like a a, a a gentleman's club. This is going to be a secret society. Yeah. Oh, look, mm -hmm. it's a it, th Then immediately after that, it was, oh, uh, the artifact is talking to you. Um, like, you have to collect the other artifacts. That is literally the plot of two video games and four sci-fi novels. Yes, the, per <laughs> the Perthian Beacon. Yeah, there you go. Bethesda has a hard time hiding their uh, their inspirations. inspirations it's, yeah. it's it's really bad with Starfield. Yeah, um, pretty much like, everything you can point to where they took it from, and some of the stuff is starting to like enter the realm of plagiarism. Like yeah. Fallout Three is a game where um, if you get the references, you'll be like, oh wow, this this game like really has a lot. Uh, but the thing is, is that a lot of those references are from like films from like the 40s and 50s and 60s. Yes. So most people don't. But now it's like, oh, they're like copying Firefly and No Man's Sky and like stuff that's like in the industry and relevant right now. Yeah. Right still, like, there's whole, yeah, there's yeah, there's brown coat fan communities and stuff. Yeah. So it's not <laughs> not out of the people public's knowledge. <laughs> Firefly is kind of a deep cut at this point. You know, Gen Z is not into it, but like in Outer Worlds, nobody played. Right. But Aquila yeah. City is what I've been pointing to is like one of the main suspect areas Aquila, the premise of Aquila city is identical to the premise of amber heights from outer worlds and then it's mixed with like the firefly inspiration the red dead inspiration and there's too much inspiration i don't really know what starfield's doing that's original now now do you kind of feel like uh i i forgot who said this but it, do you kind of feel like it's that them just like oh nobody's gonna notice if we basically do the same thing or do you think that they're they're their creatives are so insulated that they don't even realize they're copying other people. Because I, I heard um, that people that when they were talking about the whole synth right. uh, concept in in Fallout Four, they, they thought they were being completely original. It's like, dude, that was in Blade Runner. <laughs> no, no, no. Emil Emil knew what he was doing. Like okay. with uh, with Fallout Four, there's no way. So Amber Heights is a ostracized community, kind of in a in a hostile world that is pushing back against the central government. And they're being attacked by these reptilian creatures that they put on spikes outside their settlement. And oh yeah, by the way, that's also it, that's entirely Aquila City, like down to a T. Like in the promo for the concept art of Aquila City, they hit all of those points of hostile world fighting against the government, reptiles that have their heads on spikes. That's yeah. suspect. Yeah, that's very very similar, especially considering that they're basically like head-on competitors with that game and they're both open world space themed games like fallout fallout like open world games well there's okay. a difference between a playful reference and um just outright taking stuff yeah yeah now someone said the best thing about starfield is how bethesda can stretch there the world is built for the player mindset across a galaxy uh how, how do you think that um the, the them taking things necessarily would would play into something like that the uh the the world is built for the player like how how does this enrich the player like i i understand like bethesda doesn't um really reach and when they do reach they their reach exceeds their grasp like the civil war in skyrim or mm -hmm. um yeah it, it, what, what what's it called uh or, or the the concept of you know identity in fallout 4 like the entirety reach, of 76 yeah. yes but the, <laughs> but the point is whenever they reach for whenever they reach for like a a deep story subject their reach always exceeds their grasp and they always fumble it so like uh, this this i these ideas that they're pulling from like how do you think that they will benefit the player experience disregarding the fact that they're stealing media like that's that's fine that's fine like I, the, the good good artists are inspired great artists steal so <laughs> how how will it affect the player experience like can they actually um as, uh, like re can they actually grasp what they're reaching for this time that's that's my question no uh, i i have a feeling that because so much went into the technology and and the scope of this game that i think that if anything they're if they're if they're trying to do something deep with the story, that's probably going to suffer due to it. Like w whenever you go bigger and broader, your story almost always suffers. Um, I you think see that they're with like the much higher than than Obsidian with Outer Worlds, mm -hmm. but they've earned every like unfair comparison that gets made between them and other games, principally yeah. No Man's Sky. 
here's mm-hmm. the, here's my problem with Starfield is that it seems like a game that should be right up my alley because I love science fiction. Mm-hmm. I love Elite Dangerous. Uh, there's parts of New Man's Sky that I appreciate and stuff. I liked I like I was one of the freaks who liked the Fallout 4 settlement building system. Honestly, that was one of my favorite parts of Fallout 4. So it's like there's a lot of stuff in here that should appeal to me, but it's like, oh, this hole was made for me, but it's filled with vipers. It's like mm-hmm. That I can see the problems that are going to be with this game. It's going to have like just repetitive, radiant content that's going to get boring very quickly, loading screens up the ass. A world that I do not care about because they don't care about it. Um, yeah, Bethesda's not been interested in expanding their their lore or anything until since like since fucking Morrowind. Really, let's be honest. Hold on. Uh, yeah. So. Uh... I don't know. It's just like this game seems like I don't know who it's going to really appeal to. Mm-hmm. And that's kind of the that, that's what's getting me interested right now. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's essentially the same. Uh, sorry, were you was that Zerik trying to say something? I, I was just so, someone said that the uh, Fallout synths um, are much different to Blade Runner's androids. And I'm 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 I, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> Like we're not talking about like world building, right? Because that, that that we're talking about the themes that it's trying to play to, you know, the, the, the idea that, um, you know, what, what makes a person a person like that's, that's what they're trying Same theme, to yeah. do. Yeah. So that, that, that's all I'm saying is like, it, you know, like, who is this made for? That's a very good question. Uh, like, and I, I'm, I'm trying to figure out, like, what about what of this is artistic indulgence and what of, what of this is trying to craft a system for the player? And it just seems scattershot to me, like um, almost like the developers were just kind of given rain to make stuff. And then um, I, I don't know. I don't see when you asked who's it for. I'm, I'm questioning that because, like, I like Elite Dangerous. I I, uh, I like uh, in Fallout 4 Horizon Survival, which like amps up the settlement system. Uh, I like all of these things, um, but I can't see what this is focusing on. Like my real question is, they showed a lot of features, but I don't see a lot of connective tissue there. That's the, that's what I'm worried. Yeah, about. the experience of flying a spaceship is very different than the experience of running around and shooting a gun. Yes. So I and or the versus the experience of a settlement building system. And so mm-hmm. I think they're trying they're giving a lot of options. Yes. And we're not seeing there's like the, you said, um, the connective tissue. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it's it's kind of like I it kind of seems to me. I mean, I as we all know, uh, I think there's that famous uh, mildly famous, at least the blog post from not a blog post, but like a forum post from uh, Todd Howard talking about how he wants to make a space game and that mm. somehow proves that Starfield was in development for 20 years. That's not, that's not true. Yeah. Um, although there <laughs> was a canceled... They, go ahead. They were always dreaming about doing it, I think. Yeah, yeah. It was always a dream. 2001 IBM message... Uh, IBM uh, <laughs> user boards, uh, specifically. Google has archived them. Uh, Todd Howard once uh, offhandedly remarked about how he would want to make a space RPG. Bethesda then tried to make Tenth Planet, almost went bankrupt, and abandoned the idea. Uh, yeah, it, it's it's less that it's been in development for twenty years, and more that he it was a passing whimsy twenty years ago. Mm-hmm. I want to know: and, are we getting are they are we getting Starfield because they have something they genuinely think is going to contribute to the genre, or are we getting it because Bethesda's always wanted to make a, a space game? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and here's or here's the, the, the earliest post IP. I've seen. Um, here, let me, let me, uh, because fallout's, ca- fallout's kind of tainted right now <laughs> a new, yes. I, a new IP and they can't even generate, it, it takes them like six to seven years to produce a game. Oh, there we go. A space but RPG, a, that'd be something. There's always been a huge space nerd at Bethesda because, mm-hmm. um, you can look at the skybox in Morrowind and see like how mm-hmm. detailed the, all the space stuff is in that game and know that like somebody there was a huge science fiction fan all along. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, totally. And you get the, you know, with the Fallout 3 expansions or the aliens and stuff like that. Yeah, you, you, you see that kind of um, more traditional sci-fi, space sci-fi kind of creep in. Um, and they kind of wanted to, be, to do that all along. But yeah, uh, and the 10th Planet, for those who aren't, who aren't aware, I actually recently upscaled the, um, the, the trailer. 10th Planet was uh, published by Bethesda. And I think they 
were f basically footing the bill, possibly doing some some uh, visual effects, cinematics, and stuff like that. This was like late '90s, I think. So this was like you know pretty crude. Um, oh. I, I yeah, it's pretty. That reminds me of the the '90s era space game rush that Chris Roberts yeah. has been chasing. Yes. Yeah. Um, like the 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 Wing Commander space game that everybody's been waiting for since the dawn of 3D graphics. Yeah, like yeah. uh yeah, he did like a Wing Commander, then he wanted to kind of go broader with like I think Freelancer and now obviously uh with uh Star Citizen and and the advantage of obviously that Starfield has over Star Citizen is that it'll be released one day. But I I've, I've got to say <laughs> like Star, Star Citizen is a great idea. I, it's just it's unfortunate that this company is constantly encouraged to um just string people along uh, until yeah. their ship pack um, profits dry up. And it very much looks like a, um, a Ponzi scheme right now. It may not be, but it, it definitely looks like one. Um, mm -hmm. I'd say my biggest problem with Star Citizen, though, is um, uh, just how um, how broken it is like, at yeah. the moment. Like, it's yeah, I, it's I, super broken. I played it like, a couple years ago on a free weekend, and, and mm -hmm. I was just like, wow, how are they... How are you not embarrassed to releasing this Man. build? I mean, yeah, it's just like way, way the, too early. The community is scary, though, because like I, I've said this on my streams recently, but um, they will ban anyone from their uh, their forums and stuff for spreading what's called FUD, fear, yeah. uncertainty, doubt. And uncertainty and doubt are the hallmarks of a savvy consumer. Yeah. Um, you should always be uncertain and doubt in, in, in the face of marketing, uh, lest you be taken advantage of. What's funny? That's an investing term. Yeah. So they see they see yeah. what they did as in, yes. an investment rather than as a, a service bot. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's 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 a really weird thing where I think yeah. that I I don't think that Chris Roberts started out as like I'm gonna screw people out of money. I think yeah. he le legitimately once wanted to make the game, but that mm -hmm. became such a monster where it became a fundraising company first and like a tech demo company second. And then at, at, at somewhere along the line, they might make a game or might not. Mm -hmm. We don't know. But yeah, once the fundraising dries up, you can kind of they they, they yeah. were and it actually started the the flaw started at the very end or the very beginning actually when they when they're like, hey, we're gonna do this crazy cool presentation using CryEngine. Have ever have ever any has anyone ever made an open world space game with CryEngine before? No, no. <laughs> but we're gonna use it anyway because it looks nice. Like they they went for presentation and uh, kind of like the selling the selling hype uh, aspect of it first before actually making making sure that the core gameplay was intact. Yeah, it was the big Kickstarter rush too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I'm so, still owed some Kickstarters from like 2011. I'm, I'm been... so happy. There's some <laughs> interesting game history coming into Starfield. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy my, my big Kickstarter actually paid off and that's uh, the System Shock remake. I... Nice. I recently played that, and I'm I'm so happy that uh, I could get a uh, a solid version of that game that I kickstarted. Yeah, uh, occasionally, like probably one out of one out of five, one out of ten, end up being great. You know, Wasteland Two was pretty good. Uh, you got it. We got a cup. You know, obviously System Shock, and I'm, I'm struggling to think of more. Darkest Dungeon was good. There are there are some definite successes, but yeah, few and far between, especially early on. Some of the earlier projects were just absolute disasters. Uh, were you going to say something, Pat? I thought I don't know if we interrupted you or not. Uh, no, sorry. Okay. I'm just, I, I'm just watching the Starfield direct, and there's tons of stuff that I can always comment on from like That's every right. minute of it. Like a minute ago, <laughs> I was going to interrupt and say, "Man, these character models sure look awful." But <laughs> oh yeah, I don't know. I don't contain myself. Mm -hmm. I had a note, um, it was somewhere, I, it was right around here where they were talking, they were kind of emphasizing on stuff. They, you know, lifeless eyes, looks like a doll's eyes. They, they, they try to make them surprised. You can obviously tell that the, the script is like, okay, surprise face, raise, <laughs> raise eyebrows, you know, oh, yeah, the, but the eyes don't they're, change. They're still using the same old facial expression thing where uh, the individual lines have the, the a value for how surprised or angry or happy they are. And, yeah. Uh, I mean, that's kind of what you have to do with a system the way that they build it, but it will oh, look dated. Here, here we go. Yeah, you want to talk go. about somebody who's oh, really fucking bad. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's just every frame of picture there. Yeah. yeah. Every and, frame of painting. 
and <laughs> mi- kind of missing the point with the uh with the hero worship stuff um of this yeah. character and what people do with him like oh i'm gonna shoot him in the middle of a snowy environment that's not what people did with him but yeah they talk like about a... marketing again it worked mm-hmm. yeah people just could not stop talking about that true yeah, yeah that hits if it, it hits you fast and hard mm-hmm. and then you don't really think about it yeah yeah, that, that one character does something later where she's like, try, obviously it's surprise.exe, you know, that's the script that they're running, but yeah. but it's just like nothing moves in the face. It's just like you raise your brow, but they don't do anything with the eyes. The eyes are just so lifeless. And that's just one, one issue, especially it becomes more and more noticeable as they increase the fidelity. Mm-hmm. The animations need to increase as well because so, you, when, you, when you make the, it visually much more detailed, you can't yeah, really uh, forgive the lack of animation as much. I am of the opinion that even just in a still frame fidelity, that the Fallout 76 era character models are better than what they've shown so far with Starfield. Yeah. Mm. Really? Wow. Well, I mean, does they even have character models? <laughs> Not in launch, at least, other than the one. No, yeah, you could, they merchant. have character creation. And you make your, you can make your own custom character. Oh, oh, right. Your, your yeah, character models. Did. Okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, it's, like it's funny seeing the Fallout seventy six cutscene like staging in uh, Starfield. Yeah, that's really that's really putting me I'm off. Not, I'm not gonna say yeah. the NPCs were good, but like what they could do with fo- the Fallout seventy six era uh, graphics was better than what they've shown so far because they're using a new method of photogrammetry with this game. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and, and actually, actually, something that's uh, I just noticed actually, they talked about how they scanned like 50 or 70 faces or something mm-hmm. yeah and you just make adjustments to those those faces so they're no longer doing the oblivion fallout 3 <laughs> thing where they where you have like a completely like play-doh face where you just like yeah. morph everything they're starting with with pre-scan templates so people yeah. look relatively human i guess right which is funny because um elden ring and other from soft games have gone in that you can customize with sliders everything and gotten great yeah. effects out of those out of their character creation systems. So the idea didn't suck. They were just bad at it. Oh yeah, here's the yeah. part with the weapon designer talking about how he doesn't play with weapons. He doesn't yeah. oh he doesn't neural strikes. <laughs> <laughs> That's always a good sign, right? Mm. Oh, and this Legit. is the part where they're talking about stealth mechanics. Oh, stuff. stealth. This makes me so mad. Look look at like all the noise <laughs> they would create with these like clunky suits, <laughs> yeah. probably with like and mag this magnetic is event. Yeah, look. <laughs> it's like, you mean the hallway? Should it, should I? Is it even going to be profitable, like for me to be playing as a self character? Because everything's going to be proc gen. So is the system yeah. going to be intelligent enough to make like yeah. hallways and like vents in every building and stuff, or is it going to be a complete waste? Yeah, well, those, okay. So I vents. imagine all the buildings are going to be handcrafted, and they're going to have yes. the vent assets placed in them. Those vents yeah. are hallways, though. Yes, yeah. they're huge. Yes. Yeah. Just uh, I already skipped it. It was a, I skipped the skill part, stealth part. I was just gonna, I yeah. was gonna do uh, uh, yeah. There you go. So yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> they, they they have like dram- loud dramatic music and voiceover here, but I, uh, I'm just gonna mimic the the sound. Okay, it's like, what am, what am, what am, what am, crashing through that clunk, door, clunk, the clunk, garage clunk, door. Clunk. Yeah. All right, if the, if uh, this was clang. Clang. Really the game they could have gotten away with not doing any kind of stealth. Yeah. 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 Did, didn't people have like a power suit uh, stealth builds in Fallout 4 where yeah. you can actually like sneak around mm-hmm. with a power suit? That was ridiculous. Yeah. In Fallout yeah. 76, it's actually like that's that was the build that I was playing, and it's so overpowered. Mm-hmm. Somebody said, must have been a space rat. So Look that's at a that reused yeah. <laughs> mind placement animation from Fallout 3 with must the same the sound effect, too. Okay, yeah. so I'm I'm different to everyone else here. I love um like I loved text based games back in the day, and like I think that graphics peaked at the sprite level, and when we when we went to 3D, <laughs> we got a massive downgrade, and mm-hmm. we haven't quite gotten to the point where we have like truly beautiful 3D graphics, and I don't think like it it. So when I look at this and I see reused animations, like reused animations are fine. I don't care. Mm-hmm. Like, I, but but. What pisses me off is when I see in a in the same video game art styles that are internally inconsistent mm. in other in the, in the yeah. same video game, and that's what I'm seeing here. I'm seeing a lot of like there's some there's some play doh monsters along with some realistic <laughs> <Yo>. faces. <laughs> and the, alien, like, the aliens and the contrast with the yeah. humans and the human NASA punk uh, yes. is the term they use spacesuits. 
it, yes. it, it's like i mean it is different teams but the art director did not try to mesh these aesthetics together that's, that's what i'm saying because like i i'm i'm okay with everything look, being looking like a cartoon i'm okay with everything looking like hyper realistic it's fine but when they're in the same game standing side by side it's ugly as sin yeah and they go really goofy too like later on you see people like lounging at the beach with shorts on they're like they yeah. go like go yeah. full goof toward la later on like mm -hmm. i i like the i like the uh, the kind of hard sci-fi concept i'd like to see it look like almost like what we would imagine nasa would be in 100 years i think that'd be super cool but they don't really commit to that i don't think mm -hmm. the the alien design in particular has been a real sore spot with their marketing yeah uh, 50 variations of praying mantis, mantis monsters that <laughs> have no like everything about their design screams that they at least gave it some thought as, as to what the application of the parts that they were putting on the suits was and then you get to the monsters and it's like why would it evolve this way yeah yeah yeah, uh, and again, like I think that having mod modular bases, modular spaceships, that's super cool. Um, it doesn't look like they ta take any sort of shape into account in terms of aerodynamics yeah. and stuff. Because like they made one that looked like almost like a a, a mecha suit or a you know kind of like the Zordon or whatever the thing that the um, the Power Rangers form into, <laughs> and that that can't be very aerodynamic. Yeah, like the ship the ship building made me happy though because yeah. it looks like a it looks like a compromise between uh space engineers and the gummy ship from uh, kingdom hearts <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i can't comment on the second one i'm not playing that <laughs> it looks really intuitive though yeah it looks yeah. really intuitive well they they took out all the nuance uh from space engineers the the actual physics the aerodynamics all of that and they basically just said okay well you can snap these together and they actually affect the inside of the ship and that's really cool well, you have, what you have to remember about space engineers is that you can't fly faster than 110 meters a second, too. So yeah. So this this ship customization actually reminds me more of like uh, Star Sector, and um, mm. there's a few other ones, Space Haven, I think. But there's those are games yeah. that are like they're based around um, just designing ships and stuff in a very similar environment to like what we're seeing right now. I forgot about Star Sector, but now that you mention it, you hit the <clears> nail on the head right there. Yeah, God, you, you know what I'm thinking of. I'm that's, thinking that's of... why I'm excited for. Like, this mm. is the only part of the game that's actually got me excited for because it's something new mm -hmm. that I think might actually have some serious potential because it's something that we haven't really seen in a 3D game before. Like, yeah, you have yeah. space engineers, but it's like that's a voxel-based sort of thing. This is more uh, module-based, so I, I think there's there's potential here. Yeah, it's gonna scratch that Firefly itch that I never got scratched with No Man's Sky or yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah dangerous. absolutely. Uh, one of the coolest things that I had ever seen that will probably never ever happen was that one. This is probably like five, eight years ago. The Star Citizen trailer where they, they, uh, seemingly dynamically exit their spaceship, fly through space, and go into a derelict ship and and take it for parts like that. That yeah. concept in three D in a high fidelity game would be so freaking cool, and I'd love to do that. And hopefully derelict they have something the like that. Part, like the best part of No Man's Sky, I think, are the derelict uh, space dungeons. Yeah. yeah. I want to go to I want to play No Man's Sky and try that stuff out. Mm. So like in one of my uh, in my upcoming video, I have like a, a tier system for uh, mm. for rating DLC like a like, you know, S through F. And I said like S is DLC that's so good. It justifies playing the base game mm. just to play it like Shivering Isles. I'd consider S tier and yeah. like A tier would be something essential. And that like freighter stuff looks like it might actually be S tier. Right. So. I might I might jump into No Man's Sky for like a few days and just try that out. You know, Have there you... was a No Man's Sky update that added to Normandy, right? Yeah, that's that's a um, what do you call it? An expedition. Uh, yeah, it was an ex that was a seasonal thing. So if you want to shot at getting that again, you have to wait until around Christmas because they do their their seasons like rapid fire around Christmas time and they mm. with accelerated progress. Mm. Yeah. So, so one thing I was going to bring up earlier is that uh, I actually had flashbacks. I'm going to pull this up here. Hopefully I can do it. This is, uh, you might, you might remember this game. Yeah. yeah. So this is actually what I what remind me of, the modular sort spore. of uh, construction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Spore. What was that 2008? 2008, was that, was that Spore? Um, yeah. And uh, it was very polished. Um, most of it was cosmetic. I think occasionally the buildings and, and vehicles and stuff would have 
you know, buffs or whatever. I think the vehicles, like if you add a cannon on the side, I don't know if I have any any vehicle. Oh, here's a monster yeah. customization. But uh, uh, you could make your own vehicles, and they had, um, yeah, here we go. They had yeah. guns to the uh, the ship and everything like that. And those would technically be just like, and, and, and this, would, this would have been really cool if they was expanded on, but just like the original cell stage, adding like mouths to your side would actually become weapons. Yeah. So it did I, affect your gameplay, but... I maintain that if, um, the, like, Spore Galactic Adventures, if that expansion pack had been an extension of the space stage instead of its own little side activity, yeah. that, like, it, it would have dominated. It would have, it would have, it would have exploded. Yeah, Spore, Spore was one of those games where it's like, if they just focused on, I, I think, the creature stage and the, um, the space stage were both, like, very mm -hmm. good. If they just focused on those two things and just made that the entire game, it would have been so much better. Yeah, honestly, the, you can kind of track the uh, the sort of DNA of uh, late game. The, the final stage of Spore was shockingly similar to No Man's Sky in terms of concept. It was like you go yes. to thousands yes. of different planets, you you explore, you get resources, whatever. Um, no Man's Sky came out, and then it, it like seems like you know every decade they try to do the same thing again. So it seems like Starfield is trying to do it again, and just it's it's the I, I call it like the 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 game of all time. It's like yeah, so many people have tried to make this game. You know, Star Star Citizen. Yeah. I'd say Elite Dangerous is basically going this route too, but it's like mm -hmm. that's trying to fly under the radar. Uh, but yeah, yeah, so many people have tried to do it, and it's like I'm looking at Starfield. I'm like. Bethesda's not the people who are going to be able to pull this off. Like more, like more competent people have tried to do this and they failed like utterly. Yes. Yeah, it's it's interesting that it, it looks so much. It, it's seemingly so much more polished than the previous attempts, but at the same time, it's so much less ambitious yeah. because they they're so married to their tools and their production process that they still want to develop a game just like they were developing Skyrim and Fallout and things like that. Which whereas, is like, yeah, that's fine. That's that's honestly so. When I was doing research into Colossal Order, who made uh, uh, City Skylines, they yeah. are very much about their process and their team and stuff. They're like, mm -hmm. we had nine people when we created City Skylines one, and we mm -hmm. expanded to thirteen. We're up to thirty people now, and we are not aggressively expanding or anything like that because we that's are very focused on the culture of our studio and our pro and our production pipeline and stuff we are like we value that very much and it's like that's a winning strategy for long-term survival in any yeah. industry and if bethesda just focused on that because i think they do have a very unique culture and yeah. i think honestly i think todd howard is a good manager too i, I just think they're like mm -hmm. a pretty well-run company it's just like focus on that and just keep making the games that you can possibly and technically create but, yeah. but like starfield starfield fallout 76 they're both like very scary, like uh, examples of them like just trying to get way too ambitious for what their team have, and what their tools can do. Have you seen the Jason Schreier uh, article about um, uh, what happened to Arcane? Oh, yes, yeah. <laughs> so they're all under the same banner, and like my Microsoft to Zenimax to all of them, like id yeah. Software, Arcane, and Bethesda. And so it's kind of scary to look at, you know, T Todd Howard is probably the uh, the goose that lays the golden eggs who they're kind of afraid to touch, I yep. suspect, because um, Todd Howard is independently wealthy now. He owned a good amount of stock in ZeniMax Media. And when Microsoft purchased that stock, uh, he was paid out like everyone, like all the other stockholders. So um, he, d he doesn't money. need to work. Like yeah. he's he's just doing because he wants to. Meaning that if Microsoft screws with him, he could just walk. He strikes me as the type of person like he might mm. be really one of the only people at Bethesda who's keeping the wolves at bay. That's like what I'm thinking. Pete Hind strikes me as the type of dude who like he'll do a deal. He doesn't give a shit. Mm -hmm. uh, Emil just wants to. He, he just wants to make his games, and he doesn't care what it has to, what what it's going to take. But mm -hmm. Todd strikes me as the type of person who's like, no, no, no. We don't want to like so one of the things like people always say like oh why are they sticking with creation engine blah 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 like just get just get on unreal Four. it's like you have to understand that they have people who've been working there for like two decades now mm -hmm. they know those yeah. tools inside and out if you try and like switch those people over to like uh unreal engine or something they're likely to just retire because it's like i can't learn these tools now or yeah. their productivity is going to drop off the like off the charts 
So like Todd, like strikes me as the type of person who understands that. And it's like, no, we should make incremental changes, but stick with the tools that we have because that's how our workflow works. And we want to retain that talent. We want to keep them here. Yeah. But, but, but it also lacks the uh, programming staff, the, like, the actual yeah. numbers and the quality of staff to both implement these new features to their games and wrestle with the new engine. Technical yeah. debt is something that they like. We're going to see uh, come home to roost with Starfield. I suspect. <laughs> yeah, I, I think we saw it with Fallout seventy six, and that was mm -hmm. the reason for the longer production and the delays with Starfield. Yeah, is they yeah. realized how bit bad of a tech debt problem that they were suffering, and we're talking about a company that was years behind FOV sliders and V sync options, mm -hmm. and yeah. you're expecting them to put in DLSS. Like, yeah. <laughs> They're, they're yeah. like touting, they're touting like volumetric lighting and stuff. And it's like this stuff that's been around since like mm -hmm. 2010, 2011. Mm -hmm. Not even yeah. for ray tracing, just volumetric yeah. lighting. Yeah. And if you ever pop up in the options in like Skyrim, you have less options in that game uh, from a visual standpoint than like a 2001 game. You still yeah. have Fallout 76 did not have a V Sync toggle option. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, oh, yeah, I had remember to go to the how long. Remember yeah. how long it took them to get off of the changing the options in the launcher? Mm -hmm. They were still doing oh, that until yeah. like Fallout 4. Yeah. Yeah. That's super annoying too, because like you want to pick one thing. It's like, oh, that's not an in game options. You can just, you, all you can do is change LOD options basically and like a couple other things. Otherwise, I had to go back to the launcher and yeah, it's a, a nightmare. Um, yeah, my favorite. My favorite is uh, Oblivion, where every time I load up the game, uh, the launcher, anytime the launcher pops up, it resets my uh, my settings yeah. to like medium. Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, had, I had to go I, through that because I had a new GPU with that Oblivion footage. Yeah. I run all the Bethesda games through Mod Organizer these days, so the launcher yeah. doesn't exist for me. Yeah, yeah, that's the way to do it. Yeah. Or like yeah. OpenMW now for Morrowind. Yep. OpenMW, <laughs> so. Daggerfall, Unity, and. Um, uh, auto yeah. organizer for anything remaining yep yep yeah i'm not a spiritual uh, man but uh, I'm i but gonna i say this about i'm gonna say this right. about pete hines i don't think he's a destructive influence of bethesda because he's not really on the team so much as he's right. pit. he's their pit bull and they bring him out anytime a <laughs> journalist wants to talk to them that they don't like i'm not i'm not uh, i'm not making any kind of state uh statements here I'm, I'm not puffing myself up or anything i'm just saying i made a video titled pete hines need to change his approach and where I said he should stop talking about lore shit, and he he fr a a after that video he started saying I'm not a lore guy. Like his yeah. response to that shit. I'm just saying. Like, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Pete Hines' entire job is just to stonewall the millions of questions that Bethesda gets on a daily yeah. basis. It's important. Emil, understand... on the other hand, Emil is a bad influence in the studio. <laughs> Uh, about Pete Hines. Pete Hines is a PR guy. His job is to talk to uh, like big outlets and and maybe even a big YouTuber. His uh, his job is not a community manager, which is the people further down on the totem pole. Yeah. So they're different jobs. Yeah, I'm almost gonna. I can kind of see that a little bit. Like I almost don't really see Pete Hines much anymore. It almost seems like good bad, mm -hmm. good cop, bad cop. Like if they want to talk yeah. about get people hyped up, they bring out Todd Howard. If they want to have somebody mm -hmm. kind of like answer the the tough questions, yeah. they bring out Pete Hines because oh, yeah. Pete Hines doesn't well, have to be liked. <laughs> like I said, uh, Bethesda Austin versus Bethesda Maryland, Zenimax versus Bethesda mm -hmm. Softworks, and then Pete Hines versus Todd Howard. They always yeah. have an alternate for an alternate fall guy. Pete yeah. Hines' yeah. entire job is just to be an asshole to you. Like if I ever got a interview at bethesda and it was pete hines i would cancel yeah <laughs> i i would want to honestly i would want to interview emil because he's the type of person like he just cannot control his mouth so like i could give him a prompt and he'll just run with it yeah yeah you know he's like he'll his, his italian you know hand gestures and, you know. <laughs> and the weird camera angles they do with emil yeah, so weird. It looks, it looks like it, it kind of reminds me of that one shot. I do see that trailer of uh, the Flash movie where like Batman's like from like the waist from the waist up, and it's just a really mm -hmm. weird, awkward shot. Uh, and it's that eight forty four in the Starfield Direct. Uh, eight forty four. God, you have like timestamps for everything. A right, little, a couple of seconds before. Oh, that guy's that artifact coming together and i just like again four yeah. four novels <laughs> this angle right here <laughs> the dad yeah. got oh and by they the way these are your romance stool. options 
Oh, oh yeah, that yeah, the little the four uh, romance options. They're all here. Gay romance so, with cowboy. Oh my god, I, I get to. You mean I get to? Uh, I get to romance Valdez. Yeah. It's it's a straight woman, gay woman, straight man, gay man. Just it's like just, cyberpunk. Yeah, it's just like. Yeah, I mean, it, it could be different, but I, that's how, what I think is going to happen. Yeah. If it, I they, can't romance the cowboy, then uh, there's no point. Yeah, this this line right here really just stuck out at, at me. This is the charismatic guy, right? None of his none of his uh, suit or anything screams i'm the charmer and yeah. you know you know you know what how they wrote that how they how they kind of captured his essence of of a, the kind of smooth talking charismatic guy this is the line he says you know what i hate about those pirates completely resi resistant to my otherwise irresistible charm ah uh, yes the school <laughs> of uh, 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 uh japanese cartoons do this a lot it's it's a famous it's a famous saying um uh, it, just sorry uh, not tell, don't, uh, th then maybe show, but then yeah. definitely tell four more times just to be sure. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Three minutes later, do a flashback of that scene where you're told, you know, yes, yes. In, in sepia tone. Yeah, then you're good. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> and then the romance options later, it's like the cowboy guy is talking to you and it's like, I don't know if I've ever loved anyone except for you. <laughs> oh, yeah. that's, that's, no, no, you joke. That's literally Beckett in Fallout 76. Uh, amazing. Oh. No oh boy. Is it plagiarizing if you're copying yourself? Yeah. If you don't credit it, yes. He looks like but... the scout from I don't know. I'm getting I'm getting the scout vibes from Team Fortress 2 yeah. when I saw him all the just scout there. Vibes. <laughs> the way he's sit, like the way he's Honk. sitting up in a way that's like looking down at you. He's the yes. only one that's framed like that. Yeah. Yeah, even the even just like you know how difficult it is to to fly in outer space to to be an astronaut like it's it's even more they're more strict than the military in terms of like what you can do like we saw back there yeah, people you make with, a mistake with, and everybody dies yeah yeah um just like little minor things like nose piercings uh what if you're around a big magnet uh long hair what if that gets in your face you can't touch your face in a space yeah that yeah. guy i have long hair they would shape me down like I like I was a sheep yeah. if I went if I became an astronaut. There's no way they would accept mm -hmm. that. You know, I noticed there's a lot of uh, like bullets in this. Um, yes. Bullets. Yeah. The bullets are um they 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 pollute space and like with gravity like they they become like a hazard in the future. So oh that, yeah. Even even if yeah. you're say you're a pirate, you would want to yeah. use caseless ammunition over bullets. Yes. Just because you don't want to you don't want to fill the ship up. That's and right. there are people who are in the camp of, oh, the bullet's going to tear up the hole. We don't know how they're approaching hole yeah. integrity in this game. I'm going to imagine that they're not going to account for that. But, um, but the, there's so many science fiction series where they they use energy weapons specifically because it would just heat up the hull, right? Mm -hmm. That that that's so. I'm just like casings everywhere, hitting people. It's you're yeah. Right. Imagine going through uh, bullet casings at light speed. What kind of damage that is? Like that's actually one of the big dangers of space uh, mm -hmm. travel is that mm -hmm. you get these these little tiny microscopic meteors meteor showers through space, or uh, they're talking about meteor showers, whatever they, whatever you call the uh, micro asteroid micro asteroids yeah. going through your ship at hypersonic speeds, like like supersonic bullets in in an in a vacuum with no uh, medium to uh, decelerate it so right. they just go at crazy speeds yeah uh, things like that we're getting we're getting planet cyberpunk and planet red dead and i don't know how oh, you could watch yeah. the direct at this point and not think oh. that this sucks yeah, yeah it looks yeah. terrible yeah i agree uh, i but, love the Pat, club you were talking about weapons and i, I want to hear more of your opinions on the weapons that they've showed uh, besides square shotgun like uh, like you seem to focus on on this a lot and i want to hear what you have to say about it um, there's some stuff with the zero G that they're doing correctly, uh, with yeah. recoil and versus like energy weapons that are no recoil. So that's good. The tech design, so, um, I'm sure even bigger gun nuts will place where all they're pulling things. It reminds me a lot of the expanse style weapons, these very blocky, uh, weapons with added gadgets and features on the side, um, mm -hmm. like ammo counters and stuff. Um, the weapons haven't been too offensive. There is the occasional Warframe gun that I see that kind of makes me shake my head. 
Um, but for the most part, it seems to match just enough with the NASA punk suit aesthetic that it doesn't offend me. Okay. I mean, like No Man's Sky has squirt guns, so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it can't get worse than No Man's Sky. Uh, yeah. In, in those respects. Okay. I was so curious oh, about oh, the. Uh... And six shooters and shotguns are fucking stupid in space. Just FYI. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah uh, oh yeah and actually reminds me of something at the end they're talking about uh what everybody's favorite thing was i wrote it down one of the guys said uh his favorite thing about the game at, possibly half jokingly said uh lever action rocket launchers is there ever a, a reason why a lever action rocket launcher would be efficient space weapon <laughs> no because to have a, le a lever action is a reloading mechanism so you'll yeah. have a tube of rounds, you run the lever, and then when you run it back, it puts the next round in. So that mm -hmm. would imply a rocket launcher that has multiple shots. Yeah, it might as well be, just be barrel, like a, have a barrel where you have like a eight rounds or whatever. Yeah, right? you, there's no point in doing a lever action anything these days because of single action and double action systems. Yeah. Um, so I would be I would be starstruck and amazed if they said, "Oh yeah, shotguns and revolvers are a thing, but they're only used by planet people. They're not used by space pirates or anything." Aww. Fucking shocked and amazed if they did that. Yeah, I, like just the, just imagine the logistics of getting a shotgun to another planet. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like like you would you would get uh you would only bring stuff that is like star like space ready nasa equipment basically so and crafting a shotgun from scratch I, mean, I, I don't know it just seems like there's way more efficient things you could do yeah i don't see why they would prefer those weapons other than they are actually larping as uh as cowboys mm -hmm. yeah again they wanted the the firefly they wanted their cake and eat it too they want to be nasa punk but they also want to be firefly they also want to be cyberpunk they also want to be mass effect they also want to be uh, what else? What else did they borrow from? I don't know. They're just like it. it uh, is, it's cool. It gives yeah the expanse uh, and expanse is actually a lot more hard sci-fi than this is. Yeah, expanse expanse takes into consideration you know gravity uh, to to go even moderately fast between different planets in our solar system. They have to get this special drug pumped into the back of their neck and yeah. to overcome the extreme uh, g force of going that fast. So they take that into consideration. I don't think there's sound in space either. So, yeah, I, I just it. They're adding a lot of personality with it, with the with the this video, especially that kind of cringe producer talks about how she has sandwiches and and she likes to make mechs out of ships or whatever. I will I will say about the expanse because I've been watching it lately. There is stuff that they get wrong, particularly with atmospheric pressure dynamics. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main like offending, uh, not hard sci-fi element to that show. Yeah, I'm sure they get a lot of stuff wrong, and they might actually have a little bit of sound in space. I, I don't remember, but um, BSG did some things well, some things not. They they didn't have sound in space either, but they did, it could occasionally did something that was like, yeah, that kind of feels right. But uh, yeah, yeah it, it's all it's all Hollywood eyes to a, a greater or lesser degree. But see, I I saw the sandwich part as personally relatable because i i do hoard certain items that have no functional value in these in bethesda games <laughs> like I, I i do do that however i also understand that it's marketing on an, on an intellectual level i know like I, i'm 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 being targeted and yeah. you know my my quirk is being targeted and they're they're using it to um kind of um you know to humanize everyone and try to keep oh uh, keep away from the fact that um they're, you know, obviously they're, they're trying to sell the game. And um, my main concern has been the, the connective tissue between everything. I've mentioned this before, like how like, I, I love the idea of building outposts, but how does building outposts uh, connect to us going to space and visiting a capital ship? How does us uh, b visiting a capital ship um, connect to um you know, going into to New Atlantis, like what 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 creates a core gameplay loop out of this? And that's that's my concern. Uh, yeah, apparently. it seems Fallout like 70, a Fallout seventy six would drive you insane then, because that yeah. is a game <laughs> of like walled gardens, basically. Yes. Nothing interacts with each other, and it all feels extremely pointless. I did all story content in Fallout 76 up until the end of Brotherhood of Steel, like the first Brotherhood of Steel release. You, uh, you've basically done everything. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 
Yeah, it, it was it was so unimpressive that I just dropped my ideas for a video. I know I know you guys did your did your four. I know uh, Pat, you did your four videos, but I just looked at it and I said, "This doesn't speak to me. I'm not enthusiastic mm -hmm. about this." I, I don't like. There are like games that like something about it will just bother me. So I'll talk about what bothers me. But in this case, like, it is so lukewarm. I like being the Wasteland hobo in Fallout 4, going and collecting the trash from, mm -hmm. from dungeon to dungeon. But Fallout 76 doesn't do anything with it. And it doesn't, like, because your, your, your player settlements are so, um, so completely underwhelming. Like, yeah. You, and, and it just, everything about it from story uh, onward is lukewarm. And, and unless you are either playing it for the social experience with your friends or you're a gambling addict for um, the legendary weapons, there's no reason to play that game. There are better games out there that do everything that Fallout 76 does. So, oh, I would yeah, argue that yeah. even playing it with your friends is a terrible experience mm. because the, the quests stop functioning in uh, co-op experiences. So really, the only thing Fallout 76 has at this point is mm. the gamblers who are hopelessly addicted to it. Yes. When, when I said that Morrowind is a more functional co-op game out of the box, <laughs> that was not a joke. <laughs> <laughs> the reason yeah. that my video's title is about like the game not having functional co-op like there's a reason for that it's like because i went into that game expecting like uh good co-op that's what i wanted it for and then uh yeah it's just it, it fallout 76 is fascinating because there was so many things coming from fallout 4 where it's like okay here's your here's your attempt here's your chance to do a second pass at like settlement building yes. weapon customization stuff and at best it was a sideways like Okay, it was like a one to one copy over from the systems in Fallout 4. At worst, the systems actually got worse or they did. got abandoned really entirely. Did. And it's yeah. just like, it, Fallout 76 did so much damage to my hype and expectations for, for, uh, for Starfield. Mm -hmm. Because it's like, wow, they did not learn the right lessons from Fallout 4, like at all. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I still I, remember. Uh, sorry. In um in the, the like the no clip interview for Fallout seventy six, they mentioned that they had to rip out a bunch of Marwin code from Fallout Four. I, I remember that. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> That's awful. <laughs> yep. Uh yeah, no, I just I, I was I was waiting till you guys were done, but I, I paused on that one that one shot. Let me see if I can find it of the um of the cowboy guy with like the space gun. And I just you think it's it's uh you almost like there's like a cynical angle. It's like people like Fallout New Vegas, so let's let's give them cowboys with with. No, with... it's worse than that. It's really? Red Dead, because <laughs> yeah. Red Dead was 2018, and that's when they started. Working oh this yeah, game. you're so right. They're like five way, five years behind. Yeah, Red Todd Dead Redemption Two was on the mind, and when Todd they came up Howard. with all this stuff, Todd yeah. Howard literally stated this game is more Red Dead Two than it is No Man's Skies. Like mm. I shit you not, this is a quote he said because we have a cowboy town. Yeah, so oh, no. that's it. <laughs> My question is, will I be able because in Fallout 76, I did try doing a cowboy build, but there was no fucking perks to synergize that build. Will I finally be able to get some cowboy perks in this game now that it's like being featured in the trailers? No. Handguns <laughs> will once again yeah. suck. <laughs> yeah, that's just that's just wild. I don't I don't get that. I I mean I it just seems like they're trying they're almost like trying to appease to everybody like okay well if you want to just hang out on the beach in a, in a beach planet mm -hmm. sure why not if you want to be a cowboy in the cowboy planet why not uh, if you want you to be uh not nasa you know larper why not like they're just gonna fallout, it's like a kitchen sink fallout new vegas has like cowboy synergy perks where you can make a yeah. it's like a, an yes. actual cowboy build with it <laughs> <laughs> I, I am currently doing a uh, a Tale of Two Wastelands run where you started in Fallout Three and you go through to New Vegas. Um, Benny shoots you in the head and resets you to level one, but you keep your storyline mm -hmm. perks. Um, and um, yeah, but one of the things I looked at was the possibility of doing a cowboy build, and it's true. Like it, it is actually true. That's. Uh, yeah, that's... doing the degenerate gambler builds in uh yeah. in new vegas those are my favorite just stack luck yeah Get banned from all the yeah we it's... don't even have attributes in starfield so, so there goes that my week one run of 
it'll be during the patch period, so it's not going to mm -hmm. be very long. But like, say the first week to get the first impressions, sniper mm -hmm. build. I mm -hmm. got to see how bad stealth archery is. <laughs> <laughs> oh no! <laughs> I will definitely live stream the game. I can't. I assuming it like runs well. But that, that's yeah. that's the the real uh, question is like if it uses like a hundred percent of my GPU and I can't you know spare the extra to stream. I'll just throw up my hands and say, um, I'm going to make a low quality video out of this. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, well, the specs have to be, are, the minimum specs are under what Gollum, Lord of Ring Gollum specs, right? <laughs> yeah, well, did you see well, Lord of Ring Gollum has uh, a no texture texture, which is 134 megabytes? What? No texture texture? <laughs> it's, the te it's the default texture if it fails to load. It's 134 oh, no. megabytes. Oh, no. Oh, no. That reminds me. Uh, there's this great little tidbit. It was actually an article that um, Jeff Keighley wrote back when he was a journalist. Um, he did a whole sort of retrospective on Ion Storm. Uh, mm -hmm. Back in the day, they were like, four, right after Quake, um, John Romero went and a couple other uh, id software guys went and started their own company, and uh, they had really a really hard time. Their their first like major game was uh, Daikatana, but it ended up releasing like many years later because of <laughs> running into tons and tons of uh, development Indigo. hell. Right? Say, say the that? say the Daikatana line. <laughs> oh God, it's been so long. Uh, uh, oh yeah, John Romero is about to make you his bitch. Suck it down. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Amazing. Um, but uh, that reminds me of this one story that Jeff Keeley was talking about in, the, in his article. Um, it's actually a good good article. He's a good writer. Uh, I love him or hate him as a presenter or whatever. Um, but uh, there, during development, they were running into crashes, and they had no idea why. Just the game would just randomly freeze and just like completely melt down, and they had no idea why. And they'd been hiring, like they'd been, they'd lost staff, they'd gained staff, they new new artists, whatever. And they realized they they track they tracked down the problem. And this was like back in like late '90s, so we're talking like Quake Two era, right? Um, the the problem that they ran into, and they they identified it, it, it would happen whenever somebody shot a bow. And this is a game that spanned different, you know, time periods, or whatever. So there were bows, there were space guns, whatever, right? Um, and they realized that the arrow texture was 1,200 pixels long in like Why? a 640 by 480 game. <laughs> Why would you do that? The artists didn't know what they're doing. They they like it, just like completely incompetent artists, and that just reminded me of that that whole Gollum story. But yeah, it was funny. There was actually crashing the game whenever somebody shot too many arrows. <laughs> there's a there's a Gloomwood story of them discovering a bug where uh, torches would fall through the ground, and it's normally innocuous because you're not in the level long enough. But this guy AFK'd overnight and like bricked his save because the torch just keeps falling forever there's no like culling system oh and uh, mm. so like by the time he got up eight hours later and like looked back at the game it had fallen so far that the game was struggling to uh calculate the physics yeah uh, elder scrolls one the arena has uh no protection for you w just picking a node say say you go to white run and then you immediately turn away from the city and start walking it has no protection to stop you from going to the point where it will break your save true that's incredible uh yeah. you want to you want to want to laugh here you go uh starfield recommended system specs right yeah um <laughs> processor uh amd ryzen 5 3600x uh intel i5 uh 10 10 whatever k right 16 gigs of ram not too bad right it's recommended um gra graphics radeon uh rx 6800 xt nvidia uh, rtx 2080 2080 yeah. so that's a, the yeah. 2080 generation right no way yes uh no gall they're they're lowballing that one <laughs> probably <laughs> yeah but but like because here's like, yeah. th th those cpus are like those are pretty beefy cpus yeah. for, uh, for those mm -hmm. unaware while those, I'm so... uh, those graphics cards are like what like two generations old at this point those are like graphics yeah. cards from like 20 from like 2018 it's, it's basically I... saying you need a 30 series card which that's not that impressive for like what they're supposedly showing. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm and, assuming this is not max. This is probably like decent frame rate at, at 1080p recommended. Yeah, well, I'm guessing they've always been a CPU heavy game. Yeah, currently. but uh, I'm still rocking a 2080 Ti. That's still a pretty good card, and I bought that uh, I think uh, 2019. I want to say, mm -hmm. but uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, yeah, 20 uh, RTX 2080 and a. Um, uh, Ryzen 5 3600 or an Intel i5 10 
uh, 10, 60, 100. That's for Starfield, right? Want to yeah. guess the uh, recommended specs for <laughs> Lord of Ring? <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Okay, so processor Intel Core i7, 8700K, <laughs> or Ryzen 5 3600X. That's the same. Yeah, they have the same uh, AMD, but they have a much a much more advanced Intel. Yeah, yeah, oh. they both. That's so weird that they didn't. Obviously Listen, it's doing. optimized for AMD, just like Starfield. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Shatteran's so, asking about low spec gamer. He has actually stopped uh, coverage. He just occasionally does like a little uh, piece now. He, he's he's done. It's like, it's a hard fucking yeah. business to do. Oh yeah, yeah. That's tough. Yeah, he he's he's done with his like retro videos where he tries to like get you get you into like a, a lower spec game. No, like he's done with that. That's rough. Um, yeah. So so a uh, Lord of the Ring Golem, sixteen gigs of RAM, just like Starfield, right? But here's the kicker: uh, recommended specs, RTX thirty seventy or <laughs> AMD RX so sixty seven fifty. So they. The 3070 is definitely going to be higher than 2080, and, I think, and right? For somebody who, anybody who hasn't seen what the game looks like, <laughs> I implore you to research this because you will be amazed. So based on that alone, the uh, Lord of the Ring Gollum is a better game than Starfield. I think that we can all agree on that. Mm. Yeah. True. <laughs> High fidelity. <laughs> anyway, I thought that was funny. Oh, that's terrible. I can't wait for the, uh, for like the, week week one week two mods for a uh, starfield that's just like mm. optimized textures and stuff like that here's yeah. an extra, here's an extra free like 50 fps boost <laughs> i remember that with with fallout 4 holy yeah. crap you want to talk yeah. about a game mm. that was like rough at launch for like, gonna be like cyberpunk where there's going to be weird windows settings that you can change yeah. to get 20 extra frames yeah no in fallout 4 to this day if you go down to the downtown ruins like oh, yeah. it it it, mm. it, it there only is a... recently, only yeah. recently on a 4080, am I able to break like 80 FPS in downtown yeah. Boston? That's there, like, that's being generous. Like it still is... goes down to like 40. No, no, no. There, there's a mod. I don't remember what the mod is called or I'd recommend it, but they like they rebuilt it from scratch. And apparently like <laughs> it look it looks exactly the same. Like it, it but <laughs> un underneath, like it's been optimized to hell and it, like functionally the player will see no difference in terms of like where to go what to do um but underneath the surface like a lot like a ton of extra stuff has been culled like uh like we're talking buildings that go down through the ground and intersect with other buildings causing like uh like physics conflicts and stuff <laughs> uh, yeah all that stuff inside of the downtown dc ruins in fallout 4 I think I just saw on this uh, on the yeah. screen when she took away the when they took away the sandwich, it left oh. like a uh, ambient occlusion like burn mark. <laughs> and uh, Fallout 76 <laughs> had that so bad. Uh, yeah. The ambient occlusion in that game was rough. It might it might also be like temporal anti-aliasing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, maybe. Yeah, that's it. I think that was okay. 76's problem. OK, so um, again, like I don't I don't I don't weigh graphics that hard. However, Fallout 4 and Fallout 76 both had awful wet textures like oh, the, yes yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh. like, you were like wrapped in plastic or something <laughs> the puddles in fallout 4 yeah this seems, to, this seems to be the thumbnail sandwich yeah yeah Damn. oh it's so inflation cynical. <laughs> it's such a cynical marketing thing no my favorite my favorite was when we discovered that they removed that they combined food and aid again even yes. though they broke it apart in Fallout 76. Why? And and the no, 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 this is this is the best part. So so they've been showing like all the food in this, right? Like they heavily yeah. showcase it. It gives the same exact stat buffs as uh Skyrim's, where it's just five HP when you eat okay. it. Did you know in uh Fallout 4, if you type in uh help uh and then the uh, like say Brahmin, uh it'll come up under the console as alchemy. <laughs> really yeah, i'm serious that's yeah, funny yeah, yeah. yeah that's like an oblivion like, leftover yep yeah that's yeah, hilarious. probably skyrim but yeah yeah that's that's funny uh I yeah I, I, all the points made by the by that one producer are pretty cringe honestly the whole sandwich thing and, and it and mm -hmm. it's clear that they're trying to they're just trying to they're trying to break the internet, I think, with the yeah. whole sandwich thing oh, yeah. and the and the adoring fan. I I saw a bunch of stuff about adoring fan, and I'm like, are you really that easy to win it over? Works. It works yeah. so well. Yeah. Like that 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 lady, they got the she 
great camera presence like her delivery was perfect and all i kept seeing for like literally three weeks was these fucking sandwiches yeah yeah yeah, yeah. like she did such a good job uh, yeah i, I just i uh, was sorry you do something for me can you load up the sure. aquila city um the little trailer that they did for aquila city uh, aquila city i don't know if i have that one um was that it was that what it was called aquila city yeah it's it's a uh, i forget the exact title but it's like from the into the starfield or something no not into okay. the starfield um let me go to my playlist. Uh, okay. Oh, Starfield Location Insights? Yes. There should be one for Aquila City. Yes. Yes, I see it now. Okay. All right. Just just load this up. Um, Starfield has had, up until this recent direct, some of the most scattershot marketing, where they've done multiple campaigns in different styles that are disconnected. Like, they'll start it up, they'll do four episodes, and then they'll completely abandon an idea. So, like... <laughs> This 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 little series was like they would just show concept art that's been put into Photoshop and edited into layers to give it motion. And um that that was literally it for like a couple months was they were just showing off this kind of concept art style. And then that would be it. That's your one minute little teaser. Yeah. Um so they've definitely stepped up their marketing game in terms of effective marketing because it, it all that's sucked the whole video. until the recent showcase. Yeah, that that's literally yeah. all they showed. I showed they say, more. They say nothing. It's not even in my notes because of how little it says. Mm -hmm. I, uh, the, I'm, I'm not even being uh, facetious. I put more effort into the uh, once lost games shit. I did like five mm -hmm. or maybe eight different concept art, and and they all had like particles and layers and stuff like that. This is surprisingly low effort. Like that's oh, one it, shot. It's amazing. Yeah. This <laughs> that's, 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 like, that's the zoomed in part of the same yeah that's, that's just zoomed mm -hmm. into the same work it's, ju it's just zooming and the layers are kind of moving at different rates the that's best so part weird. too is like you know somebody like there's a whole production team behind this they ran this through like several people's desks and everything like this is what you're looking at it's like a this this is a costly production here and but the problem is <laughs> that the game just wasn't in a, in a state where they could show anything or even really yeah. say anything because they were still like well we don't know what yeah, this what so the, it's going to be about then there was the uh into the starfield stuff which was a little longer and actually featured developer interviews they had like this round table yeah. premise that they did yeah and then they said equally nothing with those as well as to what the game was going to be uh, yeah, it really yeah. is amazing how empty calories those those trailers were and then they did uh constellation questions which was where they wanted people to sign up to be discord kittens on the bethesda server and <laughs> ask questions oh, god and then um they answered i think a grand total of like six questions <laughs> it, through through constellation and Acro that, across, that was it across three videos i think it was mm -hmm. that entire marketing videos. That entire marketing push, two months, it was six questions. Yeah, and I remember seeing these pop up in my feed when they were coming out, the sort of like city spotlights, whatever, and they're very oh, short. The ML talk about lore, you mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah the, the lore videos. Uh, and and they were so dry. They were so yeah, bland. Mm -hmm. And they're like, yeah, there's a, there's a spaceport, and it's in the middle of the... I'm like I don't even know what this universe is. I yeah. this looks this looks like concept art for five games I've already played. It just looked yes. it was ex mm -hmm. extremely dry. You're absolutely right. It's so it's been a very hilarious marketing push. Just the scattershot approach. I don't know if they weren't happy with what they were saying or what. Um, yeah, like they did. They were gonna do like companion introductions, and then Vasco is literally the only companion. <laughs> it's the only companion they just have video for. They probably yeah. cut it for scope. Yeah. Um, I have a I have a suspicion that they actually made the art for Starfield the, on the the box cover art for Starfield before they did any actual development. Meaning that those really? characters, one of the characters is like the blonde woman in Constellation. I'm pretty sure she was in that art before they even knew what her character was gonna be. I believe that. They probably had some like concept art, you think? Maybe they hadn't modeled her yet. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it definitely feels like a um, game that's going to been in in pre production for a while. But uh, like you get, they probably sat on a lot of stuff for a while because you know got derailed by Fallout seventy six. They got uh, derailed by probably fixing Fallout seventy six. They probably pulled some uh, BGS well, staff for that. 
No, no, no. Well, okay. Technically, yes. Like Ferret Bad One was BGS Maryland um, mm -hmm. staff, but that was Bethesda Austin that basically handled yeah. the, the toxic spill cleanup for 76. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we have a build of Starfield that was leaked. It's a build in quotes because it's not even like pre alpha. Yeah. It's, it's not playable. It's just assets. So yeah. we know that Maryland uh, had projects switched. They pretty much dumped 76 out the door and said, this is Bethesda Austin's mess to clean up and so immediately started working on Starfield. I mean, it's kind of interesting because uh, Elder Scrolls Online me meant that ZeniMax had a uh, a li an, an oh, sorry an ongoing Elder Scrolls. But basically, every time Elder Scrolls Online sells a new chapter, in air quotes, uh, that is actually them refreshing their IP. Um, as as far as they're concerned, like people say, there hasn't been an Elder Scrolls since Skyrim. That's not that's not how ZeniMax saw it. Um, similarly, Fallout 76 was supposed to be the same thing for Fallout. And yeah. uh, we see how that turned out, of course. <laughs> I love this trailer. This is the Starfield teaser trailer. Yeah, 2018. Yeah. Uh, never, I've never seen this space station again, as far as I'm aware. <laughs> yeah. Uh, unless, of course, it's going to be like plot relevant at the very end. This is just yeah, lore bait. Where this, all the aliens live. This is just lore, <laughs> lore bait the video. You can see a yeah. little bit. If in the lower left corner, you see the l constellation. Well, yeah, it's lore, but, but in a different way. This is Microsoft lore. I don't know if you guys yeah. saw the story. Uh, Phil Spencer was talking about um, mm -hmm. there was a concern at Microsoft that Bethesda was going to go Sony exclusive. Yes, this oh. was around the time that Bethesda did all kinds of initiatives. Starfield announcement, yeah. uh, Elder Scrolls six announcement, Fallout 76, Elder Scrolls Blades, uh, Creation Club, Skyrim VR, Fallout 4 VR. They had this whole suite of Bethesda products yeah. all come out in 2017 and 2018, right as they were like floating around. Hey, we're for sale. Yeah, and, and they were also the um, yeah. they were also pushing a mandate. No, well, not a mandate, but a strong recommendation and? that uh, that their you know their um their satellite studios like yeah. uh, Arcane and stuff start producing yeah. games that could be more easily monetized, yeah. and that's what spawned Redfall. Yeah. So I think the only reason we knew about Starfield before 2020 was mm -hmm. because they were trying to sell themselves yeah. to microsoft no other reason well uh pat the uh, we know for a fact that um microsoft was terrified that uh they were going to be uh, they were going to go exclusive because of the like it's been in legal filings for, for yes. the ft ftc so that's that's not just a um a speculation that's just that like yeah th this is th not th insider rumors yeah. we've upgraded to phil spencer said at an ftc hearing yeah oh. exactly oh. It, it's perjury if wrong I hope just, the FTC sues more studios so that we could get more information like this. Yeah, no, I'm I'm loving <laughs> yeah. all of this information yeah. coming out. There's that spaceship yeah, again. It's a, it's uh, not the is. it's not the it's not the Pikachu yeah. tail anymore. It's which, not, yeah. which which video is this? <laughs> this is the launch date announcement. Okay. The See, that was very that was very close to the uh, teaser trailer. So yeah, oh, it was. But that teaser trailer was 2018. They were years away from launch date. The real problem. I know, that's the funny part is they were um, launch date announcement. No wait, is that right? No, they didn't. They only announced the launch date within the last I want to say year yeah. or two. Twenty eighteen. That was E three twenty eighteen. Well, I, I I like I brought stream. I broadcast that. eleven eleven twenty two. I think was known. For yeah, a while. that was that was going to be a thing. But I was going to say the big problem with the, like the FTC lawsuit right now. It's very scary because like the closer these companies get to a monopolistic position the faster any creativity. I, I realize like these people, you know, uh, arguably steal a lot, right? But any creativity will die if Microsoft gains an absolute, um, uh, <laughs> an absolute monopoly. It, that's that's the like, real problem. It's kind of like the video game Disney at this point, yeah. Fortunately, yeah. we at least have a uh, release valve for that and it's called yes. Uh, Steam. Yes. It, it's, yeah. it's scary. Like, I still don't really like the idea of one company, Valve, being in control yes. of basically the entire indie team in, uh, indie yeah. scene, but you know what? They still haven't there's, given me any reasons to doubt just yet. Yeah, so, there's al there's already like micro contingency companies yeah. on the periphery for yeah. the indie scene as well. Yeah, like, yeah. It, like itch.io, for example. Yeah, um, yeah. You've got enough but, competition, but Steam still does it the best. Like I, I like GOG because of the you can download mm -hmm. the installers and stuff like that. But mm -hmm. it's just appalling how bad yeah. some some services are like if you want to gift something and you don't know if you're not 
actively friends with somebody on Battle.net, you have to you have to add them as friends. You have to know you have to know their account name or yes. um, you have to add them as friends and then wait three days before you can give them anything. Well, so there's fucking yeah. This this fucking video we were like having to zoom in and like study yeah. what they were showing in the background because that was literally all the gleanable information from this particular yeah. trailer. Yeah. I, I remember people were, were asking me what my opinion was because they actually showed gameplay, right? Yeah. Because this, <laughs> and I, I, I just my response was to people on live stream in real time was who the fuck cares? <laughs> yeah. I'm I'm sorry, but like <laughs> I'm also, sorry, there's there's nothing to glean from what they're showing too. Yeah. I like the uh in the in the other announcement where all like the really fancy camera work with the the you know background and everything and there's obviously a scripted video of somebody talking about how great Starfield is and there's people like pretending to talk in the background mm -hmm. and I know for a fact anybody who's been uh near any sort of uh actual production um like my sister's actually been an extra in several like big time uh TV shows not not a speaking part but an extra and they'll be in the background dancing or talking completely silently because they don't want to mess up yes. the audio and so those people are absolutely not talking to each other it's pretty funny. yeah my uh my sister had a really funny um uh anecdote this stuck with me for years she was in a uh, theater and she said like yeah when yeah. you see people like in the backstage what we were just saying to each other over and over again was shit fuck and because <laughs> it, it would just make us laugh and make it seem like it was funny so yeah that's actually a funny story i think it was in uh the wedding wedding crashers i want to say um uh, whatever her name is the forehead lady uh whatever the main actress was in that um she was uh there was a part where she was dancing i think with her father-in-law or father or whatever it was christopher walken and at the time uh uh she was a fairly small you know she wasn't a big name at the time and christopher walken's kind of legendary and so to break the ice he was like fought fought you would just like say that over and over just to kind of break the ice and make her laugh. One of my so. friends was an extra on the Big Bang Theory, and they, they were told to say balls, but in different tones, just over and over. <laughs> just, just keep saying balls, but, but, but make sure your tone is different every time. Like questioning balls, uh, statement balls, angry balls, you know? Angry balls. Yes. Yeah, yeah like this, just... is, this is the shot that makes me funny. It's like those people in the back, they're like having some deep yeah. conversation. They're totally yeah. not. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, I i just realized like um so in mass effect one you can walk around and like run up to like uh npcs and stuff especially on like the presidium and they'll yeah. be like you know emoting like they're talking to each other but they're not actually saying anything yes and but what's weird is like in mass effect one that kind of works because like the whole game feels like you're on a stage like it feels like a yeah. production because you have like the grain effect and all this stuff like that it, it, it's one of those weird things where it's just like obviously they did it for uh, like um, production constraints they did not mm -hmm. nobody put any real thought into it but it's like it kind of works though well it's interesting that they've taken away a lot of the personability of bethesda mm -hmm. uh that they would show in previous making of documentaries where they would give kind of an insight to the creative process whereas now all, all of this information <laughs> tells us is that apparently bethesda game studios is just a bunch of people sitting on like ugly couches <laughs> <laughs> I, it's, some of them wear Microsoft jackets while, mm. while, while, while staring at like a projector. Oh, yeah. yeah. And almost nobody in the uh, showcase ever wore the Constellation watch, which I thought yeah. was very a very strange decision. Like you're marketing a fucking actual watch and several employees are wearing watches and none of them are wearing the Constellation one. Mm -hmm. Wasn't well, it funny that they stopped the game presentation to basically it's it felt like I was watching a YouTuber video. It's like, but first a word for my sponsor. And then like yeah. did a whole <laughs> okay, when that was leaked, when that was leaked, I didn't think it was real. I thought it was like, there's no way that they're going to stop uh, the presentation to sell a controller and the fucking co uh, constellation watch. I liked the controller and I liked the watch, but the headset looked ugly. Oh, as oh yeah. I like the watch. That was it. Yeah. They even did 3D animation where like all the designs are in real time, like being painted onto the, it was all CG, right? But yeah. they put a lot of work into that, which I was impressed from a production standpoint, but at the same time, I'm, I'm literally being upsold like $150 yeah. worth oh, of I'm not buying BS. a single one of those things. Yeah. Like, I, I'm buying the games so that I can live stream it or make videos. Like if, if I enjoy it, that's, that's a plus, right? My expectations, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm gonna be honest with y'all. My expectations are elite dangerous for normies in space. No Man's Sky on the ground with no connective tissue to make it interesting. Um, however, I'm going to have fun streaming. 
regardless yeah, of whether yeah. I'm going to have I'm going to have fun making the video or I'm going to mm -hmm. have fun making the game. It's a win-win yeah. no matter what. Exactly. Yeah. Win-win. Yeah. Yep. Like I I I I probably will have fun with this game. I'm, I uh -huh. I know I've been pretty negative from the get go, but I'm not yeah. saying it's like going to be the worst game in the world. In fact, it it's it, it, it's, it's, it's pitches it's pitches basically No Man's Sky with better combat. Yeah, which is fine. Half but, of my Starfield coverage is just saying they are doing a terrible job at marketing this game. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but uh, like I think that this needs to be said more because the internet does not know nuance at all. Yeah. Um. I am not invested in the idea of it being bad. I want to be wrong oh. about it being bad because I want I want to have fun playing it, not just have fun streaming it. Well, I would also like to see them yeah. actually learning some you know stuff that they can carry over to Tez Six because that's what I really care about. Let's be honest. Yeah. And it's like I've been saying, people have been saying like, "Oh, are you excited for Tez Six? And it's like, mm. "Wait for Starfield. Starfield will be a good indicator of where they're going to be going." Just follow yeah. the trajectory. Unless they unless they overreact in the opposite direction. Yeah. Yeah. I think that I Bethesda's, look... Bethesda's going to break up after Starfield, and I think one studio is going to be Fallout and one studio is going to be Elder Scrolls. I, I have to say though that like if uh, Todd Howard decides to like hang up the hang up his hat and retire, um, we've seen Microsoft break up studios before and like just distribute yeah. the IPs. Yeah. We've mm -hmm. seen that happen. We've we've seen them yeah, also IPs. create. Go ahead. It could turn into an arcane situation. Yep. I was actually going to bring up arcane before because there's an interesting parallel before that. But yeah. before I was going to say that they've actually like created new like IP exclusive studios just to push Gears of War content and Halo content. And they've both been right. mm -hmm. relatively bad. Like uh, Gears yeah. of War, probably less so. I, I don't care about their campaigns anymore, but their games have been fine. But yeah, yeah the three, thing three, I, three, four, three, four, three <laughs> is the masters of so bad it's good media. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, like, it's let's well. let's also acknowledge the fact that um, the target audience uh, it, it changes with these products. You yeah. know, we we go back to Morrowind. It, you know, and, and literally we we are Grandpa Simpson going. It'll happen to you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's it's frustrating too because you see, like I, I actually tweeted about this a while ago uh, with with the Cyberpunk uh, yeah. announcement. That was like I want to say articles came out in twenty uh 2012 and then the, the first the first big cg trailer came out in 2013 which yes. usually means like this game is in full production but it wasn't until probably like about I five years a later ton of people yeah and that really kind of gave people uh a bad idea about how far along the game was it, um, it was in development for eight years yeah and they want to tell you that because that sounds like it's a really big awesome game but it can kind of bite you in the ass too, because you, well, you think sa same thing for Starfield with people who think that Maryland didn't work on 76. They definitely yeah. did. They made the world like that's a fact. Yeah, which that's, is that's... which is funny because like yeah. that's the part that everybody talks up from 76 is like, yeah. well, it, the, the rest of the game is terrible, but the map's great. And it's like, OK, so why are you going to disown that? then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really funny. I, personally, what? I think it's it's like the best the best map that they've made in a really long yes. time and the, like the dungeons and stuff too like I, I did a whole section of my skyrim video where i was hey. like shit talking skyrim's dungeons uh got to fall 76 i was like wow it's basically like it's almost like they watched that video hey <laughs> indigo is... yeah i'd like to shill something for a second so uh no one does bethesda like bethesda like you know you, you could talk about kenshi and how it compa would compare to yeah. Marwind in certain ways mm -hmm. you could talk about like uh, Mountain Blade or Two Worlds uh, or even Elden Ring, but no one does Bethesda like Bethesda. So I'm I'm putting in in the chat really quick. This is a Steam page for a game called Ardenfall, which is yes. the only thing mm -hmm. I've seen that is trying to compete in the Bethesda space. And I know I know they they're they're an indie game, so they cannot match Bethesda in terms of graphics. They cannot be a AAA uh, game. But they're trying, like, they're the only people I've seen trying to do Bethesda. And, um, uh, like, yeah. Well, he, just, uh, he just put out his casting call for voice mm -hmm. actors. Oh, yes. cool. And uh, I, I, I want to say I, there's a playable demo. And, like, you can, you can play it for free right now on Steam. And I just wanted to kind of uh, talk that up for a second. Because, you know. I was having no, a lot no. of fun with Ardenfall's um, magic. Yeah, because there's a there's a knockback spell mm -hmm. and uh, like conjuring spells. And yeah. that's a fun combo. 
No, I, and ironically, I just put up a uh, the little Fallout guy, like the used car salesman guy. That wasn't yeah. in response to Ardenfall, but funnily enough, it kind of it, it exactly timed right for you to yes. to do your shill. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was I was I was doing it in response to them uh, hawking a uh, a cheap uh, smartwatch for like five minutes. But uh, no, <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, I played yeah. the I played the Ardenfall demo too. It looks really cool. Um, really, it's like almost a completely solo project, which is really inspiring. Yeah. Um, I follow a guy on Twitter. It looks really promising. So yeah, um, definitely check out Ardenfall if you get the chance. I'm, I'm, I might. I'm installing re- the demo right now. Uh, yeah, check out, yeah, yeah. I might, I might do a uh, uh, quick like post and yeah. and pin that um, with the tag of what it's about. Yeah, under... the more people who talk about Ardenfall, the better, because like Bethesda needs competition if they're like they're going to get a fire under their ass to make their stuff better. Well, Cast you me know, and make me a make me a killable bandit leader or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, Obs- Obsidian was trying to do that, mm. uh, but then people just did not connect with the Outer Worlds, and uh, oh man, yeah. the Outer Worlds was a cataclysmically bad uh, play <laughs> from Obsidian. I uh, like the Outer Worlds, but I had no expectations, unlike everyone else. And when I say I liked it, I mean I liked it as in this is a 5 out of 10, not too good, not too bad, kind of neutral experience that was a like a palate cleanser for my next good game. <laughs> you know? yeah. I didn't... I, I think people mm. o- overestimate the expectations I walk into games with as well. Yes. Um, off the top of my head, I don't think I even made the conscious connection that Outer Worlds had anything to do with New Vegas first playthrough. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was, it was. I played a bit, thought, "Hey, this is like New Vegas." Looked it up, and it was like, "Oh yeah, this is Obsidian, same joint." Mm. Yeah, I, I don't know what all the writing staff uh, who was involved with what. I know, um, uh, what's his name? Avalon gets a lot of credit for New Vegas. He actually did the lore book and the expansions, but not the core game. That was. Um, Josh, Josh, Sawyer. Josh Sawyer was the director. I don't know the yeah. entire writing staff, but Josh Sawyer was like the main man on Vegas for sure. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a couple extra people that are important to the New Vegas story. Um, it, that's what's funny about Outer Worlds is that it's aping New Vegas when it has none of the people or almost none of the people that con- contributed massively to that project. Yeah. Yeah, I was at a it's panel largely, for... Go ahead. It's largely Tim Kaine and uh, Leon Boyarski. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and they they were involved in the original fall, uh, Fallout and part way through Fallout Two, obviously Troika. But uh, I think there was one or two uh, New Vegas staff. But I, I was at actually at a, at a panel for Outer Worlds at um, uh, PAX twenty nineteen, I want to say. And um, I asked one question, wasn't it's kind of cringe, so I didn't wouldn't recommend it, or wouldn't recommend it, but. Uh, yeah. there was a, I, I noticed there was like the kind of the, the old guard kind of guys like Boyarski and Kane, but also there was, I think a lead designer, possibly writer from, uh, New Vegas and kind of like a new blood writer who would, who would like just couldn't join the company. So there's a lot of like kind of millennial Gen Z, no offense, humor, uh, kind of interspersed with, I kind of, I kind of got, there was a lot, a lot of new blood right in the writing yeah. staff compared to the old blood designers. Uh, the way just, I would describe it is almost it's a lame person trying to do edgy Gen Z humor. Yes. Mm. Now, it's interesting. You can find the transformation between uh, writers uh, very evident in Elder Scrolls Online. In mm. the older yeah. content, uh, you can find <clears throat> some more traditional fantasy tropes. And when I say traditional fantasy tropes, I mean boring. Okay, like <laughs> th- th- that, that's there, yeah. there's no beating around the bush. I played every quest in ESO up until um, the the deadlines. I finished the deadlines, so uh, I can tell you flat out that um, the um, like it was traditional fantasy tropes. But then, as soon as you start getting into like the newer stuff, like Blackwood and such, um, you you end up getting some a little bit of modern lingo. For example, a Dramora says that he after he dies he will respawn in a new body. Really? And and, and so, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Like mm. um, that the, the, in the deadlines specifically, I remember that line. But uh, like in general, it's like, uh, of course you um, uh, like uh, you shouldn't go to the deadlands. That's where Mayrun Stagon keeps all his stuff. Y- you know, um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, so that's, stupid. that yeah, that this shit like that, and you, it, it's it's especially infuriating because that character who said that line was in um Orsinium, oh, the best Pause written. The 
yeah. Uh, Orsinium, the best written um, DLC out of ESO. And to have her go from an up and coming, um, like not sure of herself adventurer to being, uh, you know, m modern snark is very off putting. Very off putting. I'm just yeah. going to comment on some stuff they're showing mm -hmm. right now. If you go mm -hmm. back a bit, the, the yeah. lasers, the like 5,000 targeting lasers. No, 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 no. There's, <laughs> there's a lot to comment on with this little montage that they're doing. Okay. Yeah, right, uh, so is this good? Is this a good point? Or uh, keep going back. There's a going, zero, zero gravity, leaping, running. Uh, about here, yeah. Just let it play. I'll tell you when. Yeah. Okay. Okay, this is the lever action rocket launcher. Oh, okay. I figured uh, that out. You even see so, the lever? You, I'm assuming he does it what's, between each shot. The, yeah, what's the timestamp? So I can put the uh, that. Notes. That is uh, 39. 40 or 39 39 or uh, 39 35 39 39 like just a couple of seconds before yeah um so yeah there's uh, there's also an error with one of these shots uh where uh this is a this is one of the famous ones from the new showcase that people have been kind mm -hmm. of talking about they're showing the zero g stuff which looks fine I like. I, I do want to comment, and I think you mentioned that before, Pat. I do like the fact that they did acknowledge that projectiles would give you some kickback and in, in zero grav, whereas laser weapons would not. I do like that mm -hmm. that detail. It's, yeah. a, it's a neat yeah. detail that's going to give energy weapons a niche that they badly yeah. need. Uh, it's this gun. They're going to show him kind of wielding it. Not this one. This one. Okay. You can see that he's not wielding the foregrip correctly. Mm hmm. Uh, or, they actually put this on the Steam page. So, so this was so he's <laughs> left hand the there. Next, the next weapon, it not this one. The next weapon, not yeah. I know it cuts so fast that it's very easy. All right, I'm in slow mo right now. I think, I think we're I think we're past it. Yeah, oh, we yeah, are. Got to go back. Okay, the green one. one. There it is. Yep, green lasers. You can see so, his hands are in the wrong place. So, oh, yeah. Yeah, that part, that, part that sticks down to the foreground. You're supposed to grab onto you're that. You're supposed to grab this, not that. <laughs> it's so fast. You think that's another trigger, but no, he's supposed to, he's clipping through the, the gun right now. That's funny. And th this is why they do this kind of fast cutting style with this, that's with almost, this showcase. There's so much that they're like trying to not show. And then like, this, this is obviously an accident. But this this is wow. so. I just center frame. Yeah. This yeah. is what made it to <laughs> Steam's page, though. Yeah, yes. the this... fact that is there is like, what are they not showing? Yeah. This this is strong flashbacks to Mass Effect Andromeda's. Uh, mm. uh, My face yeah. is pretty tired. The backwards yeah. handgun. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Let me find it. Okay, I got I got the uh, I got the image here. Let me pull it up. Uh. Oh god! And so I, yeah, I, this was a new one. They all, they always do something wrong. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> She's like holding she... the gun herself. <laughs> this is me when I when I was playing the game. This is what I felt like oh, doing. No. <laughs> oh no! <laughs> so we're I've not quite to that. we're not quite to Mass Effect Andromeda marketing, but no. Yeah. That's funny. I guess there is always a lower bar. It's just always like that's front and center. That's like really, I mean, I, yeah, that was the glamour shot. That was B roll. It's not like we're looking at gameplay and there was a mistake. Like that, yeah, I mean, by an editor, it happens oh. a lot, especially for solo creators. Like I, 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 I called Mike Morham Mark Morham from memory because I got his mm -hmm. name mixed up with Mark Morgan, the uh, Fallout composer. So I, and you know, you, you can make stupid uh, mess ups like that, but these go through a lot of people. Yeah. The, yeah. So this is, this is a multi-million oh, dollar hang on. There, there was marketing one. push. Another oh, one. There, hold on. Where? Back further. Uh, Good. Yeah. Play here and then slow mo. Yeah. Okay. Oh. Oh, those are like those are some pretty old There's, school casings. Interesting. Okay. There. It's the belt. It's belt. Okay. Fed. Yeah. This is this is fine. I mean, it's stupid, but whatever. <laughs> yeah. Very <laughs> inefficient for this game. Oh, we got to see this guy. Our weapon designer here. But I mean, he's an, uh, is he talking about weapons? I guess he is. Is this he fine? Is fi he is finally talking about weapons. This is okay. fine. There's another foregrip issue. And so that, not this one. That's okay. I think, yeah. Huh. Why would you paint on? Okay. 
<laughs> this one. There's oh, another. What? There's another unused. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh. So he's grabbing. He's grabbing. Wait, the... where? He's grabbing. So his, tri right his trigger's back his... here, and he's so yeah, he's clipping through the 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 the, the, the clip or the uh, magazines. Magazine, those, yeah. yeah. What's probably happening is those uh, those foregrips are uh, their uh, weapon modification. So it's like yes. the original model is just uh, it doesn't it, have that. It's using mm -hmm. the regular animation instead of the updated animation to use a foregrip. It's a very yeah. common mistake that gets done with uh, guns in development. But the fact that, again, it's another glamour shot. This isn't gameplay. This yeah. is their B-roll of this is going to be a really dynamic shot that we're going to show. And there's yeah. a mistake in it. Yeah, that's that's silly. But also from a design standpoint, I, I kind of uh, just kind of flew by it. And I made fun of the from an aesthetic point. But yeah, I, I now want to go by, back to that, that other shot. Hmm. Is that are those his eye holes or is that his vision? Yeah. Is that a is that a vision? I, is he? I have to imagine they're like cameras. They got to be cameras. There's no okay. Because <laughs> I'm like yeah. uh, other, otherwise you're just gonna see this these bars that, over your face. That, that's three four yeah. three Halo vibe from this shit. <laughs> it's like the okay. cameras on the Valve Index that let you see the. Room. Yeah, yeah. There you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I like hand cannons and stuff. It's cool. Mm -hmm. The. They definitely, one thing I'll say positive, they've really improved the third person uh, animation. It's a lot more seamless, a lot more like, I didn't play Fallout 76 that much, um, and I only played mm -hmm. it years after, but it definitely feels like it was made as much for a third person as well as first that, person. That's now. what's funny is someone commented on me, like, I can't take you seriously because you play some of 76 in third person, and it's like, well, it feels better than four, so. Okay. Well, so it's funny mm -hmm. too, is like in Fallout 4, if you're playing a melee character, you wanted to play in third person because your swing animations were faster. Yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> That's yeah. kind of silly. It's funny though because like people have like I I've I spent an entire live stream playing uh, ESO in first person, uh, <laughs> just specifically to kind of get the get the the sense of it. People are like, oh my god, you're playing in first person. You're not a real, like a real player. Like, um, uh, look look at my my champion rank. Um, I I beg to differ. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, weapon designs are all right. I like uh, the Halo style ammo counters on guns. Yeah, and they're very blocky. I think that they think that NASA equals blocky, which isn't necessarily the case. But I, I do like mm -hmm. the kind of engineer, the engineered type look of things. It where it's yeah, this is, oh, the right, big, space this magic. is the big reveal. Is it space magic. This is which, what we needed our underwear change for that they weren't. Oh about. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the underwear okay. change. Yeah, yeah. This is and this is basically first raw. I'm sorry. This yeah. is basically yeah. first raw. Yeah, so. I mean, you've got gravity mechanics, so you might as well make it a, a space yeah. theme. How are they? How are they? Is this actually going to be magic, or is this going to have some sort of like oh magnetism well, see, field? No, they literally just snap their finger. Oh, by the way, space theme. By the uh, way, space thing. Yeah. And then I'm said, to nothing tied, else. I I'm willing to bet it's a, tied to the artifact. Yeah, it's got to be main character. Yeah, uh, space magic. Yeah, and that's and that's why Space Delphine is ball busting you in the beginning. Oh, especially she since, didn't get the the magic. Especially mm. since what they showed was so powerful. It's got to be. It yeah. can't be like just a magic play style. It's got to be the S dragon shout. Yeah. So people, so people commented on the the idea like uh, how one of the I think it was New Atlantis where they have like the tower and the uh, I don't think I even, I don't know if our, you have a footage clip of that but the tower uh, kind of overlooking the rest of the town is like the same exact layout as as the main city in Skyrim. You I think that which video th that is, but yes, that is in one of the trailers. Yeah, um, but uh, you think that the artifact is basically going to be dragon shouts? You think that's going to be like literally yeah. one for one? probably um see I, that's the thing is that there's nothing to base it on yeah it, it's, nothing. i imagine it's going to be limit like more limited uh mm -hmm. in terms of like uh spells that you really get yeah i imagine it's also gonna be on like some crazy ass cooldown and the problem too is like so in skyrim i always wanted a uh, shout reduction but like the infidel skyrim the only thing that does is like the amulet of talos and uh, this game yeah. it's like if this is an even more exclusive thing, like I'm imagining it's just like our character is the only person in the universe who even has this ability. And it's just like, okay, well, we're not going to have any equipment that's going to let us reduce like the shout cooldown or anything. Wouldn't it have been cool if Ulfric Stormcloak was actually like Dragonborn 2 and then you had like, uh, like which one is going to be the, uh, I don't know. I, yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> just uh, I, I think that obviously any game is going to have a, a certain level of fantasy fulfillment because that's literally what it is. It's fulfilling a fantasy, but I, I, I feel that they, they, their dial, they're kind of balanced between NASA's, you know, NASA punk, sci-fi, hard sci-fi, whatever, and fantasy fulfillment. They definitely kind of lean more into it. Maybe it was yeah. because pre-order numbers were down and, and the early trailers were getting a lot of flack that they're like, okay, let's, let's crank up the fun. But like, uh, Todd has like what? consistently, Todd has consistently said that we are we're trying to say yes to the player. Like that 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 that's his marketing spiel right now. <clears throat> is that um, we're we're gonna give you the freedom, you know? Like we're gonna say yes to you. Keep that in mind. Like that they're they're obviously digging hard for that power fantasy. I like that these NPCs in the background are in the same exact animation pose, just like, you know, frame 52. Yes, yeah. <laughs> I mean, it, the, the animation's based on the furniture piece itself. Like, yeah. they'd have to have a different type of chair to have a different animation. But is this I like a... Be, oh, yeah, it's just two chairs that's copied over and over, and that's why yes, they all have the same that's, animation. Yeah. That's what I was saying. Like, the oh, artist's man. throne has that, that introspective, like, you know, like, uh, hand-to-chin animation. Like, <laughs> yeah. So I'm just saying, like, where's the Jarl's throne here? That's all the God. same chair. Yeah, I love, I love Bethesda jank. This yep. is the stuff that I live for. Like going into <laughs> Fallout 76 and just seeing like all the stuff that I recognize from like Skyrim. It's just, mm -hmm. it, it's awesome. We haven't touched on the No Man's Sky style architecture that the artifact stuff centered around. This stuff. Uh, yeah, yeah, the kind of like uh, cosmic space mystery mysticism stuff. Yeah, well, down to. Uh, same aesthetic details with like the way that they've textured those spaces, yeah. the smooth kind of uh, like almost wet looking gray stone. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, the kind of obelisk, very 2001 kind of modernized 2001 a Space Odyssey obelisk kind of uh, familiar texture to a foreign alien Isn't object. That that's weird the way advanced. modern these like fu sorry futuristic uh, modern slash futuristic has just over time meant simpler like. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. Yeah. I, I I don't know. Yeah. I just see. I guess from it's a story to make. Yeah. From yep. a <laughs> from a thematic viewpoint viewpoint, I just see a lot of conflicting things here. Like I see, yep. oh, we're doing NASA. You know, NASA's punk. But we're also doing aliens. But hold we're on, also doing that alien. Like I, I want to see that alien again. The, the one that was biting at the person. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, yeah, this see, this one, this is it, Todd. This you one. Know. <laughs> <laughs> oh my! Uh, but no, no, the alien that was bite because we get to see a human and the the alien at the same time. You know, like I want I want to look at that. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so, yeah, it's perfect. Look at, yeah, like, it's a sloth. That's, it's a skin. That's, it's a furless sloth. A yeah, that's seventy six vibes right there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right there. Nolly gassed or whatever the fuck that yeah. thing is called. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Being able to see the spacesuit in the same scene, like all the details yeah. on the spacesuit versus this creature, yeah. I was I was hoping that they used the reuse the same model of the giant sloth in seventy six. It looks a bit different, so I don't think yeah, they're that different. lazy. They, sh different. they should reuse it on account of never fucking seeing it in seventy six. Oh, you don't you don't ever see it? That's like the coolest thing. Like, I mean, it's like dumb. But... There's there's so much yeah. stuff in seventy six that you'll only ever see once. Mm -hmm. It's actually kind of weird. Are they like uh, community events or something like that where it's not? No, not even. It's just like, oh, yeah, there's a giant crab monster and you have to be in a specific yeah. part of the map that nobody ever goes to to see it. Yes. For those uh, who smartly <laughs> avoid, avoided uh, Fallout 76, I'll just um, I'll bring it over here in my tab. Yeah. Yeah, there's tons of cool cryptids in Fallout 76 and then they went and added the werewolf, which has nothing to do with the Appalachian Mountains. A werewolf that looks like it was ported from Skyrim, too. Yeah. Yeah. I love that the new Fallout 76 season is Shoot for the Stars, and it's about Hollywood instead of Starfield. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the, from the presentation's standpoint, they've definitely gotten better at the marketing. The early marketing things where they basically cut, they turn a single piece of frankly pretty low detail concept art into a minute video and call that yeah. hype that was pretty low effort it's almost but, like they would just wanted to make a short like it's supposed to be yeah viable on tiktok but then it's the wrong aspect ratio yeah what am so, 
One of my favorite parts of that uh, that whole like series was Inan Zur going around the studio asking everybody what the game was actually about. Yeah. So oh no! Oh, oh, yeah, you're right. So Inan Zur, no, he's their uh, their their composer. Like the the person who's doing the music didn't know what the game was about, so he couldn't make the music because you know oh, he no. prides himself on actually doing things right. No, the guy's a gem in the marketing yeah. material. Um, yeah. <laughs> look, hang on. I'll, let's see. Yeah. Is, it, is that one of the clips? Uh, I can get you the video that it was in. It was in the Into the Starfield number three, The Sound of Adventure. Okay, yeah, um, I got that. There's a lot of great like mean mugging that goes on between the developers and Inan Zur, where yeah. they look like they fucking hate the guy. So Inan's <laughs> on the right, <laughs> and he is super enthusiastic. By the way, he's been doing their music since, mm. what, Fallout 3? Fallout yeah. 3, yeah. So he's their Fallout side, and then Jeremy Soul was Elder Scrolls. And then yeah. sitting across from him is Mark Lampert, their like, chief audio engineer since forever. Um, and look at him. <laughs> he fucking hates him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why? That, that expression. It might just be like a RBF, but it just looks like he, this is like into the mind of a murderer, kind of like. Yeah. Honestly, though, like during the entire direct, like all of those developers look like they wanted to go home. Yeah. Yeah. They all look like they want to go back to the studio to get back yeah. to work. On yeah. Fixing well, the game up before launch. Well, it's going to be annoying too because you get you know they're doing crunch hours to get this game out by September, yeah. and you know yeah. they're they, they, every second they waste on the fiftieth take of this stupid the yeah. promo video, <laughs> they could be spending fixing that that bug so they don't lose their job come September. Yeah, it's yeah. True. So we we don't know what the whole... crunch situation is because Bethesda's been out of the news on it, other than mm -hmm. the yeah. Zenimax QA people. I can and, tell you have... something right now. If you want to, uh, if you want to even apply for a job at Bethesda, you have to sign a non-disclosure agreement to actually, like, you can't talk about the interview questions. Like, it, oh, it, really? it, yeah. there's, yeah, there's an NDA for the interview itself. Wow. So anytime, like, mm -hmm. I, I, I talk about how a, a particular mm -hmm. former Bethesda employee said X or Y, like that, like, I can't tell you who it is because they, they all have NDAs. Yep. Yeah, it's one of the shittiest parts of modern Bethesda is that yeah. it's so it's very tight lipped. Yeah, uh, almost like with Skyrim, they said too much mm. and uh, they're tired of being clipped on the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, no shade of the guy. I know he's done some good work. Um, I, I definitely think Jeremy Soul has had like a lot more memorable soundtracks. And but I, I do remember the the fallout, the new fallout theme. Um, but it. Did it, I get the vibe from Starfield that this is like the most Inan, uh, Inan Zerb, uh soundtrack ever made. Like if you were to plug his entire uh, collection into like an AI and like generates music, <laughs> it would create this soundtrack. It was very, very it was high, very lots of brass. Well. Yeah. He did he, Blades, didn't he? Yeah, he did, he yeah. did Blades. I've, yeah, I've I, done, have, I, I have a DM from somebody saying that he's yeah. using stuff from the Blades soundtrack in the Starfield one. Really? I haven't, I haven't looked into it yet. But I've, I've played all of Blades, so I've done that. Yeah. Did they so ever I confirm? Know. Did he? Ever, did they ever confirm that he did the uh, the cover that they did for Elder Scrolls uh, Six trailer? Because that wasn't Jeremy. They already he already gotten not canceled by top, that point. Not off the top of my head, but I, I'm going to imagine so. I imagine he's probably their main composer now because they yeah, they canceled yeah. uh, I'm Jeremy Soul and uh, yeah. And Jeremy's well. pretty old, so yeah. Well, so I liked I liked Anand Zur's uh, music in um for Fallout seventy six because when me and Pat were in West Virginia driving around, we put his soundtrack on for us for seventy six while we were driving through, and it fit so perfectly. It was yeah. the best music. Like I, I made a joke in my video where I'm like, if there was one person I think actually went to West Virginia, it was Anand Zur. So it's yeah. like, huh. so one of the jokes I want to make is like that uh, Inan Zur went to space to do this, to the yeah. soundtrack for <laughs> <with> Starfield. <laughs> Todd, Howard is, Todd Howard is friends with Elon Musk. It's That's true. true. Yeah. Oh, do we have that clip uh, to show the most awkward interview you've ever seen? <laughs> I, 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 think I think that's in the playlist. Leather jacket yeah. Todd is uh, when he became disconnected. Dark started, Todd. <laughs> yeah. st started talking about how blades is a pure elder scrolls game <laughs> it's, it's going yeah. to be on consoles and pc with vr support i don't know if it's oh, in the playlist it's elon musk todd howard conversation yeah 2019. Let, I, let me download that real quick i think my favorite 
uh, disingenuous Todd quote is uh, when he, they were talking about bringing back uh, Persuasion Pi for uh, Starfield. And he's like, oh. well, you know, yeah. the, the industry and gamers, they just weren't ready for like a real RPG, but they're ready right. now. There and are there are some wow. gym. There are some gems in these into the Starfield videos they made of mm -hmm. like unintentionally hilarious stuff. Like <laughs> uh, Emil has a plaque on his desk that says it <laughs> is what it is. Yeah. <laughs> And or, we also found out he's a he's a peck. Uh, yeah, he, typer. he's when he types, he pecks. Yeah. Uh, after all this time, he was a journalist. <laughs> he was reviewing games in the nineties. You know, you know, Todd Howard. You found the, the problem. The, the the part that I hated the most, as far as Todd Howard marketing went, is when he talked about the um, the Fallout seventy six beta. They they break it early test initiative. Yeah. They treated it like a beta. Like they, they treated all the marketing like a beta, saying, you will get into the beta if you pre-order. And what they really meant was, you will experience a one-week stress right. server stress test at very specific hours. Hey, chat, look at this uh, nightmare blunt rotation. Oh, no. <laughs> We've got Elon Musk, Todd Howard, and Jeff Keighley on a stage together. Yeah. Yeah. After uh, after Todd Howard bought a fully kitted out uh, Model S, I think all the add-ons, yeah, yeah. yeah. all the add-ons, all the add-ons. He hit the um... uh, three fifty eight in this video. You'll see Todd Howard die inside. This... Did this interview oh, come I... out before or after the Microsoft acquisition? I need to download the full one. I downloaded the the super I cut. Think Let me before. find the full I'm one. pretty sure Microsoft <laughs> acquisition was during COVID. Yeah. So, oh, right. Yeah. yeah. This was okay. this was E3 2019, right? Yeah. Yeah. This yeah. is before. I think yeah, they were that, in talks at this point. Probably they had a rough couple of years between it, like 2018 was like the last time Bethesda was kind of on top. I think because that's when Fallout 76 happened. Yeah. I think a year or two later, I want to say 2020, 2021, ZeniMax CEO so died. Old. He's visibly this, aging. Wasn't this year? Uh, <laughs> the, the, sorry, the, the, this particular interview done the same year they were pushing streaming services, and they were going to talk about how. Um, uh, how we're going to get no noticeable latency through the Bethesda. Yes. Uh, yeah, the, the, no noticeable latency. And then we got to see like a, a 1.5 second latency in the controller, <laughs> like in real time as they were de That's demonstrating great. it. Yeah. What was the timestamp again, uh, Pat, for the, uh, I just, three I just minutes, downloaded the phone. Three, three minutes, 58. 58. Okay, yeah, I downloaded the, the Supercut. This one's in 60 FPS. This is a gamer, gamer version. Six, this is this this video just to appreciate that this video is twice the frame rate of Starfield on console. So, <laughs> oh, and Elon Musk just keeps going. This is an interview I had to bail out of because <laughs> there was no way we were going to watch all of it. There's probably some gems in here that we need to find. Yeah, we we two x speed uh, sped it for like about five minutes or so, and then we were like, yeah, this is this is too much. Yeah, he's. Not great at speaking, like a, in a in a coherent manner. I notice. I don't know how he's sold so many things and and been so successful, but he's yeah, an he's, interesting he's guy. He's good at grifting the tech bubble stuff, mm -hmm. and he seems to know enough of what he's talking about with tech to uh, sell some I, ideas. I guess he's just uh, he comes off as like the the quirky eccentric genius, yeah. and that probably works. For he him. knows he knows his uh, his market very well. He knows yeah. what the consumers want and stuff. I guess we're not getting Todd Howard's uh, dying inside book. <laughs> Live Todd <laughs> Howard reaction. <laughs> probably, like, probably like 350 then. Because sometimes That's just it, a my lot. notes are late. That's just a lot of Elon Musk. Just in general. Like it, he, he looks yeah. like he's just rambling. Mm -hmm. People And people wondered why E3 died. Yeah, yeah, this is like one of the last E3s. Yeah, there oh, is, there that, is. is that the... He just like, yeah. he just like looks back and he's like... He, he thinks the camera's not on him, so he mm. stops smiling. Yeah, yeah. He's like, and he's like... I mean, E3 used to be a trade show. I, 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 yeah. I remember like when it was a trade show. Yeah. It, the, it wasn't for selling to the public. It was for selling to each other. Like, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Which is funny, because like, that's what uh, was it, GDC is now. Yes. Yeah. So it's like E3. So so you got packs for the gamers. You got GDC mm -hmm. for the developers. The fuck do we need E3 for? Yeah. Yeah. E3. E3 was just everybody dump your trailers. Yeah. yeah. And uh... 
It didn't used Even to be though. Like you actually used to go there and they'd have like these pretty elaborate booths and hype and everything like that. It was definitely mm -hmm. exploitative, but they mm -hmm. just became basically a trailer dump at that point. Yeah. Well, yeah. Like, so 2004, 2005, Bethesda's there with a Bolivian demo. You could play Oblivion yeah. at E3. Uh, 2011, time for Skyrim to be demoed. They did it at QuakeCon. So like even as early as that, they were abandoning right. E3. Because yeah. they bought they, that was one of the perks of buying id was that they got QuakeCon. Yeah. Yeah. And then it just it became really bloated. I'm sure that was extremely expensive to rent out all that whole uh convention center and and get all these things. I mean, I'm sure that these companies paid a lot, but we saw more and more companies back out and just do a direct, you know, Nintendo was I think one of the first ones and Todd Howard, I think, no title. <laughs> was that no title? Oh no title. title card up with no job. Yeah, just just Todd Howard. Yeah, was that just you know a temp? Did anyone else have a title? No, I guess no, no. Elon Musk, no job either. Just a, it's just a they they grab they grabbed a, a After Effects template that had a title mm. slot, but just didn't yeah. bother filling it. That's Elon Musk, crypto bro. Don't you love it when they when they get off cam? I was, was going to make this joke. I was going to make this joke that the only like connection Elon Musk has to gaming is that they put like these crazy ass um, Nvidia cards into the fucking. Into the cars so that it could do like auto driving and stuff. Yeah. So yeah, okay. Elon talked about how he uh, played Fallout Three a lot in this interview, and <laughs> not so, Fallout Four. <laughs> yeah, not Fallout Four. Fallout Three. <laughs> okay. So then, then Todd, they did like a shot back to Todd Howard, and he had like a pained expression. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, w I wish I knew the timestamp on that. That'd be funny to watch. I don't yeah. have any audio on right now. I was gonna say one thing real quick because. Um, I think I brought it up earlier, but I got sidetracked. Uh, a lot of the discourse around Fallout 76, which was the last game uh, Bethesda Game Studios released, by the way, so mm -hmm. don't pre-order. Wait for reviews, could be great. Don't pre-order. Um, but uh, a lot of the the, con the sort of uh, attitude around uh, you know BS uh, BGS reminds me a lot of what's happening with Arcane right now because it used to be people like, oh, Arcane was so great, but but only Arcane Leon. You know the French guys; they're yeah. great. They made all the great ones, and and Arcane Austin has always been jank, oh, and wow. and they're 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 bl they're blaming Redfall on Austin, right? Mm -hmm. And that's so unfair <laughs> because Arcade Leon or Arcane Leon and Austin worked on some of the best games, like Prey, like Dishonored. Uh, Dishonored was literally uh, that that was um, Harvey Smith's baby, and he's from Austin. So I'm assuming that he worked from uh, a lot of from Austin, but yeah, it's just yeah. Redfall was primarily uh, Arcane Austin, but there was you can look at the credits. There's a lot of Arcane Leon um, staff there, and the, even if it's a separate studio, they have oversight. You 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 don't get to say, oh yeah, you got you silly Texans, you do whatever you want. No, they have oversight. They have executive structure. You can demand a certain level of quality. So uh, yeah, I, I I don't like that whole thing where they just kind of oh that's just the other sub studio that's fine you know the the real the real guys are doing a good job that reminded me of a uh, <laughs> uh, mass effect andromeda they blamed that on what was it i keep on getting it mixed up montreal and edmonton i forget which one's the, the a team but a newer studio worked on mass effect andromeda and they're like oh that's the newer guys they didn't know what they're doing so and so and, and the, then the mass effect 3 multiplayer team did yeah andromeda. yeah which honestly i thought was great i thought me3's multiplayer was really fun but uh, three was uh, was showing signs of what would eventually happen yeah. to Andromeda, yeah. though. For sure, yeah, for sure. But they they blamed uh, oh Andromeda, yeah, whatever. That that's just the B team. They don't know what they're doing. That this is their first full game. They'd only been working on supplemental material, etc. And then the A team releases Anthem. <laughs> While I was yeah. gone, was it mentioned that uh, Fallout seventy six is onto their C team? Mm. No, no, we didn't mention that. Yeah, uh, who is it? The Rust um, people that ported uh, it to 360? Or... Yeah, oh. double, double Eleven. Ooh. They are a uh, contract studio out of yes, uh, a out contractor of, uh, UK. Yep. So yeah, so Fallout 76 is uh, on life support. <laughs> yeah. As soon as they decide that contract's not worth it, I mean, what is Bethesda Austin going to come back? I yeah, think one but... of my one of the things I liked about um about the. Uh, the showcase was that they were showing Fallout 76 is a uh, new like season, uh, June 20th, right next to ESO's new expansion, June 20th. And it's like, 
you guys <laughs> really like you guys are trying to kill 76 like what the hell yeah yeah oh and the confusing marketing with 76 where they i didn't yeah. even know it was going to be <laughs> in new expeditions or that it was going to take place in atlantic city until the title card no you, mm -hmm. you see you need to you need to watch the uh the extended showcase that they showed like three days later afterwards oh, on like geez. a tuesday afternoon <laughs> yeah they've had some really weird marketing in the zenimax and and uh bethesda in general i remember I this one die. it's super weird that i remember a few years ago there was this um they didn't announce what game it was they just showed this trailer and they opened up with mm -hmm. Enter the dark heart of Skyrim, and people are like, "Oh shit, more Skyrim content, new expansion. This is crazy, right?" And only at the very end, they were, were they, they were they kind of like, you know, do, 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 and it was like new expansion yeah. for ESO. You know, it was just like, <laughs> By the way, <laughs> and it's just like setting yourself up for disappointment. Uh, can, that was can we work. load up an Into the Starfield so we stop seeing Elon Musk? Oh yeah, uh, sure, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <laughs> but no, no, I was going to say that uh, the dark heart of Skyrim is actually the worst. ESO content. Oh, is that the all. one that opens up with a with the wagon, right? The wagon ride. Yes. Is that the one? Yes, it, it, <laughs> it opens up with the wagon. Oh, you're finally awake. <laughs> it's good to be back in oh, Skyrim. No. I uh, recommend why I recommend you put that up as a clip, right? I recommend no. watching Xerix uh, clip of that where you you first yeah. enter that thing and you see like a oh you're I finally just, awake. When did that shouted, come out? I just started shouting profanities. Yeah, yeah. At, yeah. At it, like uh, on on the yeah. But no, um, the big thing was the same um, looking for. like basically there's an ancient one. there's an ancient red guard sword singer. He's got his energy sword and everything. Uh, he his name is Rada Al Saran, and he's a um, uh, he, he's a vampire, but he's he, sorry, a vampire lord, but he's also like commanding an army of both werewolves and vampires and ghosts and goblins. <laughs> he's he's basically Dracula, okay? Yeah. So, so and and he but. His his like the real villain for the first half is the High King of Skyrim, who's a secret vampire, and then and then after the High King of Skyrim okay. is defeated, this... th then you go to fight Rod Alceron. Okay, this sounds like they wanted to do the Wolf Queen, but there was the wrong time period. Yes, <laughs> literally, they had something called the Tower of the Wolf in Solitude that gets destroyed during the fight. <laughs> That's great. He is this... Iso is a beautiful mess that I will hopefully this... never cover. This yeah. sounds like a so bad it's good type of situation. No, no, the, the, the first half <laughs> is oh. just bad, and then and then like to the point where I almost quit, and then the, and then, yeah. and then the second half it, it, it picks up a bit, and so you get uh, the Reachmen who are um, they're they're Celtic coded, um, but and, mm -hmm. but they're also all literates, and um, like they they make it a big point of you can read. What does this paper say? Okay, I'm gonna ask this because someone was talking about it. Mm -hmm. Do the Forsworn in ESO worship Molek Ball? There are no Forsworn. Oh no. Well, I mean the Reachmen, sorry. The, the Reachmen do apparently they, yes, they're got, showing they're yeah. showing that stuff. Yeah, they, apparently they, they do. They 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 do they worship all the Daedra, but they, they're like, oh yeah, like the, we, we worship the good aspects of them. Proceed well, to I not heard the, discuss that. I heard that the at good all. aspects are literally just the Daedra quests that are located in the Reach. Yeah, exactly. They're, As they're, a they're... Namira, Molek Ball, and um... that's what I'm saying is they worship them, and then they <laughs> say, "But we worship the good aspects of them." It's like, what? What are the good aspects? No comment. Oh. Like, is it? Is it uh, yeah. Quick... yeah. No, but sorry, I just tell you one more thing. Go ahead. Uh, one more thing before I'm done. So also, um, in that same DLC, there is a scene in which um a a a sword sing a w aspiring sword singer gets his magic sword and he does so by having a disney sing along um I i'm not joking <laughs> like of course it, it, they're called sword singers yes and, and and so so they they sing about love okay uh, about love and then and then literally as as an as a um uh, uh, you know his, his like his his spirit sword is symbolically his dick basically and 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 so it, 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 as it as it as it emerges and is gigantic in his hands he's like i thought of you snow lily i thought of you did they show one of the fallout cutscenes, like og fallout in their yeah. sizzle reel of stuff that bethesda's done uh, i think that was fallout 3 i was just going to comment on how fucking embarrassed yeah. they are of their original games um uh yeah. Elder Scrolls Arena is a, has not aged well, right? Mm -hmm. But if you show it in its yeah. purest form and turn the times, it can look good. 
They're so embarrassed about this game that not only did they did they put this terrible CRT filter, which looks worse than not putting anything yeah. over it, but if you notice, they also did a, a sort of uh, H2X smoothing filter over the pixel art. You can see those curves, yeah. like those lines and stuff. So they did like an H2X uh, smoothing filter and then added the worst CRT filter on top of it. Yeah, and then guys, the, and this then is like, what it looked like back in the day. Yeah, <laughs> it's so embarrassing. And then and then and then like yeah, we don't. Uh, I, I this was made before I was born. So uh, <laughs> let, let's talk about the games that we're actually proud of. Um, oh wow, look, an HD probably uh, you know upscaled or, or the PC version or the uh, AI, AI upscaled version of the Fallout. This is Fallout Three, I think, right? Fallout, this is Fallout, yeah, yeah. yeah Fallout Three now. intro. And it's like, oh my god, look at the special edition of Skyrim. This is exactly how it looked like I'm in sorry, 2011. Listen. <laughs> I, I thought it was OG Fallout because it looked like really shitty '90s 3D renders. Yeah, yeah, it, it, they were they were emulating the intro uh, CG intros of Fallout One and Two with those. That mm -hmm. so that you're correct in that. Oh, it, so it's intentionally yeah. shitty, just like the Flash. Okay. <laughs> Someone asked if ESO has that lore master guy. Let me let me um, let Which me correct one? the record. The first lore master guy, Lawrence Schick. Um, is a mountain of a man he's done so much in the industry like i i i gave him a lot of shit because the marketing material was bad but it turns out it's not his fault they didn't use a lot of his stuff it turns out um it it, it, it turns out then we learned this because of um like li live streams that the lead developer did uh he, he confirmed that their their level designers their quest designers were writing all the quests in eso so in other words the lead writer of eso was actually just writing lore books. The the the, the quote unquote <laughs> lore master was just writing lore books. Classic he, ML situation. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, uh, because the level designers were writing um, like ESO's quests, that that's why they were like horribly lore breaking and otherwise mm. awful, right? Um, and so, um, yeah, but, but Lawrence Schick has done amazing things in the industry. He helped write the Dungeon Master's Guide for Dungeons and Dragons. He helped write like the Pantheon of Gods in the Forgotten Realms. Like he he did a lot of that stuff, like the foundational stuff for our current like big RPGs. And so what I'm Which trying to Which edition did he work on? Um, oh first, no, they did it for Morrowind too. Original. Oh what? Yeah, like uh, uh, we'd call, uh, sorry, AD and D. T se second one. Sorry, second edition. It, listen, AD &D. listen, I'm a Morrowind yeah. kitty, and I didn't yeah. play fucking Morrowind on a CRT. Yeah. What the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> so they did the same thing. They're they're yeah. using. This yeah, is yeah, probably the original. This is the probably their. They're All also. Is that, oh god. That lemon turtle moved on. Uh, like uh, sorry, lemon turtle came in afterward. Uh, to replace uh Schick and um did a terrible job. And then afterward, um there's just people now. Like I don't, I don't fucking know. But yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, yeah I was I, I read up on uh Schick as well and he was like an OG uh D D guy as well as um uh mm -hmm. totally blanked on his name. A couple of the Skyrim designers, like the lead lead Skyrim designer was mm -hmm. I I wanna say uh, uh I can I'm totally Indigo, drawing a blank you are right correct. Now. Here is the Morrowind trailer that's on Bethesda's channel. Mm -hmm. uh, those shots were directly from it about a minute in. Yeah, I figure they probably were so lazy that like, oh, who who has Morrowind installed? We're not uh, what are we Bethesda <laughs> Game Studios? So they just grabbed the the, the the 240p Morrowind trailer, added the worst CRT. Let me let me go back to that and just like was shame it, these people. So this is in four by three. So was that footage yeah, in four by three? Uh yeah. They they did oh, a, like yeah. a little yeah. okay, a this, little this, kind of wannabe. Oh that's so yeah. sneaky. Holy shit. <laughs> that's disgusting. And not only like, that, really? you know, oh my god, you know what? They downloaded it off of YouTube. You know why? I, I know that I, whenever somebody who doesn't know how to use Sony uh, Sony Movie Editor or Sony Vegas, there's a default setting in Sony Vegas which will automatically uh, turn any other frame rate into the frame rate you currently have. And so this, this might have been like a 24 FPS or whatever. What it yeah. does is it creates ghosting lines. It's it, it, number it, one it, or two for the Into the Starfield. Uh, let's see. One. Okay. At about. No, I asked for uh, it and I already forgot. Uh, thirty. Uh, Three oh eight. It is thirty FPS. But but what I'm saying is the trailer, the original Morrowind trailer, may not no, have no, been. Yeah, I get it. So what they did is they probably uh, whoever re-uploaded that trailer probably hey, edited or cut it up with with a 
an editor that they didn't know about and so they got these ugly hideous these hideous like you know ghosting <laughs> lines frames. there and they got the tween frames and uh, the, the bethesda 480p. studio 40p <laughs> does that have the ghosting lines in that version too uh let's see let me try to match up the shots because they actually changed <laughs> the shot order so I, I know Marwin is not aged well, but I have footage that looks 10 times better than this recorded from yes. my, my computer. And all I did was like a widescreen, a, a widescreen utility. Right, it wasn't the, even like a mod. Vex shot. Um, if you want to, if I linked you the trailer, if you want to check, it's 50. Yeah, seconds. let me download is that real Vivek, quick. Is this Vivek shot? I can't see that, that ghosting that you're talking about. And so that kind of, tell, by the way, the CRT shit's not in it either. No. They added yeah. that because they're so embarrassed of using 24, 240p uh, trailer from like <laughs> 20 years ago. It's it's interesting. So they uploaded this to YouTube in 2009. So they yeah. did back then. They at least went to the effort of archiving their old marketing material, which is kind of that's kind of cool. Yeah, yeah. The, back when Bethesda gave a shit and like would give Daggerfall away for free or. Yeah. Yeah, that was kind of neat when they did that. I mean, it didn't story, run very well. Um, Indigo, you you talked with um, Julian Jensen. Um, he he was planning on making um, like updating Daggerfall for the an anniversary release to like fix it, like fix the bro bugs and stuff, wasn't he? I think he mentioned that, and I I think yeah. they lost the source code, and so they couldn't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they lost the source code to Daggerfall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, I why keep that Todd stuff? I want to ask Todd Howard because he was a programmer. What exactly, like, what's a feature in Daggerfall that his name is on? Mm. Was he actually uh, well, a programmer? I thought he was always like a project no. manager. No, no, I, I, remember, I think he was just a programmer. Well, we we talked with Ted Peterson, and um, like at least I I was in, I was definitely on the Discord call with Ted. Uh, yeah. When when he mentioned that Todd Howard was a um, support tech. Yeah, yeah, a, a tech tech support, and they were in the okay. same building initially. And then, um, and then he okay. begged them to, to you know, I, I want to work on games. I want to work on games. So when they they told all the other tech support people, okay, you're going to move into an office, you know, across the way. You're not going to be with us anymore. Uh, they told Todd Howard to stay. He and, is listed on his additional design, which yeah. got, makes a lot of sense. Yeah, he he did a, he did a couple of voices. I think he did like the oh mm -hmm. uh, uh, or at least that's what he claims. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know. Don't believe his yeah. lies, right? But, I'm seeing uh, the ghost yeah. thing in this one too. So yeah, I, I think what they did is they think they uh, at Bethesda Game yeah, okay. Studios, who has all the source material and probably, or at least should have all of their games running on year year accurate hardware. They used to. I've seen a video. Uh, it was during Oblivion or Skyrim's development. They had an old PC, CRT everything with Arena and uh, Daggerfall in it, so they could play those in their pure form. They were so lazy that they downloaded it off of a, a badly a badly interpolated version of their Morrowind trailer off of YouTube, apparently. Well, like, yeah, because YouTube changes the compression as well. Yeah. Their AV1 format. Um, what's hilarious about this is getting B-roll footage for Morrowind is criminally easy. So easy. This is all <laughs> stuff you could get to within, a, within an hour. Yeah. yeah. Like, they're not even using uh no collision commands in order to like fly around and get aerial shots like this is them yeah. walking around with the ui turned off yeah also like not for nothing but how much how big of the service do you think bethesda even has at their like studio it's like they must have like a, a crazy network you really can't dedicate like just 30 gigs of that to just stock footage of all your games for this it, exact reason yeah i don't know uh, if you if you i have like a i've had at least two or three different um google Google Workspace, I think it's called now, is Drive at one point. Um, if you have a, a team account with, uh, I think, uh, five members, you have unlimited backup. So, yeah, you, you could have all this stuff easy, cloud access yeah, just, to it all. Yeah. So, yeah, thanks, Bethesda. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so much effort. This also reminded me of, like, how bad the footage was because I, I completely accidentally released my uh, big uh, YouTube well, relatively big compared to you know past videos relatively big uh youtube uh elder scrolls video right around the time when uh, no clip was doing their their uh bethesda game works like you know frankly yep. uh you know wank fest on their games and they they use like third hand blurry footage of arena and daggerfall and then cut to like pristine footage of oblivion because they didn't they yep. just yeah. couldn't bother 
they're just a little little disappointing i mean how how celebrated are old movies and old tv shows and old well, books you know what's funny is that that little catalog they have in the mm-hmm. recent showcase of yeah. all the bethesda games starts yep. with morrowind and then goes to fallout 76 yeah. Oh man, I'm loving that they're showing off Creation Club stuff in this. Yeah. This really <laughs> yeah. Great. Yep. I feel like they didn't get the memo that everybody hated Creation Club. It, so it, like, it, well, it goes back to what I was just saying. This is probably footage that they had lying around, mm-hmm. and it's just like, all right, yeah, we'll just plug it in. Well, it's probably we're selling trailer footage. It. It's we're default, selling it. So it was Saints and Seducer stuff. That's default yeah. for Skyrim now. Oh yeah. Skyrim Extended Cut made such a better use of Saints and Seducers assets. I'm going to say that right now. <laughs> like, such a better mod than the the actual one. One thing I'll say is that uh, Bethesda Morrowind Onward did fantastic skyboxes. Those are really nice skyboxes. Even Morrowind yeah, skybox holds up. I was um, I said earlier that somebody at the team is a big sci-fi fan. If you actually look at the sky in Morrowind, it, they are punching way above their weight class compared to the rest of the industry. Uh, oh, the it's... time periods that they would release in, like accurate mm-hmm. models of the moon that goes through phases and constellations and stuff. Yeah, yeah it's actually impressive how how high res it all is too. I don't know how they did and, that uh, with at the time. The, I never said this in my Morrowind video. One of my favorite details from Blood Moon is that the uh, Secunda, I think turns into a blood moon so it, they actually change the moon to be blood red during that's that, cool uh, during those quests but yeah. yeah so they've always done amazing skyboxes and this is like skybox is the game basically which i think is really cool and it's something i'm looking forward to yeah and and it's, it is really cool from a perspective i remember fallout one and two was like this as well where they'd create a toolkit and then they'd let like random designers, just like anybody basically create quests. And I feel that's the same way with Bethesda games is that they have these, this great tool set and then they just hand it over to uh, basically ran- randos who have no, no real like technical expertise and they design quests, they do writing, they do dialogue, things like that. You know, and that, that's- that story, the story you told makes a lot of sense with how Bethesda does their quest design where they just let anybody at the table because that's todd howard's origin yeah that's true mm-hmm. yeah he, he was he, he like begged to be on daggerfall in the game like yeah you can make the the grunts when you when you die or whatever and uh i think he did a little couple other things i don't know it, the story is very but he was just like a tech support guy like the guy you call in when you can't get your game to run basically mm-hmm. um but which crazy yeah, so, glow up because he was a project lead for red guard yeah i don't know how that happened i really don't but yeah he became pre- project lead and Considering how not great Battle uh, Battlespire and uh, Red Guard turned out, I don't know how the hell Morrowind happened, but it did, and and worked out great somehow. So, but like from all accounts, that should have been an absolute disaster. Considering there's what there, there's a before. story he shares of him going to like Robert Altman and being like, "You got to give me this amount of money to make this game." Hmm. I think it was like a couple million dollars. And it's like, now's the time for Elder Scrolls 3. You got to let us make it our way. Apparently, they went for it. Huge gamble, but I mean, obviously, it paid off. Yeah. yeah. It, it, I've heard different perspectives of it. I actually heard that they called Julian uh, Jensen back in to uh, consult on it briefly. I don't know how, how biggest part was on it, but apparently, they'd gotten some of like the geometry and scope way off so they're like yeah we're gonna make this gigantic world and it's like this is the size of a football field and he's like oh okay i think we got some of the math wrong <laughs> so that's, i don't know that's really that's really not yeah. surprising uh once you i've edited them i've done more when mods that centered around map design and uh, it's very easy to make a tiny space yeah, yeah. accidentally yeah, it's just like a one one uh decimal off or whatever people, but people are saying that you are loud indigo I am loud. You are very loud, according to people. I am loud. Yeah. Oh, I am. Yep. So, Sorry everybody, about that. change uh, up your headphones. Little, should be a little, little bit better now. Sorry about that. No, I, I love the, I love Bethesda's marketing. Yeah. Because they, they are their biggest critics when it comes to like what they diss, and what they don't <laughs> take credit for. Huh. Hopefully I sound okay now. My my levels are okay. Do I still sound clipped? You should be good, as far as I know. 
Apologies, that might have been some kind of bug or whatever. It's why Bethesda's quality is all over the place. They don't have a unified vision or quality control on content they include, hence Kid in the Fridge. Um, I think credit goes to... I'm blanking on his name, but the lead designer on Ken Rolston. Yeah. Uh, he he was a very strong lead designer that um, kept that kind of consistent quality control under wraps, and they struggled and, after his departure. Well, not only that, but he mentioned in an interview for like uh, it was it was for some magazine, but he said that in Oblivion he he became more like he was purposefully hands off and he let the developers do what they wanted. Uh, mm. Ken, Ken Rolston was a part of uh, Oblivion, like he he wasn't gone after Morrowind. Mm -hmm. It's just he, like that that's where he was strong. He was strictest was during Morrowind, and then he 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 became hands off for Oblivion, and you can see the difference in how like the the whole company adopted that culture um, afterward, like it, the Oblivion uh, kind of school of design, you know. A very live and let live approach of, mm -hmm. oh, yeah, kid in the fridge, you know, what's that? That doesn't affect the story I'm telling. So why should I yeah. say it's a bad idea? Yeah, the Fallout games definitely suffer from like everybody because it's doing their own thing where it's yeah. just uh, tonally all over the place. And I, I would say Fallout 2 had that same problem too. Like I said, um, they would like create that tool set and then they'd, they'd give, um, they'd let quest like, coders do quests they'd let uh artists do quests like anybody could do quests basically and that's yeah. why the game had so much content for the time but also was was the the quality varied quite a bit you could you could tell <laughs> i understand the idea of you know our designers are our writers it makes perfect sense um but remember that the people who were designing morrowind tended to be uh, like they tended to write first and design second you know uh, but it kind of flipped around later that that's how it appears anyway at a surface level it is conducive towards a a, a better work environment that's mm -hmm. very empowering and it, it's like it's a good way to foster more creativity and develop your talent so people don't get stuck and that's probably why um they have good retention over there too you really don't hear many people leaving like really horrible stories and stuff coming out of there and it's just because yeah. Hey, you can come in, you can actually make games, you can actually have an impact. Um, mm. But the problem is, is that you need good quality control in order to achieve that. Yep. And well, you know. Yeah, they've struggled with their uh, lead design manager really keeping things under control. Yeah. Yeah, I can only imagine. I, I don't know if uh, OpenAI is going to get sued over Oblivion. Last I heard, like a big publishing company is going to sue them for billions of dollars for plagiarism. I don't know how that's going to pan out cuz as far as i can tell from a legal standpoint it's it's all transformative but what's what's the uh, story here um yeah. apparently a, a big book publisher is suing openai the guys who made chat gpt okay um, so okay. i don't know if i don't know if that's like generative content language models are going to be around for much longer or if it's going to be the future it's hard to say but oh. I'm, there's I'm a ton certain. of money flowing into the tech. Yeah. There's no way. Yeah, there's yeah, a lot of money. Boxes open. Yeah. yeah, I was gonna say like it, it, I've said this before, but plastics aren't going away, and neither is AI. Um, yeah. Yeah, and and there's there's so many ways to get around that. You could simply just yeah. ban all language learning models on anything that isn't public domain. Mm -hmm. That would still be a wealth of knowledge to base it off of. So and you very could get around to that. Enforce. Um, yeah. Oh yeah. I, yeah. I'm thinking more. It's going to be on the consumer level. I think so, there's going to be sort of you know, like a stamp that says, oh, yeah, this was all made with made entirely by humans or something like that. Yeah, people are going to want their organic storytelling and their organic language or whatever. You know, they're, they're shade grown, local vor, vegan storytelling. My, so my that's going to be a, is that yeah. if I use text to speech and you can't tell that it's text to speech, I'm not going to use it. Hmm. Yeah, I, I could see that. Um, I dabbled in it a little bit in my last video. Some people were cool with it. Some people loved it. Some people hated it. So I, I'm going to, there's an interesting argument for and against it. I um, can still tell that it was text to speech, but um, yeah, it's gotten, even I, even I was on the fence like this. It sounds too much like you're using their voice. So like this reminds me of in the flash, they mm -hmm. use um, mm -hmm. Christopher Reeves and George yeah. Reeves, uh, Superman. And there's a, a big source of contention about, using them like that because we all we all know the story of christopher reeves his horrible accident and so people feel insensitive about that what they don't get is uh the other reeve that played 
uh, Superman um, got typecast into the role of being Superman and ended up taking his own life because he wasn't able to find other work. Yeah. And mm-hmm. so puppeting his corpse to then be Superman in a modern yeah. time gives a lot of people out who know that old context. Yeah. Yeah. You're absolutely and so right. I'm definitely like I'm uncomfortable a bit you, pu- using it as a puppet. I did it with the Oblivion video. I'm very uncomfortable with using people's voices that are dead and can't mm. consent at all. Yeah, and the, and legally and and ethically, it's like so new and confusing. Like, what's what's okay and what's not? Is it okay if it's a parody? If you're making fun of something, is it okay if it's a uh, mm. documentary? Is it okay? It, it, entertainment seems particularly kind of sketchy because they're you know they're yeah. making millions of dollars off of it. That's that's kind of. It seems Japan, really That's... Japan's cultural ministry is attempting to uh, ban all AI generation uh, generations for commercial use. What they want to do is they want to keep it for research and education purposes only. Oh, yeah, I, I don't have a problem with memes yeah. being made with AI. It just kind of makes me uncomfortable because obviously mm. my thought process is you're always going to have some kind of bad actor YouTuber who's going to chat GPT generate a script and then ai generate a voice and yep they're pretty much only thing they're doing is like compiling the clips together but otherwise it's chat gpt generated you thought skyrim videos fucking sucked when i was watching them <laughs> yeah you best believe that we're entering a new generation of awful skyrim comics. i've already yeah. seen some videos like this apparently uh, it's, a, it's yes. already affected the science community i saw a video from mm-hmm. i forget his name this one science guy and he does a lot of high effort uh quality content but there are completely like 90% generated science channels that are called like, you know, space zone or whatever. And they'll just do these kind of clickbait thumbnails and they'll compile clips from Netflix, Mm -hmm. Netflix documentaries, you know, uh, what have you different sources, uh, with, uh, chat GPT scripts uh, with a voice AI. And it's all like, it's basically computerized regurgitation of other content and it's, and it's getting millions of views and it's already kind of happening. Mm. Very, very concerning. Yeah, Kyle Hill. Yeah, that's the video. Uh, Kyle Hill yeah. did a video on. He he's not the guy who's doing it. He did a video on. Hey, hey, there's a lot of science spam and a lot of it's actually wrong. So, <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, if you want our society to make an effort to answering it, I think the first question you have to ask is, or the first question you need to ask yourself is, are you comfortable with listening listening to something that is made with an AI voice? If not in any component, why and you know what's your individual lines? Yeah, and and there and don't there be are... afraid of being you know I know you're going out on a limb and you might be wrong in ten years you know you might be comfortable with something that turns out to be like a big ethical issue. It's fine to yeah. be wrong for right now because you're not fully educated on the topic, but you're still yeah. allowed to have an opinion. I really um, I love the idea of like individual game developers using ai to generate um near infinite voice acting for something that wouldn't be reasonable but the people would have to be compensated in kind for that yeah they're actually doing that for voice actors they're actually having voice actors sign ai rights for their voices as well but that's the problem is that they aren't being like i'm 99 percent sure they're not being compensated in kind for that yeah my concern it's tough too because you you will get a better better performance out of a out of a uh, trained actor for sure, and yeah. but there are certain things you just can't possibly do without manually recording everything. Like for example, they've got Bosco, mm. as Bosco, right? Bosco, uh, who can say your name? Is that going to be like uh, Fallout Four or Grid style, where they just record five hundred names and call it good? Or is that actually AI? I I'm assuming well, they've, 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 they've got they've, they've got two hundred forty thousand voice lines. <laughs> is that yeah. like that? Yeah, seventy five percent of those just different names. Knowing know? how their engine works, it's got to be that they've just got a database of voice lines to yeah. pull from. I can't yeah. imagine them implementing some kind of AI solution for this one gimmick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They already did that for Fallout Four, so I'm assuming they just did I'd, the same thing as the Butler. I'd like to mention something that a lot of people like uh, kind of don't get when it comes to AI as well. Uh, an AI neural network requires uh, like a massive amount of ha- uh, like hardware and, and uh, infrastructure. It's not something you can just put into a game and generate stuff on the fly. 
You have mm. to, it has to be part of development, like, in that, you know, generated first and then put into the game. Or, alternatively, it has to be always online and then it will catastrophically break if your internet doesn't connect to it. That's just, like, you cannot actually put AI into a video game and have it be a self-contained thing inside of the game. Like, that's what a lot of people don't realize about yeah, AI. I was I was actually researching that, and this was well before um, the really, really good AI that came out. But I was looking at um, a fully, uh, fully licensed, legal, whatever um, AI generator through Amazon called Poly, and that has an API. So if you had internet access with pretty, fairly low bandwidth, um, you could generate fairly realistic voice uh, lines on the fly through neural network. And we were actually considering doing that for a game at one point, where it would have a uh, AI generated narrator. And the cool thing about that is it would be as random as Daggerfall with voiced uh, with a voice narrator, and I think that would be yeah. really cool, especially with the modern technology. But um, that would that yeah, you're right. The 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 computing power would be intense, and I don't think you could do that locally, at least not consistently. So Todd Howard here is looking a bit old. Yeah, that it's... lighting that lighting is rough. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Todd Howard. I was gonna. I was gonna say. I do, I do have to take a, a quick break in a second. But um, mm -hmm. did you want to watch some cringe? Do you want to watch that IGN video that I was talking about? Uh, sure. I think it's a All great right. stinger for the audience. Yeah. Um, that they'll need a break from. Yeah. Um, I haven't done audio yet here. I'm I'm assuming it works because it's on the same channel as you guys. So let's just see how this works. So it's a it's a ter terrible TikTok video. So it's gonna be like sixty seconds long and it's gonna be awful. But here it goes. It works. Secret as to why Starfield is locked at only 30 frames per second on Xbox might actually be found in these sandwiches. A AAA game not running at 60 frames might so be disappointing news, but some IGN experts are claiming that this kind of gameplay means 30 frames is the correct choice. John Linneman from Digital Foundry yes, explained IGN, this yeah. gag from the gameplay preview where a developer just collected a bunch of sandwiches for fun is exactly why it'd be difficult to achieve 60 frames per second. Like other Bethesda games such as Skyrim, the player can take out just dozens of items I mean, and plop them okay, wherever. So and they'll the stay there for the rest of the is, like he's saying, the assumption that um, you could do this in any of the Bethesda games. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily preclude that Starfield requires this limitation. Yeah, sorry, you guys probably aren't hearing it. There is audio, but um, the, I think the viewers it's, will it's, hear it's, it. It's TikTok, so it's got the subtitles. Yeah, yeah it's got the subtitles. God, I, I cannot stand. They're cropping off about... 50% or 75% of the entire frame. Yeah. They're cropping off the <laughs> subtitles. Oh, it's so awful. Oh my. No, mobile game content is, or mobile phone content is like some of the worst. And they've yeah. got their brand in the corner too. You're like so lazy, yeah. I can't turn my phone sideways to get to. Uh... So bad, so yeah. bad. Literally disposable content. Yeah, like made I was, to, made that, trotted out to die. It's the ghost of IGN yeah. right here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the ghost of IGN's covering Skyrim too. It fits really. Is that a meme in there? Three. There's like a little. Oh, no, that's, a, that's a shirt. shirt. That's a shirt. It's okay. A shirt. And it's reversed, of course. Yeah. That that like that they won't stay there for the rest of the game. Skyrim cleans that stuff up. So I, um, that's what I'm going to imagine. Yeah, cell resets happen in public spaces, um, in private cells, but then there are occasionally uh, locations like player homes where they will specifically not clean up things. You know, there there are um, an example would be like the, all those containers that do not reset, and they're they're considered quote unquote safe for player storage. Um, it just depends on the cell. Like some cells never reset, and if you don't, re if you go to an area every three days, the cells don't reset either. So, well, so you, you can make like so make it's, a, it's, you can make a cell like completely unplayable then if you put too much cheats there, basically. Yes. Well, yeah. Can, look at the PlayStation Three version. Yes, True. absolutely. You know, the PlayStation Three version um, gets say bloat and can break, and there are people who claim that it never breaks, and they tried to argue passionately until. Um, like they were presented with evidence that it broke and then they uh they left the discord server so at that point. <laughs> he yeah. is saying he's regurgitating something from digital foundry as in somebody from yeah. digital foundry is making this argument that the frame rate caps necessary because of sandwiches <laughs> like so they said like, like, like yeah 
I thought they were I thought they were punching above that weight class intellectually. So oh. so if it's the same cell based uh thing, like and you can do it in Skyrim yeah. Special Edition at sixty FPS four K, why mm -hmm. can't you do it in Starfield at ten eighty P? I don't or, buy it as a good reason. No, yeah. it doesn't make any sense no, to me. Isn't. Especially especially since we've unless they unless they just really undersold their planetary exploration and their and their um being able to land feature, it seems like the planet zones are completely divorced from the space zones. So it's functionally identical to Skyrim, right? So what's actually happening is they need to run it at 4K in order to get the selling point of the XC box. And uh, if they can't run it at 4K, then they're, they're going to make any sacrifice they can to make sure it can run at 4K. Uh, that, that's number one. Number two, they tied the physics to the frame rate again. I'm almost certain of it. Well, that means PC version will not be able to play uh, no. 60. That would be well, that would be a disaster. You'll play 60 and it won't stand out unless you yeah. get unless you're hitting your 144. Yeah, your 144. You'll launch something into orbit. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I think my uh, Fallout 76 had a glitch where um, so they fixed they fixed the uh, the physics issues with mm -hmm. uh, high frame rates, but uh, your input was still tied to the frame rate. So I was having this issue where I would go into interiors and I'd be getting like 200, 300 FPS and mm. my inputs would drop. So it, I would hold like the W key to move forward and it would take like five or six seconds before my character actually, mm. actually started moving. And uh, yeah, that, that, that was an interesting one. Mm -hmm. I, I, I uh, ran into that issue when I was playing um, the original vanilla version of GTA Vice City on PC. It's normally locked at 30, but you can unlock it. But um, most of the gameplay is okay, but certain cars, the wheel physics just don't move. It, it feels yeah. like you're driving through yeah. mud. It's very, very strange. Yep. Stable 60 um, is best, I agree. Yeah, I don't, I don't like 60 FPS anymore either. I think it's a bit low. <laughs> yeah, I, I run 120 whenever I can. And it, honestly, it's like, you think that once you attain that, that hard level of hardware, where we've got like 240 FPS uh, monitors, Hertz monitors and stuff like that, that's a bit extreme, but 120 is pretty standard nowadays for mon for gaming monitors. Why go back? Why why do we have to go back to 30 frames every time there's a new generation of games? Quote unquote generation of games. Right? It, it it's like the minimum that gamers will accept before like you they start vomiting. That's right. <laughs> I guess exactly. yeah, basically. I it's I still like, remember if that. If you're playing on a console, you're sitting across the room on your couch. Um, it's not up close to you. It's mm -hmm. tolerable. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, I remember that that interview. Um, anybody else play? Uh, God, what was that game from? Um, I remember Ready at Dawn was the developer. The the really really good looking PS4 exclusive that was like two hours long. Um, God, what's it called? I don't know what that is. That the order? Yeah, the order eighteen eighty six. Yeah, that's oh, it. Oh um, yeah. Um, and they were arguing like we're trying to go for a cinematic feel. That's why we added uh le letterbox. <laughs> letterbox format to a video game oh, wow. and, and but and we were going to do 24 fps to capture the cinematic look but we found that people didn't really it didn't really feel right so we went 30 fps like you couldn't get the game to run that's why you added a letterbox that's why yeah. it's like 30 dragon's, 40 dragon's dogma did the same thing come on you're not fooling anybody here guys yeah, yeah. it was just amazing that they were like trying to like they're they're trying to defend it by saying it's more cinematic and beautiful and everybody <laughs> likes it and it's like no you're not fooling anybody we reduced the uh, resolution because uh, the game was hitching. Yeah, and that's been a thing for a long time. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I would argue that one of the biggest reasons why COD is a big franchise today was uh, COD 4 Modern Warfare. And they, they did a ridiculously low res upscale of like, uh, I, I forget what resolution, it's like 540 or something like that resolution for the actual uh, gameplay window of COD 4. So it's like, it's super low resolution, but it was a stable 60 FPS and people loved yep. it. Well you, okay. well, you have to remember about the console market is that they're chasing resolution. They're not chasing frame rate. That's right. Yeah, and you yep. can, and the screenshot is going to be, uh, it's going to look amazing in 4K with all the, all the settings cranked up. But if you had to, oh no, you had to go yep. medium or low uh, shadow resolution. Oh no, people are going to kind of complain yep. about it and make a, a Twitter video roasting it or something. Well, so, well here's, here's how you do it. You go to Walmart and you look, what TV, what are the features on a $300 large screen TV? That's what you need to target. And those all have like 4K, but they're all like, you know, 60 hertz still. They're not like yeah. 144 yeah. or anything. That's, That's true. Like, that is absolutely true. 
So, I mean, if you're looking at marketing specifically, you know, you're, you're going to your biggest audience. That, that makes perfect sense to me. Well, your, your $79 Black Friday TVs aren't even 60 hertz. <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's funny, though, because, like, I think that probably the single uh, years of talking about it didn't help as much as a single feature on a single website. I think YouTube introducing 60 FPS probably yeah. inspired more developers to... to build games for 60 FPS uh, minimum for the console than any other single event in, in video game history, because that's when people could actually see trailers and gameplay videos in its proper frame rate. Yep. Because after that point, if you watched like, even if you watched Super Mario World for the freaking SNES, you would still see like a, a shitty, uh, you know, trimmed down 30 FPS version of the game when the actual okay. game was a lot smoother. So Starfield Concern, um, the game, um... Uh, on on the ESRB website says uh, that it has in um, in game purchases. Um, that mm. and I, I'm, my concern is not that it's going to be microtransactions because I don't think Bethesda is going to do microtransactions right now. Like Elder Scrolls Six, maybe, but um, I think that they're going to do the Creation Club again. Uh, you know, yes. slice bread, yeah, yeah. slice Could bread right and, from the start. Yep. Now, my, my concern isn't that they're going to do Creation Club from the start. I, like, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's going to happen. My concern is how long are they going to delay the modding tools um, because of that? What was Fallout 4's delay? Uh, six months. That's what, I, that's what I thought. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think Todd Howard has talked a bit about Starfield being good for modders. Mm -hmm. I think that's something. Yeah, he, he, that he said he it was going to be a modder's paradise. That's what he said at one point. Yeah. But remember, well, see, that sounds like that sounds like he's pitching Creation Club because yeah. the mm -hmm. whole premise of Creation Club is modding. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's modder's paradise in that this is the one that you guys will be able to make money on. <laughs> oh, no, because we're locking it down right out the gate. I, I came up yeah. with a cursed idea of having like a tiered yeah. uh creation uh toolkit so it's like you can oh, have God. the free version or you can have the paid version but that, you can monetize on the paid version and it'll become a creation club item oh yeah that's, no. that's what i thought was they were <laughs> they were gonna sell the creation kit this time. yeah no so the source of this video for the ign thing is john lineman and he does some good work he does some less than good work sometimes but like I, he's a youtuber basically he does yeah. he does digital foundry and so your entire source of it is like a couple is like a little tweet thing where he misspells one, but I, is that really what they're, is that just his interpretation? Is it, is his well, cope for the game that, or he said it was from digital foundry. Yeah. So we're not, we're not even getting the, uh, the first party speculation. Yeah. They're not, this we're is not like actually the party line. Age. So he saw yeah. a video on YouTube and decided to make a TikTok about it. I mean, yeah. back during um, b back during the good old days of Skyrim, Todd Howard said, um, "Yeah, we, we like people are playing this game for for years later. We need to create a touch point with those people." And it, you know what he meant? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, monetize players who yeah, worry yep. about the game. Yep. Hey, yep. And they did not. They did definitely monetize Skyrim again and again and again. They and did. Again. What 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 was the impetus for paid mods? I want to say was valve's uh, team fortress 2 workshop yeah you know it's an interesting thing a lot of people don't realize how the the original paid mod system uh went went down like um they they initially set it up and they told uh, like Val valve is was, was like super um uh super benevolent there they were like okay well you got this tool and you got that tool and you can moderate it this way and you can curate it that way and um bethesda made it conditional that if this thing is going to go up there'll be no curation at all Ooh. like they 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 made it a deal breaker whether or yeah. not yeah the wheat from the chaff is like the mo most yeah. important thing for mods because you don't know if a mod is yeah. just a complete gonna gonna yeah destroy your computer or gonna be terrible like uh Nexus has had its share of controversies, but the whole the fact that there's a large community that rates and and highlights and favorites these things and re reviews mm -hmm. them is so useful. <laughs> hey, re remember when you uh, made a mistake in your Elder Scrolls video because of a workshop mod? Yeah, yeah, that, that was that was funny. Uh, uh, for those who didn't catch the li li the uh, podcast we, I did with Pat, we found out that I had I had years uh, prior done a mod which affected the whole progression system. 
and that created my save uh, number zero 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 autosave. Oh. And and uh, and then years later, I was like, okay, I, I got to record some vanilla, one hundred percent, you know, organic vanilla footage for this <laughs> this this video. And I, in order to uh, to skip the obnoxiously long wagon ride, <laughs> I start I I just load the save zero 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 mod, and and it didn't actually make my character any better, and it didn't really affect my my gameplay that much it just gave me actually worse starting stats than normal it would give me like a five yeah, and strength you or whatever. Of fives. yeah, yeah. <laughs> but but uh, uh pat um correctly observed that those stats were impossible with vanilla skyrim yeah. so that was pretty funny uh that was a very interesting like finding that out and i was like that makes a ton of sense um yeah i remember we were, we were talking about it because i i think we'd recorded the podcast and then you were at you're asking me about something I'm like wait a second you might be onto something. So I actually booted up Skyrim while we were talking on Discord and then did a, a mm. Discord share screen and we're like, wait, yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty funny. So Indigo and I, I, I also horn, reverse I engineered what the mod was and that it was from the workshop. But um, That's what I was going to say was uh, Skyrim specifically, it was delayed, I think, four months because they wanted to finish their patch cycle before they released the creation kit for Skyrim. So... It was three or four months. Point is, during that initial time, uh, a big DLC-sized mod called uh, Moonpath for Elsewhere um, uh, like came out in its early like test stages. And they, what they did was they used the Oblivion uh, construction mm. set. Oh no! <laughs> and, yeah. Now Moonpath is not very good. Like in, in terms of like new land mods, it's right da down there. Like even worse than Falscar. So. Um, it, but it is interesting to look at this this idea that people will be cobbling together mods uh, for the game based on their understanding of other um, uh, other Bethesda titles. And I just want to know how open it'll be with whether the hooks will be there to inject plugins or not, or will it be uh, some kind of closed system that is you know curated? That that's my my concern so... when I initially said it. Me and my model guy, we looked at mm -hmm. the uh, Fallout 76 files because we were going to do a VTuber model from the 76 character. Yeah. And they are still using Oblivion era containers for oh. Fallout 76. Okay. So... <laughs> I'm wondering how, how, if somebody actually starts modding uh, Starfield, I think there was mods for the Fallout 76 beta day one wasn't there there are mods now you there can... are, yes there are mods for 76 it's very amusing you don't yeah. have text-based chat in fallout 76 unless you're using a mod it's true what really yeah, there's no text <laughs> chat without a mod don't wow. tell the subreddit they'll make fun of you yes it's true it's true um, that's funny there's there's another mod to disable explosions because it's very common for griefers to just throw a massive explosion uh mm. creating weapons yeah uh to grief people and so you need a mod to prevent griefing <laughs> yeah that's amazing hey at least it's free it's not like a rock star selling you shark cards to get around griefers yeah you want to finish this tiktok real quick and i'm, I'm, I'm yeah, gonna hop out for like two minutes yeah like other Bethesda games saying. such as Skyrim, like the Bethesda player can take games. out just dozens of items and plop them wherever, and they'll stay there for the rest of the game. Lindemann explains that all yeah, this location right. tracking makes it very difficult to maintain a high frame rate. So let's read these tweets. Okay, think about this. You can take a random item out of your inventory and set it on the table. You can set dozens of items and more down. The item position will be retained for the rest of the game. I can't think of many other games That's that attempt true. this. That's not true. That's only true in player housing, so it's yeah. gonna, probably going to be true on the ship, but that doesn't necessarily mean like, yeah, if you drop thousands of items on the ship, you can expect the game to chug. Yeah. But that's like for special zones, like your your bases, you know, the things you construct, mm -hmm. your ships, yeah. it'll remember those because those are like contained special places. And that doesn't but... affect your frame rate. So if you drop a thousand yeah. cheese wheels and then go into a building, your frame rate doesn't keep tanking. It's that's not right. simulating the physics of cells that you're not in. It's true. So, so no, this guy's uh, talking out of his ass. So, I mean, yeah, obviously more objects on screen means more you know, frame rate's going to be difficult, but he's assuming that the entire thousand planet uh, galaxy or whatever, how many galaxies, I think you can go to Alpha Centauri, which I don't even know if it's in the same galaxy or not, but it's a far distant solar system. Uh, it's the same galaxy, yes. Yeah, yeah, same galaxy. It's you can go to Earth. You can go to the solar system. But... It's not going to be in your memory at all times. No. It's going to be it's going to be stored. It's going to be in like temporary saves. Mm -hmm. It's going to go into your save file. 
But yeah, there's going to be a trashing system. There's no way they're going to keep track of everything across a thousand planets all the time, right? No, things go into into storage. They don't stay in RAM. They they, they do not. Uh, yeah, it would it would be akin to saying that Minecraft works by like mm -hmm. it's it simulates every block in the game that you ever generate at all times. Yeah. Yeah, I wonder how they're going to do that for items. Either you can't drop quest items or people are worried that they're going to be dropping like a really cool item and then not be able to get it back. Are they going to do like a lost and found for each sector? How yeah, are they going to do that? It's probably going to be just like the old games where, yeah, if you drop something important and you might lose it, you know, don't be a dummy. Uh, yeah, just, okay. Everything's going to have uh, quest flags on it anyway, so you can't even drop yeah. most items. Yeah, and your cool probably. your cool gun will be replicable because it's the same like legendary enemy system. So like your explosive <laughs> double barrel shotgun, you could probably find it again. <laughs> yeah. Do they even do they even have quest items anymore? Or is it just like quest logs now, where you you've now checked off that that? I they'll uh, probably flag. have a few quest items. Mm. Yeah, maybe. So yeah, the, I, not I think show it. <laughs> not gonna show it. Yeah. All right, let's continue this guy. That having a performance mode wouldn't actually make that much of a difference. Danny Carlone from Sony said. So that's what my argument was. We've already come up with performance mode, which is like, okay, turn down the graphic settings. We know we're gonna, you're gonna add to the PC version. Turn down well, the resolution. We, turn down the shadow detail, which are usually the well, biggest okay, offenders. So, um, a bunch of objects loaded into an environment is a CPU calculation, not a GPU calculation. So turning down yeah. the resolution wouldn't affect anything. The problem okay. is physics calculations. Mm -hmm. They're all like several many thread uh, AMD processors for all these consoles, right? They're like that's they're probably like, why they're AMD preferred. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yep. AMD is leading the uh, CPU sector these days. Mm -hmm. I can see that because Intel keeps on dropping the dropping the ball. Um, I I finally switched to AMD. I I was an Intel boy for years. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, all right. What, what else? He's got? High frame rate. So he's that having a performance else. mode wouldn't actually make that much of a difference. Danny Carlone from Sony Santa Monica also added that the lower frame rate didn't mean that the game was unfinished, but that it was a creative choice and theorized that if Bethesda had the game hit 60 frames per second, you'd probably have a significant. No, this is also this is also bullshit. Like, I can't um, have, a lot of they, people would prefer pop in having pop in, but a smooth frame rate over the inverse. Yep. It's true. So, so if it's CPU bound, then then the graphics thing is bs then because the gpu yeah the GPU. No, it's making a faulty assumption about how these how these systems work and which what handles what a bunch of sandwiches being loaded the problem with that isn't that there's a bunch of sandwich models being loaded because individual item models aren't even that particularly high fidelity in yep. these games well well so like, like the, the mo go ahead Sandwich the sandwich models look like they're from like the 360 era, and that's not a slight like it's a minor clutter item. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's not going to be small. particularly intensive on your GPU to have a thousand of those. Yeah. Now I'm I'm speaking just from very layman viewpoint, but CPU wise, that would be like object 52, X Y Z location, rotation Y, you know, axis mm -hmm. Y, so and so, and a couple other details like you know and it's tracking and all it, that information and it's tracking its interactions with objects that it's touching and gravity right and, so, and then gpu wise it would be rendering the the model the textures the lighting mm -hmm. the shaders things like that so if, if it but, is like, truly look at the system taxing requirements look at the system requirements that's why the cpus are much higher than the gpus yeah so but you're going to be able to run this game day one on pc at 60 frames that's mm -hmm. my point yeah, so, yeah. Uh, this is a this is a console issue. This is a the Xbox series focused on graphical fidelity over processing power. But they're saying that oh, we we want to make make our game look better. But we're also running our game at 4K. If you yeah. can run your game at 4K, someone that's... said it's it's upscaled to 4K, so it's not even actually true 4K. Really? Maybe they're. I, I don't oh, know, you know how what? true that is, but. I think I think Mass Effect Andromeda was was promoting their game with PC footage while still pushing consoles as their main thing, and I think that was a 30 FPS bound game, and it didn't look nearly as good as PC version. They might be doing that with the uh, the trailers yeah, as well. It would, it would amaze me if they didn't. Um, PC is just kind of the workhorse for trailer footage. Yeah, just it's like false advertising when you say, especially <laughs> what really ticks me off is when you have like a oh. a a uh, console branded trailer. Like it's get this game on the Xbox and then they use PC footage. That's what really we, pisses we me off. We morally, we morally talk about how uh, you know this is false advertising, that is false advertising. But as far as the Federal Trade Commission goes, they they only care about 
what is on television advertisements, what is in yep. like Google AdSense mm -hmm. advertisements, and what is on the actual store page slash box. Yeah. So like anytime you see a presentation like E3 or one of these events, they don't actually like the Federal Trade Commission doesn't actually consider that advertising. It considers it like a work in progress kind of like sneak peek and, you know, and subject to change. They're being sneaky. They're not actually yeah. lying. Yep. Yeah. And they, and then quite often I, I've noticed this before, too, where you see a trailer and then they'll have a tiny little disclaimer for two seconds. Gameplay recorded on a PC. On a high-end PC yes, or whatever, yeah, and that yeah. and that that fulfills the requirement. They it's love in-engine in footage, though. They'll put it yeah. in in-engine <laughs> footage disclaimer, but it's <laughs> on a PC. So I want to yep. give the stats. The Xbox Series X is 4K 30 FPS. The Xbox mm. Series S, as in Sierra, is 1440p 30 FPS. Mm. I imagine yeah. the Series X is going to have like a performance mode that drops it down to 1440p 60 FPS, but that's mm. conjecture on my part. I feel like they would have. Uh, I said that if that was going to be the case, because that's kind of a thing that a lot of developers have been doing. And it's kind of standard procedure now to make that announcement be like, yeah, you're going to have multiple options and stuff you can switch between. Yeah, it's well, I, for one, am looking forward to playing Starfield. Um, it's it, it sounds like it's going to be a lot of fun unless it's not. <laughs> unless it doesn't and, work. And, if, and if it's not, then I'm going to make fun of it and I'm going to have fun making fun <laughs> of it on live stream. But like we said, it's a win-win. Yeah. If it's good, it's, <laughs> yeah, still, exactly. it's still a win for us. Uh, like, no, no. If, if it's good, then just think about what the mods are going to do to it. If it's yeah. bad, then yeah. think about what the mods are going to do to it. Like, either way, it's it's this is, this is a glorious future, I think. So I, I can do a creative video if it's good or bad. So, yes. One, one of the things that really uh, has been getting me going is um, people saying, like, oh, it's going to be great for mods. It's going to be great for mods. Mods are going to love it. It's like, you realize Fallout 4 had, like, that that game had like a really good like creation engine like mm -hmm. the creation kit and all the toolkits and everything like that um the the mod scene was pretty much dead for that game for the most part there's not a whole lot there and it's just because people didn't really care about fallout 4 there's I think a reason skyrim is special in a lot of ways yeah so yeah. it's like skyrim is it, it's it's bold to be going out there and saying oh modders are gonna love this game like, modders are going to love Starfield. It's like, oh, we'll wait and see. The game has yeah. to be good first. I, I think yeah. the modder gold rush is kind of over. Yeah. Well, that's true. Four. You have like so many games now that well, have like modding built in from day one and stuff. So it's like you got a lot of competition you're dealing with. I'm going to be biased uh, here for a second, though. Like, my favorite Fallout 4 mod is currently in out. Like, there's an alpha for like a new version that's going to come out. And so I'm, uh, I, I'm I'm like waiting with bated breath for the like the full release of that because um, it's called Horizon Survival and it completely overhauls the game to add like skills to the game you know like ac you know actual skills instead of just perks and stuff. Um, point is that like where you see it being dead, the ones I care about are still being worked on. So like everything is relative. I'm just saying. Yeah, I, it's just a little frustrating to me when mm -hmm. I, I think I heard about. Uh, people hyping up the modding scene for Starfield last year. It's like, you're not even looking forward yeah. to the game. You're looking forward to what people can fix about the game now. <laughs> it's true, but I mean... It's a, be it's a better yeah. modding platform than Fallout, though. Well, we don't know yeah. what's going to be hard-coded into Starfield, though. Like, we, we don't know what yeah. parts are going to need... Like, what parts are going to be eminently changeable via, uh, like, ESPs versus what is going to need to be like like a script extender is going to need to be built and like to actually change like core systems like uh for example skyrim is only now like about as of two years ago getting um uh getting like custom skills like co completely from scratch yeah. huh. you know like hand to hand skill and um like th this vigilance of stendar skill whatever you know like paladin skill like th these are these are mods that are only coming out recently, and so like we don't know how much of Starfield is going to be um, is going to be hard coded and going to you know to be like chipped away via a, an extender versus what's going to just be immediately editable. Sorry, Indigo, I know you needed a break. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, 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 I'm. It's all right. I, I know that um, we're also running out of time for at least mm -hmm. Eric. Um, I think you, yeah. you have a hard stop at five or our ACI. Uh, I was gonna say, um, I got got a little less than forty minutes. A little less than forty minutes. Okay. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I, I, I skimmed through this video and I just saw that he's like, yeah, I know this is putting for some. Is there is sixty FPS important for you? Mm -hmm. Leave it. Leave a note in the comments. I'm like, go to hell. <laughs> <laughs> it's just kind of. Uh, I don't know. I. 
there is a way to build a universe size game that's 4K 60 and it's been done before. So I yeah. I what I I'll, find I'll, yeah. What I'll add to this is uh, as uh, this is the saddest accomplishment of my life. As somebody who's familiar with Bethesda marketing <laughs> from a research perspective, uh <laughs> Um, they talk up modding a lot in the Morrowind Oblivion era. Skyrim had the mod jam, yeah. so they were big on modding too. Yeah. yeah, they did that whole podcast about how like the workshop was going to transform modding and all that. Oh. Um, starting with Fallout Four, there was a big decrease in how much they were talking about the modding potential of their games, to the point that with Starfield, they've pretty much just acknowledged that it's going to be a thing, but they haven't really talked about like here's why the tools are going to be great for you, like. There's blog posts from Morrowind designers talking about how much they like how the, great the tools are going to be uh, for consumers to mess with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I'm sure I'm sure people will do great things with modding, and I'm not, I have no yeah. no ill will toward modders. And I know that modding is kind of like a good way to get into game dev because if you can prove yourself that you can actually fix and improve and, and make entertaining gameplay elements and design it's like it's a bit design it's a bit coding it's a great entry yeah. uh into game dev and i actually i've been in panels where where some lead designers of big budget games start in modding and that's how they got noticed yep. so it's a great it's a great thing i'm i'm totally pro modding i just it's frustrating when people will buy a game and anticipate a game not for the game itself they're, they're paying they're paying one entity to get free content from another that's that's the frustrating thing that i i, I, I kind find. of understand that but at the same time like this is this is what their games have been famous for yeah is the, the how customizable they are now that said if there is no solid foundation like if the characters aren't memorable so on and so forth people aren't really going to want to make like a, a ton of mods for it as as much as we want to meme about fallout 4 not being great um Keep in mind that like Piper is memorable, Preston is memorable. They they may not be good characters, <laughs> yeah. but they're memorable. Okay, like and and I I per, for one like I enjoyed 400 hours of Fallout 4, which is absolutely um absolutely more than the average you know like sit down play it for 60 hours and quit right like so yeah. like these these games aren't failures by any uh, stretch of the imagination. I. I find it very hard to believe we're getting an Outer Worlds here. Like that, that may, time may prove me wrong, but I, I think the game's going to be um, adequately satisfactory. While I'm sharing a stream with Zarek, I want to ask, mm -hmm. I want to talk a bit about Arthmore. Okay. Um, sure, I'll duck out for a second because I don't know anything I, about I it. I actually, yeah. Go on, um, go. So, as I understand from the Skyrim VR community, there's a big mm -hmm. desire to put a contingency in place with Starfield that will ensure that no one mod developer can yes. hold a monopoly it, over the unofficial patch. Correct. The um the current uh goal is that like th they've already got like a wiki set up for it. So, um basically they've de they, like a bunch of mod makers have decided to go forth and make an unofficial patch and it's going to be an open source project. Meaning if Arthmore wants to come along and do his own project, or if someone else wants to go along and do um do their like uh, sorry, like to make a fork off of it, they can do that, but the license for it will be open source. So, you know, like it, 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 he will if he decides to do it the way he did it, a lot of other people are going to be um like making a rival patch from day one apparently like they're they're they've already got like documents set up where they're going to fill in you know like but the the bugs and then it, so, like basically there's a whole team of people ready to kind of meet him at the front gate and yeah. and and charge forth their own unofficial patch that's basically be, i would be on. um i would yeah. be curious to get a link to this wiki because i kind of want to mm. when i do my starfield stream yeah. later this week i that's one of the things uh... i I'm, I'm not particularly knowledgeable yeah. about, but still want to talk about because I've been asked about it before. Like, hey, so what is the Starfield money community doing to... I, I'm checking my Discord server right now. Let me see. So for those who don't know, I don't know how you wouldn't know at this point if you watch yeah. any of our streams. Arthmore mm -hmm. is... Uh, I guess if you're an Indigo fan. Arthmore is the kind of lead on the Skyrim unofficial patch, and he has alienated himself out of the community 
for a wide myriad of reasons. I know him mostly for Skyrim VR stuff, but there's a lot of reason, other reasons that non-VR players um, don't favorably look at him. Mm -hmm. One guy's already promising to make DLS support for Starfield, but locked behind Patreon, which is odd. That would not be the first no. mod project to lock behind Patreon. I doubt it's going to fly. Yeah. Are we just going to have a situation where there's several unofficial patches for Starfield, though? Well, okay, so if it's an open source project, that means that, mm -hmm. say, I only do like eight hours of work on unofficial patching, but I do fix stuff. I would merge those fixes into the open source unofficial patch. Okay. Um... I'm going to put this in the chat. This is currently the um uh the sky the yeah the the community patch. This is where modding.wiki forward slash en forward slash starfield forward slash community patch. So it looks like like they're they're already setting this up. Uh, like they, they they're assuming these things exist. That that's that they're based on Bethesda's previous game. Which you know some for some people might be a huge ask. Like, uh, like, like, you know, some people think, oh, my God, like you're assuming that there's going to be spelling errors and missing attributes and game breaking, you know, this or that. But um, like based on all of Bethesda's previous games and, and the things that the unofficial patches have fixed in the past, we're just assuming that Bethesda continues doing what it's done in the past. That's that's what's going on here. Yeah. There's not a game that's released in the last 10 years that was absolutely flawless. There's going to mm -hmm. be a modding interest in fixing it. Um, I'm going to post a link to the unofficial Elder Scrolls mm -hmm. pages Starfield wiki as well. Yeah. If you're not seeing my link, make sure you, um, Are you on live click chat. from yeah from top chat to live chat at the very top of your, your chat window. Yeah. I forgot that little thing, yeah. Yep. So I'm, I'm going to show the Starfield unofficial Elder Scrolls pages, their mm -hmm. variant of it. I guess that would yeah. be unofficial Starfield yeah. pages. <laughs> um, but I'm going to show it now because they do a good thing over there, and I don't want fandom mm -hmm. to be the de facto wiki for the game. Th thank you very much. Yeah, fandom's getting... Didn't they just get bought out by some big company? I forgot who, yes. did, who did that. Yes. Um. One of my decision making factors for my next long form project is is its only resource fandom. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> hey, uh, I, hey, is there any um is there any word on that uh that that Elden Ring video you did? You know the the the, the bait one. Uh, <laughs> in what respect? Uh, like, uh, are, are you going to use it for something, or are you just, just uh, kind of lost? Uh, Elden Ring was a very strong contender, but I'm leaning yeah. more towards a different game. Okay, still, yeah. still fairly modern. Because I, I liked, I liked that bait video you made. That was, that was really funny. Uh, I say Queen America from time to time as yeah. well. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, Queen America has a, a achievement rate of like 35 percent which is more people than beat starfield or <laughs> outer worlds outer worlds yeah yeah i <laughs> uh, mean i love elden ring modding like there there's something called elden ring reforged which adds um variable difficulty levels you can set yourself at a bonfire <laughs> from, from, from from super easy to super hard like harder than the vanilla game okay yeah. so it already goes against the from soft fanboys there but then there's another mod you can use in conjunction with it that lets you pause the game. <laughs> <laughs> and it's glorious because you can make the game harder than it than it was initially, or easy enough that a kid could just hit the button and, and beat the bosses. That's, and it changes their AI funny. too. Like it, it it doesn't just change numbers. It actually like will make the monsters attack less often and stuff, or, or yeah. more often. Yeah, chat. I'm gonna say star the yeah. Starfield community seems to be doing itself favors mm -hmm. with its resources in yeah. advance, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. um it's good that these problems like let's not rely on fandom let's not rely on arthmore these mm -hmm. were discussed in the years preceding starfield and were able to like be formed into a effective counter resistance yeah but in general i look at all of this and i'm i'm super happy that um that modding is taking off the way it is um early on definitely being treated um better like um not not as much of an afterthought at least by the community um don't know about yeah. Bethesda, though 
I think Can I think we... everybody's uh, getting their ducks in order. I know me and Pat are. We're doing all of our research and mm -hmm. as much as stuff as we can get done before yeah. the game comes out. Like mm -hmm. Starfield's Starfield, the first like few weeks, it's gonna be it's gonna be a blitz. Mm -hmm. Like if you don't care about Starfield, you might as well just get off the internet because yeah. <laughs> everyone is going to be doing yeah. something related to it. It's gonna be yeah, the I'm same be... thing with like uh, God of War and everything. All these big releases just completely drown the internet for a week or so. Yeah, yeah. I'll be vacationing late August, right before, just so that I'm mentally refreshed <laughs> uh, ahead of Starfield's release. Yeah, I, I'm looking forward to it. I mean, it, it has been a while since a uh, uh, Bethesda game I've actually been mod moderately interested in has come out. But uh, yeah, no, it, we'll have to see. I mean, I, I think I think the the reception, unless they catastrophically mess up, I, I'm sure the reception will be better than 76. But then again, 76 was like probably one of the worst releases of of the 2010s. So yeah, they'll they'll um there will be a lot of Bethesda fans that are like they're back, they're back. You know, yeah. they're finally good again. <laughs> I imagine yeah. like a lot of criticism levied against Starfield is going to be like the the response to it will be like, well, it's better than seventy six. Like, yeah, oh, oh, the game's like running really poorly in this section. It's like, yeah. well, um, it, at least it runs. They they fixed it compared to seventy six, you know. And it's like, it, I'm already it, I'm already planning my section benchmark. where I say, I have a section where I'm going to say, Fallout seventy six was made by Bethesda Maryland, and just because it sucked doesn't mean that Starfield's good. Yep. Yeah, I I just don't like the the kind of because you're just throwing you're just throwing another studio under the bus or another team under the bus at that point. They they bragged about how huge Fallout seventy six was that they had every single studio under Bethesda Softworks working for them. They had they said yeah. they had teams on on uh, Arcane. Software, they said they it's software Arcane. everybody. Yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Only after it got after it bombed, they're like, "Oh, actually, it was our little stupid team that you know failed to make yeah. a game." Then we renamed them, and then they yeah, failed to make the, another game. The credits turned to blame. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that game didn't launch with credits. How bad does the game have to be for not to launch yeah. with credits? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, like, okay, so for me, Wasteland Hobo Simulator, which is what Fallout Four is. Um, yeah. I, I look at Fallout 76 is it's it's thoroughly enjoyable visiting all the locations once, but then like the the game expects me to grind out fates from uh, Final Fantasy 14 that they've relabeled to be events, yeah. and um, I I don't want want to grind because at least in Baja when um in Final Fantasy 14 when you grind out fates there. You're building up a resistance rank, which unlocks more of the story, and like it, it's all it's all tied into your artifact progression. Your your weapon is getting stronger. Like no, no, that we we're just going to take the laziest uh, version of of fates and and stuff it into this game with no connective tissue to anything else. It, uh, so I just looked at that and I said, okay, well I finished the story and I finished exploring the map. I'm gone. I'm I'm done. Speaking of 76 events, mm -hmm. uh, the, this pre following week, they're going to be doing mm -hmm. their Invaders from Beyond event, which is tied to the Mothership Zeta stuff. <laughs> uh, so for anybody who's doing the Starfield video, if you want good footage of the Mothership J Zeta stuff in Fallout 76, this is mm -hmm. the week to get it. Oh, that's crazy. That's weird. Yeah, no, the longevity of content online is becoming insane, not just between uh, games being shut down within like six to eight months of launch, like we got yeah. those with some MOBAs and, and MMOs and stuff like that, but also like Disney is speed running uh, Disney Plus content, uh, Disney Plus like exclusive content and how fast they take it down. They deleted the entire season one of the Willow. Willow show in like five, Willow. six months. Really? They deleted. They deleted a movie. They deleted what? a Disney Plus original movie that was released in May this year. And they like really the, got it. Listen, the FOMO is a, crazy. FOMO is yeah. a great thing for marketing. Okay, <laughs> I'm, still, I'm still waiting for the channel that recaps a week by week. Uh, does a week by week recap of the streaming wars. All right. So I personally don't agree with piracy. Like if you're able to pay for something, you probably yeah. should. Right. <laughs> but my exception to that is when a company tries to take away something and says, we don't want your money or, or, for, for this product. We want you to buy other product at that point. Yeah. For the preservation yes. of the arts, it is your moral imperative. <laughs> you, you, you are, you are morally correct. Not only correct, you are, you should be obligated to pirate that media. 
in order yeah. to preserve it as an art form. Yes. And that's uh, that's to video games. That's always been my view. Um, mm -hmm. Abandoned wear is always morally okay to yeah. pirates. Example given, the Harry Potter games are mm -hmm. all abandoned wear, aside from yeah. Hogwarts Legacy, obviously. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you want to play those games, you can't buy them. Mm -hmm. um, and the same should apply to online streamed media. Mm -hmm. If it's... it is no longer being offered on any streaming service because they don't want you to watch it, it's mm -hmm. now officially abandoned where yep. you're a okay. It, not it's... just a okay. Like if, if you care about like this media being preserved and not getting lost, it, it is it, like you're doing your civic duty by pirating it. Well, it's, yeah. it's ironic because you have to, you have on the one hand, the people who are saying, you know, video games and stuff, their art, and then you have to produce like the publishers and the developers literally mm -hmm. commoditizing their own games and being like, yeah. no, you can't play it because it's a product and we're taking the product away. Yeah. But literally building for, like forced obsolescence into what's supposed to be art. Yeah. And uh, yeah, too bad. Yeah. And, and it doesn't, doesn't, the argument on their side doesn't work either way. If it's art, then we've got to preserve it. If it's a yeah. product and we paid for it, we also <laughs> got to be able to play it. So yeah, yeah either way, they're, they're, I, I actually think that the only way to really do it is to set up like almost like a, um, a service, like I mentioned this before on some stream, it, it's not very mature thought, as I'm sure it has tons of holes, mm -hmm. but basically a service that every game should basically enlist, a, not one company, because that could become corrupt and whatever, but mm -hmm. a, a backup service where like every game that goes online that's going to be a live service game needs to uh, hire a backup service, a certified backup service that is like, okay, right. we're, we're going to back up every live, uh, live service like server version of the okay. game. And it'll so, be it'll be kept in secret and archived until, uh, but it will t after say six months, a year of no updates, gets released as open source. Uh, that's the, like the only way you could do it. Well, the Library of Congress is trying, uh, trying to get the Senate to do something, but you okay. know how, how that's that's gonna. Yeah, that'll uh, happen that, in some <laughs> some century. <laughs> yeah, so sometime in the next thirty years. <laughs> There will be so much important mm -hmm. stuff in video game history. So, like, this is a very pivotal moment in terms of the movement that will be lost to time in the yeah. process of uh, I, setting up preservation. I've mm -hmm. had this uh, this thought, but um, for YouTube. So, like, I, I consider myself more of, like, a YouTube fan than a video game fan, to be perfectly honest. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the things that really, like, dogs me and haunts me a lot is when channels disappear, when videos disappear, and there's yeah. no, like, backups, no uploads or anything. Um, there's stuff that I have on a, on a drive from, like, a channel that got nuked, like, years ago. And that thing survived, like, three hard drive crashes and stuff. And it's like, <laughs> it, 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 we can't even preserve, like, stuff that's on YouTube and stuff. It's like, how are we going to preserve, like, video games and, like, live service titles and stuff? It's just it's insane. Yeah, you know, just say, live in an interesting time. You, you don't have to speculate what's going to happen when World of Warcraft gets shut down. It's not just yeah. on private servers. You can host your own private server. Yes. With the, uh, I think it's Light's Hope code. Yeah. They open sourced it. So I need to grab that again because I, I play around with that occasionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it gets really complicated too because like even games that are currently still active and successful and live are not the games you bought. Like I would like to go back and call me a, a, a noob or whatever. I, I, I liked Destiny 2 on launch. <laughs> Destiny 2 currently is a <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> it's nothing like the original game. You, you can't uh, you can't play the campaign. Some, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah, they vaulted stuff because the game was getting too big for, for uh, people's mm -hmm. SSDs and stuff. They're like, well, we can't have a 500 gig game on people's SSDs. It's just, so we got to vault our content. It's like, there's got to be a better way. Yeah, yeah, and e even if you could access the content, you start at max level. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and it doesn't scale yeah. up well, to you properly. So you're going to be playing the first levels as like a monster with level 30, whatever, level 40 equipment, and you're going to completely I, own I everything. I want to say that in terms of video games as an art form, mm. we are effectively where films were in the 1950s, um, which was mm. there was a lot of terrible movies that were made in the 50s that are lost to time. But... This is where your George Lucas's start to like get into watching movies and then they grow up and become auteurs. They go to college and set up a framework that leads to the 70s renaissance that just absolutely exploded film as an art form. Yeah, that's where we're at now. And so the lack of preservation of our history is going to be 
a big complication for the people who are studying it in 20 years that are going to be super important for elevating yeah. it. I and agree fun- completely. And funnily enough, uh, one of the people who fought for movie preservation was George Lucas in Congress. I want to say the late eighties, early nineties, there's footage of him mm-hmm. like arguing in Congress of how important the, the movie preservation is ironically in retrospect, yeah, because he's like one of the most bastardized, he's bastardized mo- more of his work than pretty much any other creator. But uh, yeah, no, it's, it's very important because especially now where you can just, you can essentially just delist or, or update a, vi- a movie online where they'll just like, they they censored again. Disney is like at the forefront of this. They censored one of their own shows like a year after release. They just re- replaced scenes out of their show. Mm-hmm. It's just very, very, mm-hmm. very ugly and very. Uh, and it also just makes you feel crazy because you feel like you're, everybody's gaslighting you. It's like, yes. wait, wasn't there a scene that did blah? Nope, nope, never, never happened. <laughs> it wow. never happened. So that's, I- that's what I like about um Minecraft. Actually, is that you can go back and play like all the different versions and stuff. It's right that's there cool. in their launcher. Mm-hmm. So it's like there's a certain version from like way back in the day where like fire spread was basically broken. You could burn down an entire map with just like lighting one tree on fire. And it's like it's cool that I can load that up and play that play that version. It's just, we can only preserve games through video to a limited extent. Yeah. That's not no. games preservation. No, not at all. And, and it was so actually that footage can convey there's still like the whole you know game feel thing that just doesn't come across if you're just watching a video of it yeah it was actually super frustrating because i was doing a video on uh diablo 3 at launch and you can't play that game anymore it's gone and in fact there was actually a pretty a pretty good project where they actually somebody actually went back and i think version 1.03 which as after they added paragon and a couple other features and it was pretty vanilla not exactly but pretty close to vanilla Mm -hmm. definitely before their first big expansion and how they revamped loop so it's it's about as close to vanilla as you could get Um, 76 the update right before wastelanders where oh yes the game is fixed but nothing that's post wastelanders has been added yet sure yeah those who don't know wastelanders was a bastardization of what fallout 76 set out to be in the beginning don't get me wrong like i i I think that uh Maybe they could have designed Fallout 76 a little bit better in the beginning, but um, like you, uh, upon the Wastelanders update, they literally had LARPers going to each faction and going, "I'm really a responder, but I like like I like I'm a real I'm their biggest fan." Stolen Valor. That, that's that's what they call that. Stolen Valor. Yeah. But, uh, There's a yeah. lot of stuff in Wastelanders that felt cynical. Like yes. they they were like, "You fuckers did not appreciate what we made, so we're gonna make fun of you now." That was mm-hmm. the saddest realization was that Fallout seventy six <laughs> could have been a game that was for me, and that version literally doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. No. Yeah, it's it's sad, and and Diablo three to lesser degrees. Most people like the expansion, but I just wanted a, a true documentary experience, and I couldn't play that anymore. Even the fan yeah. version of the game, which had because it was a live service game, they had to have servers for it. I'm assuming they couldn't Indigo. they couldn't break it completely offline. Was it? Indigo Diablo Diablo three Reflection is the 2.01 vanilla fusion server. I know I played it, but I couldn't play the the vanilla game because they 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 oh. did 1.03 and then they updated okay. to to 2.01. 2.01, okay. But yeah. I couldn't play the original anymore, and that's all already past loop for oh, 2.0 and everything or, like that. Uh, so I I was it was still. It was that was comparable to modern Diablo three, not not really yeah. vanilla. So I had to go back and go AI upscale like old two thousand twelve footage oh. and stuff like that. So or for was, the World of Warcraft people, uh, WoW Classic is a different version of the game from private servers. Yes. It's basically yeah. a modded yeah. version of I think Legion mm-hmm. uh, that emulates the original game. It's not actually the original game. Yep. Yeah. The subtle differences, but you know, those differences add up. They, they, uh, death right. by a thousand cuts. They, you may have liked the, the, the ship of Theseus. The, mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, and so you can't go back and play that game anymore. It's gone. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist anymore. So it's, it's pretty, it's insidious, yeah. but, and we just accept it because, Hey, these games get updated. But like, I, I've played games where a new season came out and, and I couldn't, mm-hmm. and I was now ranked at a decent difficulty level, but I didn't know the game anymore. The game had completely changed. Mm. So. Yeah, I, I, we're not just talking games preservation anymore. Now we're talking update preservation where everybody yeah. has an individual preference for which version of Rainbow Six Siege they like to play. <laughs> I think I it's mean, complicated, you, but I mean, it, it is a thing. I think even uh, the Halo Master 
Chief yeah. Collection, which was a was, uh, disaster. They had like different rule sets, didn't they? Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Um, uh, so yeah, they Halo, had to they had to Halo, retroactively go back. Like Halo Two is a good example of of mm -hmm. one where they had to retroactively go back and re add in like sword flying and stuff um, because like the version that they had did not actually have that. Or Halo CE, which was in MCC. It's the Gearbox oh. version. It's not the actual original Bungie version. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the, oh, the yeah. Halo, 2, Halo 2 on an MCC is the Vista version, which was like yeah. people hated that version when it came out. It was like made fun of, but it's like that's the version that they ran with because the Bungie one was just they couldn't get it to work on a PC, I guess, or something. I don't know. Yeah, it was, I mean, the Vista version is already working on PC. So exactly. Yeah. Use that, use that as your baseline. But um... you're, you're right, Smitty, about the ship of Theseus. It was supposed to be functionally identical. It's just that. Uh uh like eventually sh feature shift i think the biggest thing um a, a particular game developer who happened to be a writer on the side said this um they they said about live services they said uh, like if you have a book and it's old so it drops out of circulation sh shop stop selling it but if you are a developer of a live service um Imagine if every copy of your book suddenly one day just burst into flames, no matter who owned it, no matter how well it was kept. <laughs> every copy of your book just, just burst into flames. Like, yeah. But, but you're that's right. I was funny. wrong about the ship of Theseus. Uh, yeah, yeah. That's your your. It is, it is hard to invest myself in live service games these days because I know that I'm investing myself in something that's ephemeral. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's really I, tough. And, and unless a game has an offline mode, you just never know when you can no longer uh, yeah. revisit that experience again. Which uh, it's, Ross Scott at Accursed Farms is a good channel to watch if you're into this topic. Yeah. Very good video on that. Yeah. Uh, is it Games as a Service? Or I think that was the title of the, the game. Games, the as a service, games as a Service is a Scam is the uh, yeah. introductory video to the topic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I was actually going to ask you, uh, Pat, since you've been kind of like theorizing on um, how Starfield is doing their their dungeons, I, I was going to get your viewpoint on this. Um, I tripped across this video. It was, it was posted by Blizzard officially, but it was like pretty hidden. It's kind of like a hidden corner of the internet where this, this designer goes over, I have the video itself too, but this designer goes over um, how the world of Diablo 3 was, was generated. And the overworld, for example, is completely static. But they had mm -hmm. certain zones which are populated by large or small events of and, different uh, types. Paragon runs as well would use the same tile set uh, system. So yeah. I did play a decent chunk of Diablo three, uh, various seasons of it. It was all post expansion, but yeah. um, I could tell I could tell how their generation system was working, um, yeah. and I thought it was a very interesting system. My thought on Starfield is that they're going to have a bunch of handcrafted dungeons that they can place anywhere in the galaxy. And okay. it's gonna it's all gonna be fully handcrafted stuff. I don't think like it is ironic because Bethesda actually could do procedural ge uh, generated dungeons with their tiling system in the creation engine by default. Yes, I think that there's a Morrowind mod that already can do uh, procedurally generated dungeons. Interesting. Hmm. Uh, so th that's the ironic part is of them sticking with handcrafting so long is that their engine supports it. Um, but yeah, I am familiar with uh warframe has a similar dungeon generation system where it's just yes. a bunch of pieces welded together that that, that kind of just sprung in the back of my mind because i remember talking about that in my video i did uh last month and but i'm thinking like if they did have a proc gen world and places like this is your this is your mission area a mission area b mission area c where it's got a mm -hmm. relatively predictable uh, set of land maybe it's like pre-molded to be an, an event area or whatever and they just like lay a random thing on top of it that you think that might be kind of how they're they're planning on doing it at least from I our think, early perspective so I, I think that the terrain is going to be random and i think they're going to plop down the handcrafted stuff on the terrain so oh, okay so do, like the re so reverse it's, it's handcrafted and proc gen and this is why i think a lot of people worry about it because they're thinking it's all going to be 100 percent proc gen it mm. is i do think there's going to be a lot of handcrafting with how they're throwing stuff down into the world yeah It'll be interesting to see. I, I just, uh, it, it's nobody wants to do full proc gen other than like Minecraft, basically. But, uh, yeah, I'm, and I, that would be a mess too because you just don't and, know what uh, you're going to get. But Hen Henrik Nyberg has some good talks about how they designed proc gen for Minecraft. I looked up the Morrowind one, it's an unfinished tool, it's not done yet. Yeah, I, I had heard about it on the grapevine. Mm -hmm. I get, yeah, more like 
I mean, all of the Elder Scrolls games are true to some extent. Sometimes you see the seams in the levels. That's because mm-hmm. mine, uh, not Minecraft, Elder Scrolls and Fallout areas are interiors are a set a, a series of pieces mm-hmm. and it's just corner of a room wall corner of a room and then like it just goes in a square and so they don't yeah. usually have like full room assets uh because originally morrowind was going to be procedural generation and that's how they're yeah. going to do it yeah that would have been kind of interesting uh after seeing have you all seen that that footage of uh that poor dungeon designer i think that like a single dungeon designer for all of oblivion and him like stitching these little lego pieces together <laughs> oh you you didn't that, just say that did you <laughs> uh-oh uh-oh spaghettios yes oh, did yeah, I mess well, up? Uh, we disproved the single dungeon designer oh was it for okay thing. that was, that was six, a rumor there were six dungeon designers on oblivion i haven't looked this, well, the credits well, we were this, able so, to yeah. source the quote which makes it really weird that it was ever said yeah it go it yeah. sources to a magazine for marketing for Skyrim. Let me see if I can find it. That's silly. Which is like really disingenuous because one of like the one of their uh dungeon leads came from Oblivion. Like he came into Oblivion late and he went through and he started redesigning some of the some of the dungeons. So like Vilverin and um uh the uh what is it the DLC for Mayrun's uh Razor. Yeah. He did those because he was basically like he he got in. He was like, "You guys could do dungeons so much better." Here, let me show you how to do it. And they loved what he did. That they made him like a lead in uh in uh, Fallout Three, and then yeah, he was lead uh, dungeon designer in Skyrim. So it's like to to say that they only had one designer is like that's throwing a lot of shade. No, no it is. A, yeah, there's six right there. And funnily enough, Jeff Brown, uh, we just saw him on screen. He's he's on Starfield. There, almost everybody on on Oblivion's on Starfield. I didn't realize that they had that, that many carryovers. Yeah. Like uh, they they've got Isten, Isven Pelly, the guy that w- was that guy, the guy to the left. He was he was uh, lead lead artist, I think, on uh, Oblivion. So they've got some. It might be why their games yeah, all kind of feel the same. Got some old blood in there. Yeah, obviously Ken Wilson's gone, and where did, where's Ashley Chang? He was like a big player. Is he still with the company? Or I see him credited on um, other stuff now. I think he was there a few years ago. Hmm. Paul seventy six studio directors. Yeah, maybe he. Then he's credited on Doom Eternal. He's he's probably adjacent around. Maybe I don't know. Weird. Yeah, no, I, they really do have a lot of old blood. Just, I can I, I can link you the the Game Informer for Skyrim. It's it's a scan of all the pages of it that someone uh, graciously did for me because it was hard to find an archive of it. I don't know which page it is, but there is a page in here where Todd Howard says that there was one design, uh, one dungeon designer for oblivion because he was bragging about like how many more dungeon designers skyrim have when in reality it it only had two more yeah okay yeah that's probably where i heard it from i i didn't verify that specific fact on credits you you probably heard it from because even after i made my video where i extensively showed showcased i showed all of the resumes of all of the dungeon designers who worked on oblivion and credit yeah. them themselves as working on it and the credit stuff and the source of where the misinformation came from. Even after that, I think Matty Plays said that uh, there was only one designer on Oblivion. So it's a oh, very okay. pervasive piece of misinformation that just gets spread around. Yeah. I mean, my biggest memory of Mr. Matty Plays was when he, um, uh, when I I came out and said that, oh, sorry, uh, hey, there, there, there are all these people who are being... Um, um be, being like shipped off to west virginia to um uh you, you know they're basically being influenced they're they're influencers who are being biased toward you know fallout 76 and you should take their their opinions with a grain of salt right and i i said that and um that to immediately gopher responded and said yeah it's true i was shipped off there and i might be a little biased to w- and then Mr. Matty plays immediately followed up with, oh, "Come on, guys, I've been around. I'm not going to get influenced by this." <laughs> really? <laughs> no, no self awareness whatsoever. Yeah, mm. that that's what I'll always remember about it. Wait. Yeah, that they whole uh... shipped. They shipped influencers to West Virginia. Yeah, yeah, to do um like to to go check out the uh, the hotel that you know was inspired the you know, <laughs> and, and, yeah. yeah. 
And yeah. they got the the, mis- the mysterious uh, canvas bags that were appar- apparently impossible yes. to make too. Oh yeah. my god! Yes, they they did. They were given the canvas bags, and so it was like <laughs> it was like a salt in the wound for all the people who got the uh, yeah the other bags. Oh yeah, yeah, the vinyl drawstring, whatever. Yeah, that was that was amazing. That was a whole. People are really quick to forget and forgive. I I yeah. have that note down too. Like just. That wasn't that long ago, guys. <laughs> you like... are not immune to propaganda. That 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 is my message for today, and also yeah. preservation of the arts. And check out Arden Fall. Bye, everybody. I gotta run. I have like it's Fourth of July, and I have family stuff to do. Okay, right. cool. Well, thanks for coming on, Zarek. I'll see you see you another time. Absolutely. That will probably break all of our screens. I will leave this up. Okay, I appreciate yep. it. Yeah, I'll, we'll probably end off here pretty soon, but um, appreciate yep. that. See you, man. Have a good fourth of, fourth of July. Uh, yeah, so I guess we'll probably wrap it up. Um, uh, everyone, that was Eric Zarekron. He does uh, streaming on his main channel now, so go ahead and check him out. Um, he was streaming Bro Force earlier today. He's been doing all sorts of stuff, uh, RPGs and things like that. I hop into his stream every once in a while, so go check him out. He's also like the resident Elder Scrolls lore beard, the beardless lore beard. <laughs> so definitely check out his his uh, channel. I think we I've been friends with him for like few years now probably 2018 i think um all right you guys want to wrap it up or you have anything else to talk about or i think you hit a lot of the main kind of concerns and points that um i kind of want to just bring up in general this has been a useful stream uh it allows me to focus my next stream on the in the todd howard interviews which i'll need the focus for Cool. Yeah, no, happy to help. And just just to kind of spur spur the moment idea yesterday, I thought it might be kind of cool because mm-hmm. I know that you and uh, Private, you've been doing a lot of deep dives into all of the uh, pre-release material about Starfield. And it'll be very interesting, kind of like uh, I kind of did that, you know, retroactively with the Diablo thing is like I, I compared to everything that was announced versus everything well, that came out. And it's very interesting to compare the two. What I'll say is if you're just a run of the mill person and you're watching the Starfield marketing, it's fine if you miss stuff or because it's designed to make it so that it only generates excitement. It doesn't leave negative impressions upon you with what they're showing. It's not meant to make you think about how the system's going to work. You're just going to trust that it's better, right? Yeah. If you're a Bethesda channel and your job is to analyze these trailers and you're walking away with positive impressions, you're a paid shill. What was that? God, who, who, who posted that? I'm trying to remember. Was it you that posted that? There was somebody who was posting... Uh, like kind of videos that were about the last couple Bethesda games, where it's like get 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 hype for Starfield, yeah, and like just, a couple years ago, it's like uh, get hype for Fallout seventy six. Yeah, this was uh, actually a drama I got into because that guy had like three K subs, and uh, someone thought I was like punching down at him. Yeah, that was you. Okay, was it Red? It was Redfall. Was it, it was Redfall. Red, it was Redfall and Starfield. Yeah. So it was right. like why I'm excited for Redfall <laughs> and then it bombs and then why I'm excited for Starfield. I've got an uh, approximation of it using Matty Play's thumbnails. Uh, it's coming it's probably, yeah. it's, it's probably backwards, but. Oh, yeah, I probably would. Um, yeah, this was look, the basic thing was second. like Bethesda channels constantly run into it uh, face first. Yeah, and that 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 brings up a so yeah, I don't, I don't remember who that character that uh, guy was, but um, that doesn't it was matter. Just, is it? Here's the thing: there's an entire sphere of like 3K range Starfield channels that want to explode when the game comes out because they're going to be like resources on it. Yeah, and yeah. They, this for people who aren't professional YouTubers, what you have to realize is this exists about literally everything. I just ran into a channel that is dedicated to a Lord of the Rings gotcha game. Just on the off chance that this random Lord of the Rings gotcha game blows up, they're going to be the number one YouTube resource. Yeah. Oh, well, you know what? At, at least that's going to be like a niche thing. They have they have some chance of succeeding there. You got to understand with Starfield, you're going up against people who have like million plus subscribers and stuff like that. Like, yeah, I, I, mm-hmm. I think it's it's there's a good chance that, you know, like we could get buried in the yeah, field. I, I think Hype. one of one of them will blow up, and this will be this is how these Matty plays and Juice Heads and all these guys. This is how they blow up. Is they all start at like three K, and they make like they act like a resource for one of these new games comes out, and then they're the next new Bethesda channel in the space. Yeah, and 
and but all you have to do is be like a you know many a true nerd or Matty plays or juice it or any of the any of the above and you'll basically guarantee to be on top of any search result but you may yeah. after watching you them you might get a couple uh, pity recommendations from the YouTube algorithm and, 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 and also, get, and get um, like a thousand subscribers, basically. People that watch that kind of stuff eventually get tired of watching the same people. That's, yeah. You know, if inevitably, as a YouTuber, you're going to do something that pisses somebody off for the rest of their life. Yeah. And uh, so they're looking for like a new person to take over. Yeah. And there's a, the sort of under the kind of underdog bias where you have less power and influence and things like that. So I like you better. This big guy is bad for just for the fact that he's bet he's big and he's successful. So yeah, I can see that happening and, and, and power to him. I mean, I, I kind of, I cut, we all, we've, any creator has gotten that sort of big break and we're always happy for it. It's just kind of what you do with it. Are you going to just become, are you just going to become that hype beast where you just do nothing but be excited for next thing regardless? I mean, yeah, yeah we got a little I, negative I tone with, between us two and Thrust 3 actually, but at the same time, we're trying to make it better. We're not just accepting whatever's given to us. And we're not angling for Bethesda merchandise and early keys and stuff, which no. is what the... That's the paradigm that Bethesda <laughs> channels, a lot of them follow is they're very positive about the games in part because they do think that, but in part because there are benefits to being purely positive, even when the evidence is overwhelming that it's not going to be this amazing game. Yeah, there's actually a reviewer I follow, and he does a cool thing. He he gets a, a review key whenever he reviews a game, so he can get the gameplay and get a good idea of it to release you know right around launch. But he will also go out and buy a copy as well and and gift it to... A fan not because that's a huge marketing thing but because he doesn't want to be biased by being given a free key yeah. so i think that i think that's yeah. a cool thing it's like a small thing but it's also cool like you feel the basically marketing and pr's job is to make you you as an a quote-unquote influencer i dropped the i word i'm sorry the isler but uh as <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, as an influencer they they want they want you to feel that you're betraying a friend if you give a bad review. That's basically their ideal. So it's like, oh, I'm gonna go easy on these people because you know I like them and they've been nice to me. Their emails are friendly and courteous, and I get free keys and bonus content. And oh, they sent me a nice canvas bag or something. Yeah, like with the Starfield or sorry, the Star Wars channels, the grift makes sense why they're so positive about the games. Um, yeah. Starfield has been like a, a whole different beast, which, you know, none of it surprises me, but. Yeah, and I, I don't know, there's there's toxic negative negativity. I think I saw somebody in the comments earlier. It's like, oh, all the biggest Bethesda haters in one group. I'm mm -hmm. like, sure, why not? But at the same time, <laughs> there is such a thing as being so uh, positively, uh, so toxically positive that you cannot even you're not even a representative of the community anymore. You're actually something separate from the community. You don't, you don't yes. actually want to, you're not looking out for the consumer's interest anymore. You're looking out for your own interests. When I do a first impressions kind of review, it's always going to be honest. I'm not going to, I'm not going to be positive because I want to maintain a good relationship with the company to get free keys. I buy all my, all the games I cover. Yeah. And I'm not going to be overly negative to generate, uh outrage clicks because that grift doesn't work that well look at all the big people that you know get accused of doing that stuff do they really have any kind of long-term success no it tends to peter out pretty fast yeah especially if you don't have any sort of unique take on anything it, you kind of blend in with the, the other people who are just saying but get hyped for next thing like unless you actually have an interesting take or an interesting viewpoint or or a perspective or a way of analyzing or documenting something that kind of makes you stand out, you're going to eventually fade away because it's really easy to make something, you know, 53 reasons why Starfield will, you know, make you orgasm or something like that. Like it's, those are pretty, those are pretty easy things to, to make in terms of the amount of analysis and uh, production that goes into those. You can basically just take clips of this, of this Starfield thing, just like we're sh showing now you know, slow it down, repeat it, edit a little bit, and then talk about how great this, this shot is and how that yeah. means that we're going to have so-and-so systems and the world is going to be X number of kilometers wide and things like that.
Uh, and anyway, if you, if you have any other uh, private, do you have any other things? I, I I don't know if I have any more notes. I I wrote down some notes, but I figured it'd be pretty pretty like it is. You know, like not not too. Yeah, strict. I came in I came in blind today, but yeah. because I'm like so familiar with the topic. Yeah, that's basically it. If I wrote anything down, I would have just pigeonholed myself. Oh, I was yeah. going to mention the key mailer um, to get. You can apply to get a key. Uh, anybody yeah. can do it. You don't have to have a relationship with Bethesda. But the main re- one of the main reasons I didn't do it is that the deadline to make the video um, is like a couple weeks earlier than I would like. Yeah, yeah, that's basically it. I-, I was looking at that and I was like, uh, I- I'd rather be able to drop my video out in like December if I had to. Yeah, I'm aiming oh, for like so- a mid November release. Yeah. So, so you have to deliver a video within a certain yeah, amount of time as well. Yeah, it's by November fifth. So you have two months that you have to release a video or I think like key mailer will stop giving you free keys. Interesting. Wow. That's, that's pretty interesting. Um, I know that I I've dealt with a couple of those kind of things, but they, they're very, they're very basic. Basically you tie it into your YouTube account and it, and it checks your account. And if you post a video that's, that has the name of that, that game in it, they'll say, okay, you made a video of that game, but it's so easy to just simply like, it will actually you'll you'll basically have a couple of keys in queue like okay you've, you've gotten three key, game keys but after like a couple of months it'll just reset so even if you don't make a video it'll reset so i wonder if it would qualify uh if i did a live stream with the game it might i don't know if they yeah, do it, it depends uh, manually how or not the system is yeah if they're actually checking because yeah. like I, i'll probably end up doing a few live streams of the game before i actually release the video so yeah i was gonna count I was going to do like a September 2nd live stream of me just reading through all the skills. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that might count. I don't know what they're, I, I've gotten a couple, I very rarely ever take anybody's keys up, uh, yeah. you know, the, any of those things up from, I get a lot of them, but I very rarely take them. Uh, but they sometimes have a review. Uh, they, they have like, it's like, this is a review key. They would want a full review of the game, not for streaming. Cause I, I generally don't have the time to really do reviews anymore. So I'll, if I'll, I'll either stream it or maybe use it in, in a video sometime in the future, but nothing timely. So, uh, but yeah, I would look into it because I'm, I'm sure that they probably want people like big streamers to play their games too, right? Yeah. They might have like a, they might have a embargo on when you can com- uh, stream certain chapters. There's so much stuff like that. That's why I feel like I'll just buy the game. That way yeah, I have exactly. no, no stress <laughs> about it. Well, okay, yeah. here's the thing. The key mailer is the same day that the pre-order early access starts. Oh so yeah. First. Yeah. That, that's silly. <laughs> so so your reviewers can't review it before the pre-order people get scammed. Hmm. Yeah, there, there's a significant amount of people with Diablo 4 was the same thing. You could you could buy the digital deluxe I think and get it a few days early. Mm-hmm. Uh if you can't get it out before consumers can then yeah, that's not a that's not an embargo. That's you're basically just getting a a, pre, a pre-order copy. <laughs> yes. Uh which is um slightly shady. Yeah, the more no. confident a studio is in putting the game in the hands of uh, its reviewers before release, the kind of better a sign it is. Like, is this the AMD video? I haven't actually. Yeah, seen it. I just popped I it up. Um, I wonder if there's anything new in it, or if it's just re- a remix of the. Oh, that was in direct. I, I noticed. Yeah. So I'm, it's I'm probably curious. Probably just can, a remix of direct. I can play. fast forward through it. Let's see, Let's see, fast people. This looks all like it's from direct. Maybe. I think we just saw some of these shots for sure. Mm-hmm. Todd Howard again. They might There's have Todd a, Howard. A He's got like a. They probably recorded it the same day, and so yeah, like, this is news. But this was recorded months ago, which is hilarious. Yeah, I'm wondering how bad Nvidia is going to perform. I don't really care about all the like. I know Witcher Three had like a bunch of cool uh, features for Nvidia, but I couldn't use any of the the hair physics and stuff like that because it killed performance. Trust Same thing X, with I Arkham think. Knight. Yeah, Trust of X. Yeah. They had uh, a bunch of cool things for Arkham Same. Knight. You could barely get Arkham Knight to run at all on PC on launch. So so I didn't... so what was funny was that like we had like Trust Effects. Like there was a time period in gaming history and development where they were like really focusing on making nice looking hair. And now we're mm. up to Starfields, where the hair looks like shit that's from like 2007 again. It's so bad. Yeah, it's, am- it, it's amazing how bad the hair is in Starfield. The facial hair, especially, is like what the fuck. Yeah, it's it's really weird how that works. I mean, it, it 
It's like Am I crazy, or did Todd, if did Todd de-age between the summer game show and the recent release? Todd's age is all over the place. <laughs> yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd felt how, the go ahead. how good the lighting is and how good the marketing or the and the, the makeup people were. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, I can, I can, I have the tools right here. I can show you. That there's like a beauty filter built into DaVinci. I had something similar in my plugins for uh, Sony Vegas. There's stuff in After Effects. There's stuff in Probably Premiere plugins you can buy too that you can. Yeah. So uh, anything anything pre-recorded, yeah. Todd Howard's gonna look better than anything live. Also, fill lighting like that 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 uh twenty whatever it was twenty nineteen twenty twenty um Xbox showcase whatever it was uh that didn't have a good fill light that had like an overhead light and like very very harsh yeah. overhead lighting. Yeah. A fill light will do wonders. I look you can't even tell from this lighting because I've got a I've got a ring light basically, but I have like marks on my face that you'll see if I have bad lighting on me. So that's why I have a big fat light in my in front of my face so I don't look like a monster. But I've had those since I was 18. So it's not like I'm I, I'm ancient. It just some people have unflattering angles and unflattering lighting will highlight those. But uh, yeah. Yeah, this is all stuff we've seen before. Yeah, I, I, I it was already done. We fast forward through the whole thing. This is just okay. back to the back to the direct. Yeah, there's nothing new in there. But oh. I figured, like, I think that there's probably not going to be anything new. They're, they'll do interviews, but in terms of showing us stuff from the game, yeah. unless there's some kind of, like, emergency initiative to clarify something. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, um, the lead-up during to Skyrim, they just kept showing the same uh, vertical slice, basically. Like, they mm -hmm. did... I remember seeing it in uh, on Game Informer and G4. But, yeah. like, it, it, they showed that thing, like, so many different places. So it's, like, what we've seen so far is, like, that's all we're going to be seeing. So even if they do, like, a, a presentation at Game Informer, it's going to be the same the same stuff that we've seen already. So. Yeah, there'll, there'll be a couple couple new uh, clips, things like that. And then yeah. there'll be a trailer that comes out right before launch that will have undoubtedly have a Billie Eilish song tied into it. Because that's <laughs> and, what they do with Cyberpunk. Uh, <laughs> and all, and all, all of the things they communicate has to pass in front of a committee. Yeah. And I just think the process would take too long for them to... Yeah after to respond to something post direct that and actually get approved so like all the questions that we have about how like loading screens work and how traveling works that's just we're going to find that out on day one yeah sept it. What, what, september 1st is going to be the big yeah. uh, news reveal <laughs> yeah unless somebody gets their hands on it like super early and does like some leak yeah, that'd be interesting, wouldn't it? We got that with um, Zelda. I think somebody got nuked for that, didn't they? They got yeah. sued for it. Indigo, have you ever thought about doing a, one of these with uh, all the Daggerfall people? Like uh, Jeweler and Salty Shrimp Pasta? I should do something with Jeweler. Um, I, I I can't take credit for it, but his, his channel like super blew up after he did that huge Daggerfall thing. And I actually mm -hmm. was... It had already been getting some traction, but I, I plugged it early on and... Maybe I helped the algorithm. I don't know, but uh, that'd be kind of cool. I don't know. Uh, would you be interested in jumping on that? You're not really a Daggerfall guy much. Yeah, so. I, I feel like I'd be out of place. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to give me time to uh, get some more Daggerfall experience. Yeah, I know. Uh, it'd be kind of fun. I mean, I, I haven't done a whole lot of Elder Scrolls content recently. I Oh, Zerik not... would go on. He's a big Daggerfall person. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, I just haven't really found anything specifically other than how cool it was for uh, Gavin to finish Daggerfall Unity, his team to finish Daggerfall Unity, because yeah. that's a huge that's a huge project to, to completely port that game basically into a different engine legally and everything. It's awesome. Um, I, not many people know this, but uh, or a lot of people probably do actually, but uh, that game actually streams uh, data from Daggerfall.exe, the original Daggerfall. So it, it is it's actually parasitically pulling all the data from the original binary. So it needs the original Daggerfall install the entire, well, the entire that's time. That's how OpenMW works too. It uses the okay. Morrowind master file. That's pretty cool. I, I thought that was kind of a neat way of, of dodging it because you're not actually, uh, even though Daggerfall is freeware, so it shouldn't matter, but you, yeah. he's technically not pirating <laughs> anything. <laughs> it's pretty funny how that works. I wonder when, is Daggerfall on Steam? When are they going to do their Doom 64 <sighs> Daggerfall release style like Daggerfall release. Um, I think that yeah, they're, okay, they finally added on the Steam. Uh, I I follow Gavin Clayton, the guy who did uh, Daggerfall Unity, and every single time they release Daggerfall on a new platform, they did it for GOG, they did it for Steam, 
they always fuck it up. <laughs> so he's yeah, always got to. I heard the I heard the GOG <laughs> cut was uh, infamous. And so he has to make a new de- uh, new installer for Unity to fix the specific type of uh, tomfoolery that each each uh, build has. <laughs> so yeah, you can download it on, on Daggerfall. The best way is just to go to to Daggerfall Unity. That's the cleanest install. It's super easy. You just you you drag and drop out. You download. Unity, you download the Daggerfall install, you drop it in the right folder, and you're pretty much good. And they have a bunch of settings and everything for you. So. Daggerfall is fr- is free no matter what. If yeah, you, if it's you're free paying for everyone. Daggerfall, you're getting scammed. <laughs> yeah, I remember. I think early on they used to have Daggerfall as like a a freebie if you bought certain things on GOG, but eventually they just released it. Do you for think free. they regret that? Like at the time, it was easy to give Daggerfall away, but now it's like this Pandora's box where like they wish they could monetize it again. I don't think so. I, I, you can tell them, you can tell with this recent like 2023 Starfield footage how embar- how, how little they give a uh, damn about their early work. Like they don't even bother mm-hmm. recording new footage. They took like a Morwen's original like YouTube re upload interpolated footage of their trailer and uh, Daggerfall footage. God knows where that came from. That might have been the original Daggerfall trailer as well. Who knows? But yeah, I, if they could monetize it, they can't obviously now, but uh, I don't know, maybe it's like, I think the last time they actually sold it was the like, was it the 20th anniversary edition? The big CD collection went to like the fold out. I think that was the last time they actually sold a disc that had Daggerfall on it. They but, uh, gave Fallout 1 away with 76 on the Humble Bundle. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> well, that's one valuable game. To, yeah. <laughs> in order to get people to play 76, they gave away Fallout 1. <laughs> yeah. And I, I will remind people this was on the same uh, month as Pathfinder Wrath of the Righteous. So there's already like a mainstream popular RPG. Yeah. That was a whole disaster. I remember all the things they tried to do. And and again, people are people are probably kind of treating it like no man's sky where oh it's been fixed now they made good on everything like that it's like re- did yeah, they do did they though that's the <laughs> nice part of our videos was uh kind of debunking the it got better narrative yeah at, at best it went sideways yeah and and i you know i finally i, I think i did game pass i finally just said like okay i'm gonna finally play a little bit of fall city six because i didn't want to buy it even on on a principle i think zarek bought it early on because he figured that just the the return on investment was almost immediate because people were just wanting to see how bad this game was so he got that he got uh money back just from streaming pretty quickly but um i didn't buy it on principle just like i won't uh, play diablo immortal on principle and other games like that because just there i should not support that but uh when i finally did play it i'm like oh this is kind of boring it's kind of drab it's fine, mm-hmm. I guess, but that was after all the patches and stuff like that. So I wasn't getting the original awful disappointment of the original game. And uh, yeah, I mean, that, and you also bear in mind, like, yeah, you can play Fallout 76 now and it's not, it's not a, abysmal, but that, how many years after release did that take? How many years of patches did that take? So, and how much of a community did the game miss out on because of how many people have quit since then? Okay. Yeah, it's it's been a few weeks since I've looked at the Fallout seventy six player count. I wonder if it's, got, I wonder if it's has finally it, gone up. Has it has it has it fallen since they released uh, June twentieth their uh, new season? Because I remember looking at it and like they had a massive drop off like two days uh, after like, before I started looking at it. Looks like they're up about a thousand people. So so what is it at right now? They're at 13k, but you have to bear in mind the Mothership Zeta event just came out, and this is like the big uh, okay. drawback because there's exclusive gear that you can only get during this event. All that like alien blaster mm. ammo we were picking up uh, that we could never use because yes, uh, yes. it was tied to this event. Yeah. Do they have a? No, no, no. They have a new board from the uh, from uh, the Blue Ridge Caravan thing. So. They, no, it's, it's it's convoluted. Okay, they did three <laughs> three big things recently. They did the uh, Blue Moon update, which is, adds the werewolves. It's like right. two new two new events. It's, this is their big update in like six months. Is like yeah. two events. Um, <laughs> they did a new battle pass, the shoot for the stars, and then they're doing an event, which is unlocking the mothership Zeta thing because of Fourth of July. Uh 
it's like an Independence Day reference. There might be a little <laughs> bump. There might be a little bit of a bump as well. Like, uh, when did when did this um, recent Starfield thing happen? Was that like um, a... early early July or early June? Sorry, it barely got a bump from the Atlantic City news because okay. the up, the new update wasn't out. They just announced that it was coming. Yeah, I see a little bump in in June twentieth, but yeah, Fallout seventy six is. It'll it'll be played. People want to play something, and it's it's multiplayer Fallout. As as I think they're finally back up to their holiday numbers. Uh, they were at like fifteen k when we were playing. Yeah. No, they were only at fourteen uh, k. So they're back up to their the historic high of Nuka World. Ah, <laughs> yes. And that's yeah. supposed to let carry them into uh, twenty twenty four when they release the Atlantic City whatever that's going to be that's a, that's a long time to go without any content do they think that the do you think that it'll kind of go on and they'll continue to update it even with starfield do you think starfield kind of replace it as as a well it, it's under the c team and the c team is making some new content for it i mean events are extremely minor i, ba- I barely register them as even being content yeah. i assume that mm-hmm. they're putting new new like cosmetics up on the atom shop at least but um in terms of like actual content updates um we know atlantic city is coming which is after starfield because it's in 2024 i mean fallout 76's whole point is it's fallout live service so it might be operating at a loss just to say that like the fallout ip is still going and the, uh, microtransactions makes a lot of money. I think well, how much of EA's money comes from microtransactions? Like what, a third, two thirds, something like that. So yeah, even with a you know right now they're they're at riding high at about thirteen thousand concurrent players. Yeah, they've got That's, like a hardened core of people that are super invested into it that will buy twenty dollar power armor skins on yeah. top of the Fallout first fifteen dollars yeah, a month and everything. Yeah, yeah the thir- thirteen a month subscriptions. Um, which gives you atoms that you can spend, but yeah. So the the, the subscriptions, the real like money maker. Yeah, subscriptions, and then also uh, they're probably treating it a lot like um, Netflix and and things like that too, where they, these are engaged players, and so those are your peak your peak audience oh, for your next big thing too. You know what they're holding out for is the Fallout TV show. Uh, oh like yeah, that. yes. Very easy to forget that that's going to be a thing, but I, they probably <laughs> are holding out. For for that and if that fails then 76 is probably going to get decommissioned well they they did say when the when the c team was coming on they did say that they had content planned till 2027 which uh in retrospect looking at how they're releasing this stuff that's actually pretty easy to accomplish if you're only releasing three things you know one update a year and like (laughs) six events yeah and and just regurgitating events that not even austin made dude not even not even a year it's like so consider expeditions was like the bit the last big thing right Mm -hmm. um uh the pit expeditions that was september of 2022 uh so you're talking sometime let's be generous and say q1 of 2024 is when atlantic city comes out that's still over almost, a year yeah it's almost like a year and a half or so yeah that's quite the content drought <laughs> which i mean this, if you're in the 76 community you're used to you're used see, yeah. Content <laughs> yeah i mean that, and that and that once i came out it basically doubled it but that went from like 5k to 10k so it wasn't like a game changer in terms of player count well yeah, yeah. Exp- expeditions yeah. was supposed to be the new it was supposed to breathe content. new life it yeah. was supposed to it was supposed to be like a new chapter because it's like all right we're gonna have expeditions so like this is what they were selling it as before the game came out we're gonna have expeditions going to uh the pit then we're gonna go to dc and we're gonna go to all these different places and stuff and then expeditions came out and nobody fucking played them because they sucked and then they just dropped expeditions we still don't know if atlantic city is going to be an expedition or if it's going to be something else yeah. they're just like yeah we're going to we're going to atlantic city so it, it only makes sense to me to fit it within the expeditions framework. Yeah, because it's so I mean, old I mean there. they never abandoned daily ops as an example. Did you, they, yeah. Daily ops was like an ancient almost launch idea from uh, the nuclear winter update. I don't know if you saw the video. There's an entire update that doesn't exist in 76 anymore because <laughs> both of the things it added got cut, uh, which was the battle royale mode and a kind of like raid content mode. And also, um, uh, nuclear winter also came with uh survival mode as well like a hardcore 
uh, server yeah. mode. A all of that got server removed. for like harder core PvP, and then yeah, and it's all gone now. The only, only thing that exists now are just like the dungeons from that. It's like these weird liminal spaces. The, yeah, the, these empty spaces that uh, <laughs> have twenty five journals at the back of them. <laughs> I wonder if they're kind of hoping for a uh, a cyberpunk edge runners kind of thing to happen, where the the show will be so beloved that they'll be able to do like a DLC tie in oh, and there's, revitalize there's no the game. There's no, no fucking no way. way. It's a fucking yeah. Amazon show. Let's be real <laughs> yeah. here. It's, it's not going to be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's Fallout. Too. Uh, this is something I want to implore upon people. Like Starfield, by default, stands a higher chance with me just because it's not Fallout. I never cared for the post apocalypse. I'm totally into science fiction. Yeah, I mean, I I grew up with Fallout. I played actually, I think I played two before one, but I played both the originals back in the day and everything. So I really like. No, I actually took no. I played Fallout one demo the first, but uh, I, I I like what it was. I just I see it slowly becoming into uh, meme apop meme apocalypse basically. Yeah, like it, it's yes. it's way it's way too comedic. The original game was ridiculously dark with like a very dark comedic undertone where you can like laugh at the at the end of the world basically and and i see every new version like werewolves and stuff in fallout 76 yeah. like where, where are you guys going <laughs> what? <laughs> what's going on here yeah if you yeah. don't like the comedic tone oh man fallout 76 uh, let me tell you so 76 has a big focus on cryptids because that's like a big appalachian pastime is like speculating about wendigos and stuff are those and, crypto bros uh, you know, a different kind of crypto bro, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so they're like, but I think they haven't tapped the well of all the big Appalachian cryptids, but they still want to add more to the game. And so that's why we're getting werewolves, even though I don't think there's like skinwalkers in 76, which is weird. Huh. But uh, as someone did point out, Cyberpunk 2077 is a much better project product than 76. And I think that's a good point. 76 77 could be fixed in a way that 76 can't be it at least had like your it had a story it had npcs it had a compelling world uh mm -hmm. it didn't have multiplayer um there were some major flaws of the game design but it it there was a lot to enjoy in terms of like a single player game whereas well, i guess it, where 76 I, is like you, friends or nothing basically i guess it fits i'll say it now um the likely next long form thing I'm going to do is Cyberpunk 2077. Oh, cool. Last time we talked, I think you were talking about how you didn't really need to update your, your review because everything you said was basically still mm -hmm. accurate. Is that, is this like a different I, angle? I, I, or? Think it, I think it is. Well, no, I think it is still accurate. Um, there's just, I want to go deeper in depth at looking at kind of every component of it, doing research on its development history talking about the videos that have been made about it. And there's a cool contrast detail of like contrasting a first impressions review with my more analytic content so that people can kind of see what the difference of standards is. Yeah, but it is really I interesting. Agree. I watched it recently and I still agree with it. Yeah, it's really interesting how public perception is so fickle on something like I, I, I don't know if I've actually downloaded the uh, Edrunner DLC, but I, I, I read up on it like, hey, is this really a game changer? People are loving uh cyberpunk 2077 now and it was like it's like a mission uh a couple of cosmetics and like an, an item or a gun or something it was like it was a pretty small change to the game so i'm like okay so this is basically a non-thing people just like the the setting a lot because they like the netflix show well i'm not going to uh, start cyberpunk until after all the reworks are done my okay. gog person is probably going to send me a phantom liberty key and uh oh cool be a bit of a resource when it comes to all that stuff, which is cool. Yeah, no, I'm I definitely, that. I'm definitely looking to see if they can improve things with Phantom Liberty. Liberty, I, I think that it really needs like a, a significant DLC to fix the things that I had problems with mostly, mm -hmm. other than the bugs, obviously. Yeah, yeah I, well, there's been a rework in most major systems with each patch too. Yeah, so okay. that's what I was going to say is that um, I, I think a reason uh, Cyberpunk got lifted because of the uh, the you know the anime show whatever. Uh, yeah. was because people were going back to it and now they have all these patches and stuff it's just like oh okay the game's actually like pretty good now and stuff so uh, yeah I... um I, I think there's elements of quality that people always could have recognized that were blinded by the general hysteria towards the game which mm -hmm. i think is to some extent was true of 76 as well 
I kind of talked about that in the 76 video, like the good parts of launch 76 were overshadowed by the constant network disconnects and the clusterfuck the fact of the, the design. The fact that this is like the first Fallout game where we can actually side with the Enclave, no strings attached, and it's actually <laughs> like a pretty decent section of the story. Yeah. Nobody talked about that at all. Yeah, nobody made it that far. There's a yeah. lot of ways to you have to be dedicated. Yeah. And most of them were rushing for <laughs> nukes. Yeah. So like they didn't even pay attention to the enclave stuff. And uh, uh you weren't really a fan of uh No Man's Sky, even after all the updates and stuff, right? Matt? Yeah, I, I talked a bit about how No Man's Sky has a similar track record of people saying they fixed it. They didn't the, like they fixed the bugs, but the design fundamentals kind of stayed the same and that was kind of a problem with um the upgrade progression is just upgrades for the sake of upgrades you can just infinitely keep like going up to a certain point um but there's no like tangible benefits or anything it's just percentage more a percentage more efficient environmental resistance and i don't like that there's like a thousand different health bars that take different resources to maintain yeah and my main I... problem with no man's sky though is that it goes in and out of functionality. So I didn't experience any crashes with recording that footage last night. But when I reviewed No Man's Sky, the, ga the game would crash like once per play session. I have that same problem with like uh, uh, Oblivion era Beth Bethesda games where I'll have it working perfectly. I've got everything working. It's like, oh, it works like a dream. It's like, you can stream it, whatever. I'll drop it for a couple months, come back, and it just will not run at all. Yep. just like a complete yeah. mystery <laughs> so like that's one of the big problems facing no man's sky is that version to version the game is very inconsistent with if it'll actually function uh, they did do something though there's an accessibility feature that you can change all the radial like hold e to do stuff to be instant oh, oh really? that's, that's a huge thing oh. yeah it's yeah, hidden in great. the accessibility menu so like <laughs> if, if you don't use those options you might not realize but yeah you can change that now yeah, it's yeah, a minor thing but it just wears at you after a while I, I got I had a mod. I had mods that like removed the uh the vignette, the scan mm -hmm. lines, like all yes. this different stuff. It it made it so that you can instantly like uh hit, you know, buttons and stuff. And now they just like implemented all of that into the base game itself as options. And it's just like I, I appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it, no man's guy to make a really stupid analogy. It's like it's like you had a broken foundation and like an okay house that had some pretty vistas inside of it, like some pretty walls or whatever. <laughs> and, but the foundation was completely busted. And so over like, I think like Atlas update or whatever, like their first big update, I forget what it was called. They kind of basically, they fixed a lot of the bugs, a lot of the really, really big issues, like save game loss, things like that. They, they basically mm -hmm. made it more functional. And that was like, they kind of, they basically re repaired the foundation, filled it with grout. And so it works again, but it's still a pretty small house. There wasn't a whole lot in that house. And then like over the, the next five plus years, they just like add expansion after expansion after expansion. They add vehicle, you know, land vehicles, they added more ships, they added freighters, they had all these sort of other missions and different secret parts of the universe. They're basically adding more and more like they had solar panels on the house, a skylight. Yep. They added like a, all these kind of things, but it's still it's tiny little house. Like the foundation, ha so the foundation in the, in the core house hasn't really changed. It's still the same square footage, but they've got all these cool like extra add-ons like stuck on top of it. And, and they just haven't really expanded that, that or foundation yet so what's funny is no base building mechanics on launch 1.2 ish before the story update of 1.3 they add base building they have mm. reworked base building again <laughs> oh, in <wow>. recent time <laughs> so it's not just reworks of not just additions and reworks but reworks of the reworks it's there's a there's a bizarreness to the experience of being in the fallout 76 space or sorry, the well that, but the No Man's Sky space. <laughs> yeah, and and not to say that their additions haven't been absolutely welcome. They have, and they and thankfully have not charged for much or any of it, which is good too. But uh, the problem is the core gameplay loop, like the combat, still sucks. The mining still yeah. gets old after a while, and it yeah, mm -hmm. it does get old after having to eat yeah. flowers to not die for yes. you know 30, 40, 80 hours. <laughs> It doesn't improve with time. It just scales to be a bigger and bigger problem. Whereas like something like Minecraft, um, if hunger annoys you, there's ways to like get good food to yeah. disable it as a mechanic. Like there's a lot of systems in Minecraft that if something annoys you, you can sidestep it through the progression, what progression there is. But with it's... No Man's Sky, it's just the same loop of it's always refilling your bars. It's a hunger system, but an annoying hunger system. But, but the thing yeah. is, is that 
there are people who really dig that. Like there are people yeah. who really do like No Man's Skies' gameplay and what it was offering, which is kind of it's interesting to see that um Hello Games recognize that no, we we have like a good we we have a compelling gameplay loop here for for a yes. certain audience, and we're gonna stick to it. We're gonna make sure like we're gonna fix everything, but we're not gonna abandon that. As opposed to Fallout seventy six, where it's like, oh, people really didn't like this because of this, that, and the other thing. So we're gonna get rid of literally everything from yeah. even if yeah. it was a good idea and people were just misdiagnosing it or just didn't appreciate it at the time. Get rid of it. We're just gonna basically rebuild the whole game from scratch. Yeah, that is an appreciable element. Like, I know it's not fully for me, but I do, am glad that they never tried to make it for me. Yeah. In some respects. Yeah, you could definitely see how they could just kind of patch it to oblivion and it'd become like a, a third person shooter game or something like that. So I appreciate that they at least <laughs> stuck to their guns, but uh, I could see, yeah, it just, it, the, 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 the beat to beat, which is like, which is that's why whenever I see No Man's Sky, when I get No Man's Sky vibes from Starfield, I'm worried that it's gonna have the same problems. The yeah. beat for beat, like, oh, I'm gonna mine this, I'm gonna walk over here, I'm gonna mine that, oh, I'm gonna scan this flower, I'm gonna scan this bird. That beat for beat is cool for the first ten, de ten planets, maybe, and get really old after a while. Okay, so follow my logic here. Todd Howard said that uh, Starfield's gonna be more like Red Dead than No Man's Sky. I wish I'd asked this when Zarek was here. What the fuck does that mean? <laughs> it, it's, it's as meaningless a statement as, as it can be. Red Dead Redemption 2 is a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. So it's like, are you saying that it's going to be like a serialized, a shitty serialized TV show with a thousand different like I saw, conflicting plot lines? Or I is it going to be a survival that, sim? Or I saw that he was just talking about that in terms of they have a cowboy town. Like, yeah. no joke that's that was it like the most surface level we oh, have okay. we have cowboy town this isn't no man's sky no man's sky doesn't have cowboy town red dead does yeah it's such a meaningless but beautiful <laughs> statement i wish we had a timestamp of when in that interview is it is unfortunate that that's I, thursday's stream it, yeah i think yeah. that's in the uh i think that's in the ign one i'm sure i'm so sure it'll be a, a lightning i'll have but to i kind of i kind of gave it some thought and i'm like I've played Red Dead 2, <laughs> and it's like a thousand different things. It, it, it's a very meaningless. You can go statement. hunting. You can go gambling. I, I shot some people mm -hmm. after playing poker once. It's yeah, a, it's a lot of have horses. Yeah. You, <laughs> can, like, horses. you can like take a rowboat into the swamp and shoot alligators. Like, <laughs> what is? What do you mean? It's like Red Dead. I found this I interesting. Can... Uh, sorry, just this little clip here where it's got the targeting system for the ships. I thought, like, yeah, yeah. is this and is this like space vats? Is this space? It, it does remind oh, yeah. me of space vats. Um, yeah, <laughs> I think they didn't want to do a vat system in combat, but they still wanted to do some kind of vat system because yeah. So this is like their kind of compromise. I mean, I, it looks cool, I have no, I have no seen. feeling for how the space combat's going to work. It's such a who knows? It could be anything. It re it really reminds me of No Man's Sky because I I've played yeah. Elite Dangerous and No Man's Sky. And it's like playing those two games is night and day when you're talking about like space combat and stuff. Yeah. So I look at this and it's like, yes, yeah, it's just very arcadey. This is No Man's Sky esque. I have a video with kind of poor audio quality that uh, goes into detail about the elements of Red Dead's story that I don't like. Um, I think there's a good story in Red Dead. I just think that it's too much like a TV show with a thousand different plot lines. Yeah. And that makes it very frustrating to play through. It was but, a it was a game where like they could have focused on just one one arc and made it a whole game and it would have been great. Like Red uh, Dead like Red Dead ones had a good focus on John yeah. Marston's story. Yeah, exactly. But uh, I, even I, just like even just like the like the weird like gimmicks and stuff when you're dealing with the um the Proto Italian mafia in uh in San Denis, and it's just like when we got to that, I was like, oh man, I hope we get to like stick with this for like you know ten or so missions. This is really cool, and then it's just like two missions over. Yeah, I I only heard about the four hour intro to the Red Dead Two, and I'm like, I'll just play multiplayer and, <laughs> yeah. and shoot people after after playing cards. So I'll do just That's that. That is a funny thing. <laughs> yeah. Is uh, Red Dead Online is almost. It, it, almost an equal experience to installing the save file to play as Arthur yeah. Morgan that skips the intro and just like yeah. running off to do your own thing. It's I, I liked it. I liked playing uh, Red Dead Online, and I also like playing GTA Online because uh, if I'm just going around causing chaos and I like die or something like that, I just respawn right there. There's no like I'm getting set back like 20 minutes or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's just like Red Dead Online was just more open to being just 
playing the game your way. Just an online it, cowboy simulator. That, that's yeah, kind of, I I'm think down to that. Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption 2's story is strong if you're watching a YouTube movie that's like compiling mm. someone's specific arc. Yeah, like if you're you're into what's her name, the cowgirl, if you just want to see her entire story, like someone could edit that into a video and it would be more compelling than actually playing Red Dead <laughs> 2. It looked way too easy to gun down someone's ship. It looks like No Man's Sky ship combat, which is not a marker of quality which is funny because like they have uh boarding actions and stuff and it's like am i really going to be compelled to board other ships or am i just going to be compelled to blow them up because this is going to be the quickest way to deal with enemies the, the only think, incentive i could see is if you could board it maybe you'll be able to take it over you can yeah, you, yeah. you can take it over um so each ship you take over gets added to your fleet and then you can yeah. sell them which i imagine is going to be the go-to money grinding yeah. <laughs> probably yeah. method is uh just stealing ships Oh, unless unless there's like some some resources that you can you can like dig for and get a lot of money for, I'd say yeah. if it's if it's anything comparable to an NMS uh, economy, ships were a lot a lot of money. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, it's, I liked No Man's Sky's element of you were constantly trading your ship up. Yeah, instead yeah, of like just that. having a big fleet of ships that you would buy with your riches. Yeah, you could have a few in your freighter, but yeah, there was always the kind of like, ooh, compare the stats. How many slots do I have? Oh, I got to buy that other mm -hmm. module again, but I've got all these extra slots and it's, you know, faster, better guns, whatever. Yeah, it, it, it'll be interesting to see. I just, yeah, that, that, that short clip where it showed them zoning into a planet, I'm like, ooh, that's a, that's a really big feature that nms they literally built their entire engine from scratch for nms to be able to to no man's sky yes. to, be able to do that so i'm fairly confident i'm talking about the world gen and loading screens and all that i'm less confident in talking about space combat or yeah even combat in general yeah well, at least the that, uh but... the recent uh gameplay reveal uh enemies were at least responding to getting shot so that that was step in a step in the right direction yeah a little bit and there's a bit of a there looks like to be a health rework where like enemies will have multiple health bars in starfield yeah that's i still have no idea what the hell's going on with that yeah because they barely show it <laughs> i think i almost think it was an accident yeah oh man and then we're we're back to this clip <laughs> i turned <laughs> i turned my uh smooth per, smooth talker perk back on uh, just the yeah. overlay <laughs> it's just because <laughs> we're back to the shill <laughs> Yeah, uh, it looks so, it looks kind of cool, but it's probably a very, very basic. It's probably even just like projected from your phone as a, through the app or something. I don't know. It yeah, seem so the funny thing, the watch UI element that's in Starfield was in the 2018 leak, meaning that one of the very oh, first wow. things they did was come up with that UI element. So I can only imagine that the watch because it's in the story. There's like a story point where that black charismatic guy gives you hit the watch. Yeah, and that's like that's your pip boy moment i guess um i can only imagine that this was like day one design document added benefit on, on the pros list it's like we could sell an actual watch <laughs> it was probably part of the pitch i i've spoken to publishers before and uh I mean, pretty big publishers actually and or at least one of them and uh that was actually part of their pitch like what what's kind of what are your future monetization plans like what what kind of dlc what kind of you know, long-term monetization can you offer? And it's like that that's either cosmetics or microtransactions or some sort of tie-in. So I'm sure this is actually probably part of the initial pitch for the game. It's like, yeah, we're gonna sell a watch that connects to your in-game watch and we're gonna design a character who gives it to you and it's all part of the story, it's all coherent. It's like, okay. Well, <laughs> uh, what's funny is like throughout the, um, especially the, uh, what is it? The Into the Starfield Constellation things, you would see like these Starfield mugs all over the office. Mm -hmm. uh if you go to their website because uh, bethesda has an online shop where you can buy merchandise they don't yeah. have anything they don't have anything starfield except for like a hoodie it's that's like, so weird it's like that's... why can't i buy that mug that's such an yeah, obvious thing to do so much yeah that was like when they re released the mandalorian tv show and disney of all companies were remiss in making a a uh, baby yoda plushie which would have been the most obvious thing to sell. And everybody, people made a killing on Etsy for making custom ones because Disney didn't have an official uh, product. <laughs> I think that was part of it was, I remember they were like censoring uh, on like tenor Baby Yoda g gifts. Yeah. Gifts, gifs. And uh, that was like driving people to like post it further and spread it further, which, come on, in retrospect, total marketing move. 
Absolutely. Um, oh, uh, speaking of marketing moves, so Constellation questions were all fake, right? Uh, yeah. Mark Kern on Twitter has been talking a lot about uh, Microsoft and Activision Blizzard astroturfing campaigns hmm. of uh, like basically the huge outpouring you're seeing of like support for Xbox is like, why do so many Xbox fans have such strong opinions about the merger? Like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like uh, it's almost like it's astroturf. So, yeah, Mark Kern's over on uh, Twitter right now kind of talking about how the industry does this stuff you know that sounds very dangerous when you're when you're talking about a uh you're being sued by the ftc right now yeah. and you're going around doing astroturf campaigns against the ftc <laughs> lawsuit yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it's gonna be dangerous well, yeah there's I mean, a lot of that internet really theory is getting more and more merit over time like there's absolutely bot farms all over <laughs> yeah i mean i don't think it's against the law to do that kind of stuff either well, it's probably one of those things where it's like, it's difficult to prove this, right? Mm -hmm. you, you could say, oh, it's just some like, you know, a bot farmer in like Russia or something that's spamming these things to make us look bad or something. It's like, it'd be a hard, hard thing to uh, really prosecute in court. Well, okay. So <laughs> the, the funny thing about the Mark Kern thing was they started with um, the, the, the skeptics of Mark Kern were like, Oh, he was a nobody dev at, at Blizzard. And then like everybody posted all of these items that are in World of Warcraft that are named after him and like <laughs> the job titles he had and how pivotal he was to launch WoW. And then they were like, well, you got fired from Activision or sorry, it was Blizzard at the time. He's like, no, actually, I left because uh, act the management decided to fire all of my people to save on payroll. Oh. <laughs> uh, so he he left the company and they like even begged him to come back. Um at some points and uh, they resort so, to like just insulting you know fun, yeah. what, or if his game they, that didn't do so they, well or whatever yeah. yeah they keep trying to like undermine his credibility in the industry and it's like no dude this is the guy who made uh mmos the market that they were yeah like this guy's the real deal and and he's been proven right by a lot of things i mean he's got some controversial views for sure but he's he Sometimes people like my, my the reason I follow him is just so he can dunk on people who's like, what do you know about video game design? He's like, have you looked at my profile? Yeah. <laughs> but no, he's he's predicted a few things, and yeah, no, I mean the it's it's really cynical. Uh, you have to be really cynical about the big the big side of video game industry, which is really cool when you look at the indies and what middle market guys are doing. Yeah. They can you see some really promising projects, just like the. You know the one that we we pinned up there, Ardenfall. That is really um, inspiring. That one guy can basically make a Bethesda like from scratch. But yeah, it's a very good sign. Um, I support the project. I think he has a Patreon now. Um, I'll look that up. I know he follows me on Twitter. That's um, when it comes to like AI and stuff. Uh, generative oh, and AI. By the Oh, by the way, he's doing it part time too because he has an actual job in the industry. Oh, man. oh, wow! Yeah, he works but, at oh, Valkyrie, really? and he works at Valkyrie Entertainment. Oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know he has a part a full time job in the industry. I but, thought it was um, just kind of a yeah. Uh, so like that for projects like this, where it's like one or two people working on something, and they can use generative AI to you know speed the process along and make something yeah. that's larger scope that i'm all about that that's what gets me excited yeah if you like i posted the patreon link if you like it uh, if you play the demo and you like it you can actually monetarily support it i see nothing wrong with using tools like we've been using all sorts of tools you know daggerfall was used proc gen i have no problem with using tools to expand your capabilities as a designer if you can set the parameters like, okay, this terrain is going to have this kind of this thing, this thing, that thing, that thing mm -hmm. is going to have these various kind of features. And, and I'm going to adjust the climate here and here and, and generate some fields over here with some, tr with these kind of trees. I'm all for that. You can now take, you can now kind of, it's like a force multiplier. You can take one really good designer and make them into the power of like say four or eight or whatever. I think that's awesome. And yeah. I forgot who said it. It might've been somebody who probably shouldn't be citing, but somebody said that the ideal team size should never, uh, you should, your team should never be bigger than uh, too big to eat it, to share a pizza, basically. Like basically the ideal, the yeah. ideal uh, team size should be like under eight people essentially so that you can kind of keep it focused and 
certain people have specific uh, specialties and skill sets. When you get too big, you get a lot of uh, just always, pe people don't pull their weight and everything. And yeah, it just gets really I've messy. always heard good things about uh, like 30 person teams. Yeah. Yeah. Some, like 15 to 30 is like a good, it, you get too much bigger than that. It starts to become a whole, a whole issue. And that's kind of, that's kind of like at Mark Kernigan, he was on Diablo 2. Um, that's kind of the big difference between uh, Diablo 2 and Diablo 3. Diablo 2 had a, I, I, uh, Blizzard North, including everybody, was like well under 100 people. I think the, the core team who worked on Diablo 2 was like around 30, I think. And, uh, you know, not excluding like the, the localization testers, stuff like that, which are kind of, you know, ancillary to that. But uh, uh, Diablo 3 had like well over, I think, three, or had, I think, 100 at one point possibly more but if you look at that after you look at the full credits it's like hundreds of people involved in that project and you could definitely tell just the kind of bloat you get when you get a bigger team you get less of a clear vision you just get kind of inconsistent results and you just get a lot of indecision and and that game in particular just had a lot of design indecision they just couldn't figure out what they were doing so they just kind of iterated for four years yeah, or so. you get um, you get compromises. You get a game made of compromises where it's like, all right, we want to do this thing, and somebody else wanted to do that thing. So we kind of went in the middle of the road, and it's like it becomes this like kind of gray matter type of game where it's just like there's yeah. no real identity, no real soul to it. Yeah, it's no longer a vision. It's just kind of like, a, oh, well, we all kind of the consensus is this kind of, so we'll <laughs> go with that direction roughly. And um, I feel like we're in a pretty. Uh, because people like to make up, you know, like uh, kind of shit on um, rock star game developers now, like Kojima and stuff. Like, uh, yeah, you know, it's, we really shouldn't be holding these people up to a pedestal and all this stuff. It's like sometimes in a creative in a creative uh, project, you really do need somebody who has like a strong vision and who can command and tell people like, yes, this is what we should do. No, we shouldn't do that. Uh, sometimes it's honestly a lot of the time. That's how you get really good uh, projects in the end. Something that's very focused. I have some thoughts, but I'm not an expert on account of uh, not working in a creative team environment in the past. Um, oh, my, yeah, most of my team experience is like logistics stuff, not really uh, creative stuff. Yeah, well, I mean, we we co collaborated a lot for Fallout 76 and stuff. It it becomes and even that was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it was it was all right. It, it could have gone much worse. I, I think. Um, uh, it worked out well because you and I actually worked really well together. But uh, mm -hmm. um, it, the way I look at it, and, and this comes with any any business, really, um, you should look at something and be like, can we do this? Not like, like what can we make? What can we achieve? Not like, oh, we want to make this thing. How do we get to making that thing? Uh, you know, there's a certain degree of growth you want to do for anything, but um if your answer is we need to double our size as a studio in like three months in order to achieve that that should that should be immediately be like no we, should, we can't do that just yeah. don't do it yeah the kind of bloat and the you know you can throw more people at a problem that they'll actually create more problems than, than it's worth yeah. like sometimes going in like with a very small team that has a very very tight plan a very specific very specific milestones and and goals and a precise vision documentation everything like that they know exactly what they're going to do is way better than having just gigantic teams that that just kind of mess around and and consume up budget and time and resources for years and years and years it, that can really kind of it just ends up in a lot of wasted time yeah i would be interested to see how team dynamics on youtube evolve uh, especially with collaborations and stuff um do you have any thoughts on our collaborative project kind of as an outsider and as a creator oh on uh you're in yours in private sessions i think it's yes. i think it's cool you guys seem to work together well um i haven't finished i've i've watched bits and pieces of the uh the fallout 76 video and you know it, it is a short analysis so you know i i didn't have yeah. the whole time to, <laughs> to look at it but uh <laughs> listening for, rather than watching yeah that's what i was doing i was listening while i was working but uh no, you guys seem to have a thing together, and uh, and uh, if it if it helps to kind of sometimes you just get completely stonewalled. Like uh, you know, sometimes I I bounce ideas off my wife. Sometimes she reviews my scripts and stuff like that. But not having that extra person to, you know, kind of just you know help focus you and help uh, bounce ideas off of and and help kind of 
work on different ideas and things like that, that you can get really kind of burnt out sometimes. So I think that you guys have a good thing going together and, and it seems to be working out. I, I noticed your, I think the last time I saw your sub, your sub count was considerably smaller. So it, your, your sub count is growing pretty well I, from what I've seen private. I, I, is that, am I incorrect in that? I thought it was your much lower uh, yeah, last time it, I saw. It's, it's going pretty well. I, you know, I started the year at like, I think less than 20,000. So uh, it's, it's been pretty good so far. That's great. And hopefully you continue to, to grow and improve. It's, it's, it's not exactly a, a niche anymore, the whole game analysis things, but I've noticed it's, it's the, I think we talked about Ahoy before. It's like the way you beat Ahoy is to make more than one video a year. Uh, you're, yeah. we're getting that with like a lot of these kind of, uh, creators like the Joseph Andersons who like need to learn Polish to be able to review, uh, <laughs> the <laughs> yeah. Witcher series. I have, I've been seeing, um, I've been seeing that movement. There was a comment I saw the other day where it's like, I'm liking this trend of YouTubers that are all like going mentally crazy from doing these super long, pro difficult projects. <laughs> and I'm like, so it's starting to become just a trope at this point. Like it, yeah. it's not going to be cool. Give it, give it a few more of these prolific videos and it's not going to be cool anymore to be like, oh, I'm psychologically scarred from the research I had to do on this project. And then like, I'm, yeah. I'm already, I'm already thinking ahead no, of like, how to how to get out of this like arms race of making long videos and stuff yeah uh, because it's it's a zero sum game really or even negative sum actually yeah this like, is, like, this like super red like, like yeah. super red trying to top me and everything and it's like yeah go for it, yeah exactly do, do the do the 30 hours uh skyrim video i i will watch it yeah it'll be fun i promise <laughs> yeah you're gonna get so burnt out and and honestly like the best return on investment in terms of n number of views, comments, and uh, everything was probably the solo project I did, I did in like two months with, for a uh, little Dark Sun game. So like, yeah, my big videos, they historically have done really well, but sometimes you just gotta kind of break loose and, and uh, just make something quick. Like I, my Diablo video is probably my quickest two hour video I've made since 2018. And so I've just gotten really, really just like the turnaround has gotten really slow. So um, you seem to have a pretty good, uh, you know, pretty good thing on it. Uh, hopefully it continues. I, I, I'm entering my, my, I think my eighth year as a YouTuber and I'm starting to get a little, it's, it's sometimes hard to, to just sit down and write sometimes, but yeah. Yeah. I just, um, I get, just find things that kind of inspire you when you get into that niche where you're like, oh, I've got to do blah before blah, because otherwise I won't get views. That's when you start to kind of die inside, I think. I started this channel. Well, I started this channel expecting nobody to actually watch. Um, and I didn't really expect me like to actually enjoy video production. But um, as I started to get into it more and I started to consider it a career, I always knew this channel, Private Sessions, has an expiration date. I will eject at some point. But that doesn't mean I'm going to quit vid like producing videos. It's just I want to do like other things. I want to do business stuff. I, li I like history. I, I have other like, yeah. interests and stuff. So. The way I look at it is like, I want to be a YouTuber for life, but I do not want to be a gaming channel for life. Yeah, I've expanded a lot too. I, I started out purely gaming, but then I kind of um, dipped a little bit into movies every once in a while, just talking about them and references and stuff like that. And then the Cyberpunk series, I I think part three, I mentioned two games or something. <laughs> so yeah, it was mostly yeah. movies and TV shows and books. So that kind of helped uh, keep me kind of interested and focused on different things. But ideally, I mean, kind of tied to gaming, unfortunately with my name, but ideally, you'd be able to kind of become a personality that people would go to, to watch you talk about anything. And that's, that's the dream. Yeah. So. <laughs> I don't know. I'm still having fun. Oh yeah. I, I'm, I'm still enjoying, like I love making the, the long form Skyrim videos and everything. I'm really looking forward to doing Starfield, but I know one day I will get bored of it. And that's the day I stop. I, I don't see myself ever stop stop covering gaming but I, I think that once you get a, a big enough audience or, or, or people kind of know what your style and and yeah. what you bring to things are you can that value can be placed not exclusively in one area like even yeah. the, the really big youtubers quite often started with just fallout or whatever just Elder it scrolls and gets, now they just cover whatever they want to it gets tricky on youtube because the the algorithm loves to pigeonhole uh channels so like yeah. the, the idea, some of the ideas that I have for videos, I'm like, I will never put that on my private sessions channel because I know yeah. what happens. I, I know what happens with the algorithm and stuff. So that's why you see like a lot of big uh, YouTubers and stuff make a million different channels and stuff. It's like they're just trying to get around the algorithm because they want to they want to do something creative. But 
uh, YouTube seems to incentivize just find a formula and just grind it out until it stops working. Yeah, and you can kind of uh, sort of snowball effect to a point where you've gotten 80,000 of your subscribers from X topic. You mm -hmm. want to do Y topic now. So it, for every new subscriber yep. for Y topic, you're going to get, you know, a, a, an unsubscribe from X topic. And so it's it seems like a losing battle. Yeah. But so, yeah, it can be it can be kind of tough. And, and I just wish they had, uh, you know, it would be really help us if YouTube actually kind of... Um, talk to their creators more and actually figured out <laughs> oh, like have having <laughs> having YouTube creators shouldn't be a channel. YouTube creators should have channels. You should be able to yeah. have like three or four different topics that people can subscribe to under your, your yeah. a YouTube creator. You should having, you, having should to create to a brand shows like, yeah, I can subscribe to somebody's like just their Skyrim videos. Like that's, that should be an option. Absolutely. Um, and you should also have networks too. So like Twitch has streaming networks like teams. Um, and so like if you're watching somebody on a team, you get recommended stuff from other people on those teams and stuff. So it's like that's how you could also create uh, a collaborative effort, a collaborative because uh, you see a lot of collaboration on Twitch. But on YouTube, there's not much collaboration it's because the nothing really incentivizes it, honestly. Um, yeah. So uh, that would be a nice thing to uh, see, too. I also think uh, we need to have a. Um, uh, a dedicated YouTuber uh, like um, convention because like Twitch has several of them uh, and they're great places once again for uh, networking and stuff. And we don't have we had like VidCon, but last I heard it's that like was more like TikTok. <laughs> yeah, it's like TikTok now and shit. And it's like I don't want anything to do with that. Yeah, I would I would probably not even run into a single subscriber at VidCon. It's it's very yeah. much like your kind of Jake Paul. You're sort yeah, of. Yeah. Um, those kind of types. So yeah, it'd be, it would just even have to be physical. It'd be kind of cool to be physical, but you could even do some kind of a virtual thing and just have some yeah. sort of meet up and talk to people and stuff. I've met precisely one subscriber in real life. <laughs> <laughs> so the world is big and, and you might look at these numbers like, wow, I'm so famous, but you know, in the grand scheme of things, you, you really aren't. So it just, it would be kind of cool to get a congregation and kind of see what people want to see. And, and yeah, it, have some sort of uh, put voice to, uh, put a voice to things because right now YouTube just simply survives on just the the sheer scale of it all. They have enough yeah. creators creating enough content that it just feeds the people's hungry hungry con their content hungry mouths. But and the uh, algorithm and, and, is just sophisticated enough that you can create uh, these different niches and subgenres in it without it actually having a title or being recognized. So like I didn't even know long form analysis was a thing until I ran into Pat and he's like, oh yeah, like LARP it, or not LARP, uh, EFAP, like they're a whole, yeah. it, it, it has its title. And I was like, oh, I didn't even know that. Meanwhile, I'm making videos in the sphere. It's like, no, it's, it doesn't, there's not just EFAP. There's entire like sub niches of people who disagree with EFAP. Yeah. And so like, yeah. there's entire like long form genre, like your H bomber guys are out there and your Quentin yeah. reviews and yeah, and then you have I, the EFAP sphere and the sub EFAP sphere with like stag and it's just funny how you kind of become like you kind of become a, a content hobo where there's so many creators I used to follow religiously that I like can't can't even stand anymore because they <laughs> either change or they don't create the same content or they've completely they flipped on their anymore. Yeah, or they don't make yeah. Stuff. Oh That's my true. god, the regrettable thing is um, Fallout seventy six is my only video this year, and then. I'm doing the Outer Worlds is coming out this week, part one of Outer Worlds, but a lot less content, like per video topic, anyways. Yeah. It's still, it, I think I'm still up in terms of hours of content. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of how you have to look at it to not drive yourself insane. It's like, how, much, how many hours of content did I produce for the year? Yeah. I mean, you're not going to bang out a, uh, you're not going to bang out a weekly quick, quick analysis video. That's just impossible. You, there's, 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 and that's the thing, like they need to figure out a recommendation system that works better for people who really put in the hours. Like your your ahoys shouldn't be going head against somebody like who I also like a like a some ordinary gamers who just does like a topical video he he literally knocks out in like a half an hour. You know, yeah. very enjoyable, but it's not even in the same galaxy of content. I'm I'm gonna say that I think a lot of that is up to the community. 
over yeah. on my discord server i'm running a submissions channel um trying to get together kind of a list of content and just like keep adding to it based on community submissions of good stuff and then because everything is going word of mouth now that like the mainstream internet's kind of falling apart yeah yeah it is interesting and um yeah, social so media is kind of in flux too. Like we don't. There's really going to be a lot of I hear. I heard of per, this person through this person. So like, say, someone hears of me. Someone's likes your cyberpunk documentary. They watch this. They hear of me. They watch my LARP episode number five. That's going to be coming out soon. And they hear of salty shrimp pasta. And then it's like, oh, this guy's act. This this three thousand sub YouTubers like totally up my alley. But I never would have heard of them just through algorithm recommendations. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of sad because they actually have a feature for that. And I, all, all the people I recommend or I'm watching, I usually put on my recommended, you know, I, I, I've put on mm -hmm. my Indigo recommends feed and I have it randomized, but nobody looks at that. <laughs> I'd love to, I'd love to give people more, more views and stuff like that. It's just, there's no easy way to do that. Generally, yeah, that's, why, that, that's why I do LARP uh, it, is to word of mouth promote people. Yeah. Getting people to convert is also difficult too. Like we, we saw it between me and Pat when, uh, we we were literally selling each other's videos as like companion videos to each other and like yeah. you know yeah, like we gave it away on each other's patreon yeah and patrician's video still did like you know leagues better than mine did in terms of total views and it's just like that's kind of that's just kind of how it works i don't know if you look at the interaction uh, metrics like the amount of people who click on the end screen video or the uh they don't give you met metrics on uh, links and everything like that but it's it's minuscule like under one percent for me yeah mm. yeah so like it, it can get to the point that you can say in a video go watch this person's video if you're interested and they they still won't do it so it, it's tough but you do need to be open-minded to like hearing people's recommendations yeah and and really the the best thing you can do is basically just um i guess tackle the same topic as them because then they'll just get recommended because that's one of the problems I've been seeing actually is I, I've always kind of punched above my weight in terms of uh, subscribers. Like I got my first million view video was like when I was like maybe 20,000 subscribers or something like that. That's actually become harder to get that view count, even though I have 10 X the subscribers now, which shouldn't make any mm -hmm. sense. So it's, it's, I think the algorithm has become so, and by algorithm, I mean, YouTube's homepage recommendation feed. People argue that the algorithm doesn't exist. That's what everybody means is the, you, you know, when YouTube puts a video in well, front of you, you, the algorithm doesn't exist. <laughs> yeah. I've had to argue again, arguing Twitter, that's a, everybody's downfall, but yeah, no, it, <laughs> everybody means when YouTube says, watch this video, <laughs> yeah. there is an alg there is an algorithm or some sort of recommendation system behind it. But yeah, that system that is so overpowering where I get more recommendations sometimes from, from creators I don't subscribe to than people I do. Yeah. So subscribe subscriptions are like, becoming almost irrelevant in a way or if yeah, you just like it, watch it, it, five of somebody's video you'll you'll you're basically subscribed i think most of my subscribers see my live streams and stuff because of the discord promotion more so than youtube recommendations yeah yeah um yeah because yeah, um so how that works too is uh your subscribe not all subscribers are created equal and people don't people don't know this is that um yeah if you stop watching somebody on your uh, like uh, you subscribe to them and say you didn't watch any of their content for two years, you're going to stop seeing them release like their yeah. content's not going to reach your sub box uh, consistently. Like, like even the uh, sub box, not just the yes. algorithm. Yeah, yeah, your sub box because it uh, it sh it um, stratifies uh, releases. So like the first like, you know, 100,000 views or whatever, it'll push to your hardcore uh, viewers. And then it'll go out to the people who maybe watch like one of your videos. They're still subscribed to you, but they're going to yeah. watch like every six months or so. Then they'll get it. Now before like your first, your next like 200,000. And then like it goes out to all your subscribers after that. And then it goes out to the uh, wider uh, market, basically. And it just keeps growing and growing and growing like rings on a tree, basically. And uh, that's kind of how the system really works. But it's, it's interesting to see that. Um, that's why like. The, the bell notification. I don't even know if that fucking works anymore. Like, I, I don't even, I mean, we don't even know what that does, but um, yeah, <laughs> it, it's, there's, it, it's, it's actually a way. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No. And, and I don't know about you, but like, I probably maybe 5% of my subscribers have the bell turned on, but yeah. I don't nag people around it. I, 
I'd rather just hang myself from the bell than nag people about subscriptions and <laughs> click the bell. Cause, and also you'll n ever notice if you go back to old videos, people are like, yeah, click the button to the right to subscribe or click the button, you know, above me to subscribe because they keep on changing their UI. Yeah. Someday they might just get yeah. rid of the bell. So your video is going to be permanently dated. <laughs> so I, yeah, I just like, uh, True. <laughs> especially with YouTube. Oh my God. You, you want to talk about a system that got abandoned, um, channel memberships, uh, they, they uh, sent me a thing last year. They're like, if you turn on channel memberships, we'll give you like X amount of dollars, or whatever. Uh, and I was yeah. like, all right, fine, I'll, I'll do it. I turn it on and I was just like, okay, this is a really shitty system, but I can't wait for them to update it because Expand I see the potential it, yeah. here. They have not released, I, I'm not exaggerating, I signed up for this almost a year. They have not released a single update to that system since I signed up. I'm about to yeah. turn it off on my channel because I'm like, it's it's an abandoned system. It sucks. And they just, they just, evidently they're more concerned about adding uh porting the the library of stadia into youtube because that's that's a feature they're working on now <laughs> as opposed to working on something that was meant to be like their competitor to patreon and like twitch's like subscriptions and stuff like that. i i am shocked that they take 30 percent for what they're offering yeah. oh it's 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 a terrible fucking cut too yeah they could easily the problem is like the only the only time i ever did a membership personally was when somebody specifically did a trailer for our members only content and explained exactly how to do that, you know, exactly where to click and how to, how to go into join in order to get this content. I'm like, you know, I, I've been watching you for like a year or so I want to watch it. So I'll give you a couple bucks and, but nobody knows really how is it, how it works. And it's so, uh, it's not obvious how that works, yeah. but yeah. really it's, it's a built-in Patreon, which sounds awesome, but it doesn't really, nobody really <laughs> knows how it works. It's it's baffling to see them abandoning a system where it's like they are literally getting direct compensation for this. Every person who signs up for membership, that is money straight into YouTube's pocket. All they have mm. to do is cut in the person, who, the the channel, uh, the channel itself, and that's it. No, no uh, advertisers, no bullshit like that. And they still can't be asked to to just fix the system and make it better. What kind of shocked me was when I turned them on and how many people I got that could have could have joined through patreon or subscribe start but didn't and i suspect because it's just an extra account yeah 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 like the only benefit of youtube memberships is that you don't need an extra account but it's and that's such a bad service that's that... why i that's why i set it up too because i was like and that's why i advertise it to people as it's like listen if you don't want to use patreon or whatever use the channel memberships it's like it's you know no big deal to me do what's like most comfortable for you but like i don't even have that many channel memberships compared to my patreon so it's like no yeah. it and if there people, was like a built-in people, people are more willing to migrate to a second website to get the access to the same stuff than they are to actually use it on YouTube. And I don't blame people for that either because it's like YouTube it's it's another thing that's probably going to disappear in 6 months. Why am I going to yeah. why am I going to sign up for this? Yeah, it's hard to have confidence in that, but if they no, really did No, we don't did... know. We, we don't get any information on when they're going to cancel features. Yeah. No, Google's pretty bad about that. They'll just like kill something and, you, and you're like, oh, well, I was using that. I liked annotations because that way I could yeah. <laughs> warn people about something that I can't do otherwise. Yeah, the um, first time they tried to get rid of community contributed subtitles, they were like surprised that people didn't want them to do that. Yeah, which shows they don't talk to their creators. So Super Chats is the same revenue split. It's 70-30. Um, so it, like, it's not even that it makes more money than memberships. It, it does in the sense that something interesting I've noticed about viewer habits is that people are more likely to donate money to a stream than they are to become a, a patron. Mm -hmm. And they'll donate yeah. more money to a stream than they'll like 20 bucks on a stream, but like not even $3 for patronage. Yeah. There's actually like, that is like entitlement, mind you. No, it's just you get a more direct response. You might have this person respond to you live on on camera, so that or at least on stream. So that's it's it's seemingly more valuable because you might have their attention at that specific moment. So yeah, it, it definitely happens more that way. It's also easier to sell sell somebody on something uh, when you're like live face to face. Um, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, if uh, videos and stuff that's pre recorded and everything, so it's a little bit less personal. Um. So yeah, you get that aspect to it as well. Yeah. I'm a I'm a big proponent of YouTubers streaming on YouTube, though, um, uh, especially now that they've actually recognized that streaming on YouTube is a thing and they have a separate tab for live streams. Once they yeah. did that, I started streaming much more often on my channel because um, it 
helps build like a lot of momentum even if you don't have anybody donating or anything like that even if the streams don't get that many views uh i've noticed that it has a lifting effect for uh all your content so like all my videos started doing a lot better once i started streaming like semi-consistently like literally like once every two weeks uh, interesting i've noticed the so, opposite but i i stopped doing it on my main channel years ago because it was it was kind mm -hmm. of cannibalizing my views but maybe they changed something Oh, I, I don't know. I just, I, I've noticed when I do a live stream, my entire channel gets like a huge boost for like a week. Oh, nice. So um, that's why I always question people going to uh, going to Twitch, like um, and not to call him out or anything, but uh, Salt Factory streams a lot on Twitch. And it's like I've seen his live streams and stuff. And it's like you're only getting like 60 viewers on Twitch. Do you know, like if you streamed on YouTube, you'd probably get like five, six hundred viewers every night. Yeah. It's like, and he streams a lot too. So it's like, dude, you'd be making so much more money if you were on YouTube right now. I'm telling you. It can be pretty scary. Like, um, I don't know about you, but I get like a, an immediate dip pretty much within a day whenever I post anything good or bad. I'll get really? like a, di a dip of subscribers. Yeah. Um, oh, and subscribers. I, I, then, that, I don't care about that. Yeah. But like, it feels like it, it really gives you the anxiety to post the new things if you think you're going to have to earn it back, you know? Yeah. So um, not that so, it's everything, so but it just feels like I've I can damage my channel's uh, relevance that way. If I do anything on my channel, even if it's not public, I will see like if I disappear for a while and come back and just upload something that's unlisted, I will get a spike in views. Huh. Um. So, yeah, you do lose subscribers when you do stuff because there is a like auto filtering um, system for. It, it will eventually unsubscribe you somehow. We don't know how the mechanism works. YouTube denies it happens, but it does happen. I would like to see uh, if it would tell me why those subscribers, like give me a percentage breakdown of unsubscribers. This is actually really important information that you get in marketing a lot is um, mm. yeah, why exit people, surveys. yeah, yeah, exit surveys, exactly. And it's like, are people unsubscribing to me? Like, where are they unsubscribing from? How are they doing it? Is this like an automatic thing? Did their accounts get deleted or something like that? Like I, that's information I would really like to know. Um, but I think uh, Indigo, in your case, um, the, the problem is, is that your channel is just getting older, and um, people just like um, people just want to like they they might have even forgotten that they even subscribed to you at some point. Yeah, okay. and. Um, and they come in and you post something and they're like, oh, yeah, I don't really want to. I've done this before where it's like I forgot that I subscribed to somebody and they posted something after a while. I'm like, oh, I'm just going to subscribe. I'm like, uh, uh, I'm not into that, into that content anymore. Um, so that's another thing. That's another reason why I say like my channel has a expiration date is because after a certain point, I know uh, I'm going to be fighting against the natural um, entropy of my channel as well. Like old, I don't expect somebody who subscribed to me in the first year of my channel existing is going to keep watching my content five or six years later. I could, I never fucking did that. Most channels I follow is like for maybe a year or two max. And I'm a, and I'm a power YouTube user. I live on YouTube. Yeah. So it's yeah. It, I know it's it gets tougher. Thing. Yeah, I guess yeah. It's, it gets tougher. Like your first big hit will give you like 10, 20,000 subscribers. And then you do like uh, later on, you, you're like having to fight for like a, a thousand. <laughs> so it yeah. definitely there is sort of entropy, uh, oh, Jesus Christ, again. entropy <laughs> and uh, yeah, the, there you're kind of fighting as it. And also I'm, I'm terrible. I don't cover the same topics. I covered Diablo this month. I haven't talked about Diablo on my main channel since uh, other than a couple random little live streams here and there which are now unlisted since 2016. so yeah. my my uh search ranking for diablo is like <laughs> non-existent but so like yeah if i were to talk about a lot of elder school stuff i'm sure all that stuff would rank really well and do really well but i don't i don't want to become the oh let me talk about you know this week's elder scrolls news even though there hasn't yeah, been an elder scrolls game for 11 years the channel it becomes yeah. It becomes a, it's always about consistency. So you can have consistency in the concept that you're covering or the cons or consistency in your release. So yeah. Mandalore is one of my favorite uh, YouTubers as an example of like awesome. somebody who's literally breaking basically every single rule except one. And that's he releases consistently and you know the video that he's going to release is going to be good. Yeah. So he's able to cover so many different topics and stuff and consistently get good results. Uh, and he's been doing it, doing it for a while. It's just because his release schedule has always been solid.
Yeah, no, he's he's great about that. He's not like perfectly consistent. He doesn't do the weekly video or whatever. I have friends mm-hmm. that, that do that. I have friends that, you know, do uh kind of when it's done content, but he's a lot he's a lot more consistent than most in terms of just the amount of generally if it takes a couple months, you know it's gonna be a big video. But he, he does a he puts out a lot of content and he's really, yeah. really consistent. Yeah, you said like both consistent in, in releasing regularly and in quality. Like you can expect every video to have, have yeah. a a very high quality of just like humor, insight, uh, obscurity, things like that. And yeah, no, he's, he's got a really good thing going with that. Uh, somebody asked in, in chat, opinions on YouTube Red. It hasn't been called Red for years, it's called YouTube Premium. Horrifically overpriced, but I finally broke down and got it because I'm sick of ads and I also want to support people. So um, yeah. I don't... I don't think it's worth like was it twelve bucks a month or something like that. It's ridiculous for what you get, but you do. Uh, I will say, uh, like, I don't know the exact breakdown, but basically, watching a video with with YouTube Premium on is like worth a hundred or a more uh, of you know a non subscriber view in terms of the amount of money you give to that channel, uh, and you don't get ads. So if that's if you if you have the expendable income and you don't like ads and you want to support your people more, then go ahead and do it. But I, it they is overpriced. Other, <laughs> they drop other features too, like access to YouTube music and stuff. And I mean, True, the, the yeah. music library on YouTube is pretty freaking extensive. So it's like um, you could theoretically. Podcast, pod, yeah, the new podcast, podcast feature works through YouTube music as well. Yeah. So it's like you could theoretically get rid of your Spotify subscription. I wouldn't. Um, I subscribe to Spotify and YouTube Premium. Uh, so I signed up for YouTube Premium once I became, once I entered the partner program. I was like, all right, I'm going to sign up for YouTube premium because if, like, if I'm getting a paycheck from them, I might as well be paying that back to some of the creators that I watch now. And um, yeah, so like how the system works, as far as I'm aware, it works on like, uh, so it's like, say $6 of your $12 a month is going to go to creators. And the more yeah. videos that you watch, uh, it creates like a pool basically. And then at the end of the month, it rec- it reconciles that and splits it amongst the creators based on the percentage of time that you watched. So, yeah. and for me, I love the idea of having my view count more, uh, because it, yeah. it, it makes it feel like I'm actually doing something just watching, uh, like, uh, jeweler was a good example of when I was bringing this up last time, I loved watching his video, uh, because I knew like my view is actually going to go to him. Like it, it, it's, it's going to support him more and stuff like that. Uh, th- there's literally videos. Sometimes I will switch to like a private window or something so that I don't have YouTube premium just because I want to deny those people <laughs> or like, yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what their, yeah. <laughs> what their content is. And I don't, I don't want to give them my money. I, I would rather save my percentage for somebody that I actually really want to give that money to. And it's like, I like that. I like having that freedom. It empowers me as a viewer. Um, I don't know if that's worth 12, 12 bucks a month for most people. But uh, for me, I, I, I don't watch Netflix or anything like that. So it's like my subscriptions are YouTube and Spotify. That's it. So. Yeah, I don't, even know, I don't even know where an analytics are anymore. I was going to try to give a, an example of like roughly how much more your, your view counts, but I know that basically it splits it among all, all the people you watch and you do get a lot more per view. Is it going to like pay their bills? Just you? No, it's going to give them like, but, but bearing in mind, depending on how long your video is and how many ad breaks you have and, and how people, how much any people ad block you, because here's the thing. Ad block is like, I think in the double digits, if not, it's a plurality, if not a, uh, you know, majority of people have ad block. So that's, a, and, and then YouTube takes 50% of all ad revenue. Yeah. So yeah, you, you're, you're not only getting like half of the ads actually showing on your video, but also half of that is going straight to YouTube's pro, uh, pocket to be able I to pay for all, this, all the, all the streaming that they do. So I think at this point across my entire channel, I'm getting more money from YouTube premium than I am from ad revenue. <laughs> it could be, yeah. You might have some <laughs> dedicated viewers, but yeah, I mean, roughly speaking, I get like one to maybe $4 per thousand views. Yeah. So, and that's like a, that's if it's like a big video with like a few uh, where I, I feel justified in putting a couple ad breaks in, but yeah, so it's not, it's not, you know, you get these really big YouTubers that have these sponsor deals and stuff like that. I've never accepted a sponsor that actually goes on my video. So yeah, I know it, it, it can be a, it can be a rough time. And, and, uh, I've heard arguments both ways. Like you'd actually be, you'd be able to help your family and your friends and stuff more. If you took sponsors, I personally think it would kill my content, make it awful. So I don't do it that way, but 
Yeah, I know. I don't blame people for taking that offer because you can probably double your income if you take sponsors, if not forex. Oh yeah. So, I I just don't yeah. like um, I don't like being beholden to people. I don't like working on deadlines or schedules. So, uh, just from like a production standpoint, I really don't want it. Like, I just got a a thing for a game today, and they're like, "Yeah, can you release a video in like August?" And like, no. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hell no. Do you know how long my production takes? Yeah, that that and also like I would never take a gaming sponsor because it would completely undermine any sort of uh credibility. any sort of yeah, credibility like, you know, now before I talk about the the fall of civilization and the the uh how mobile games are ruining my my childhood. Let me talk about Raid Sh Shadow Legends, you know, yeah. like if I did that, <laughs> there it would be it'd be a joke. In the, game in the game review space who have been sponsored by games to review them. Yeah. Yeah. And that's ridiculous. Which, uh, yeah, B big ethical problem. <laughs> yeah, and then if so, like, okay, cool. I could just take in anything non movie, non video game related because that's those are the two things I primarily cover, right? So, all right, we'll establish titles. Uh, better help. Um, any of these, I'm not sponsored by any of these, by the way. These are all terrible things. <laughs> or like, uh, at least sponsors that have had major controversies. So, if like, their controversies. I think the jury's out on whether or not they're actually terrible. So like better yeah. help, a lot of people said was terrible for reasons that were uh, upfront uh, about their service. Like, yeah, yeah, it's not actually a it's not actually a great replacement for therapy. But if all you have is generalized anxiety disorders and like, you know, you don't need a real like high dollar therapist. Now, if you've got schizophrenia, you uh, might not want to go on better help. Established titles was like that was another one where the criticisms were stupid. Like, uh, did you know it doesn't actually make you a Scottish lord? And it's like, yeah, no shit. Yeah, yeah. I'm not. I, I'm not gonna be recognized by the fucking aristocracy because I paid fifteen dollars, or I, I think it's more yeah. than fifteen dollars. But like, the biggest controversy was like, were they actually doing fulfilling the eco requirements, whatever, as well? But yeah, I, I just use those as examples of ones that had recent, you know, not even they, recent. Yeah, they do. But they do get. Yeah. It is a controversy, and then you get to, like tied up in it and. And you have to apologize and bring in your dog on your lap is like, hey, look at cuddles. No, you know, no, I'm the, sorry. The new the new meta is uh, the, playing the ukulele. Oh, <laughs> you could, like, if I could play the learn how to play the ukulele with my dog on my lap, then I'll be sad. No, yeah. it's like someone actually did a 10 minute apology video <laughs> by playing the ukulele for 10 minutes. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, that, that's incredible. I that's gotta be one for the books. So, um. I actually got to run. I think my family's arriving right now, so I actually got to I got to run. But uh, I appreciate you having me on. I was actually going to end off when when Zarek left, but we just had such a thing good thing going. Um, yeah, welcome, welcome to our live streams. This is how we end up. Yeah. Once <laughs> uh, my first EFAP, I was on for almost twelve hours, and that was crazy. I, uh -huh. I was like a work day and a half of just being on one live stream. I don't think I even took a break. That was crazy. Did they invite but, you? Um, I think I reached out to Mueller. And actually, I was reaching out to him because I think he was going to cover the Matrix movie when it came out. He never actually ended up covering the Matrix movie, uh, but he ended up inviting me to instead, like a month later or so, he invited me to the Resident Evil stream. So um, kind of I introduced myself, said I was a fan, and then later he invited me. So basically kind of two way street, I guess. OK. But uh yeah, that was yeah. That was I'm happy to end it here. I'll be, I'll be doing more Starfield coverage where we're going to be watching some Todd Howard interviews. He did a couple with IGN. Uh, maybe we'll watch more of the Musk one. Maybe yeah, a, kind, like a kind of funny spacers. one. Kind of funny and, one. Is worth yeah, watching. and then the kind of funny one is like the big one where they said a bunch of stuff. Yeah, and Dropped then a few yeah. bombshells in there. Ideally, that should be the last like work stream where we're watching it. I'm not going to watch anybody's Starfield videos because they, they're all as clueless as I am. So. Yeah. Yeah, if, yeah. I, I guess if they release like any more trailers or something like that, you could do another stream. But for the time being, yeah, no, uh, thank you for having me on. I really, uh, really enjoyed this. I love getting to sit around and chat for a while. Yeah, no, no problem. I just figured you, you two would be a great addition to the conversation. And yeah, thanks for coming on. And short, such short notice as well. I <laughs> appreciate yeah, that. Sorry I, about that. I didn't have anything going on. It's it's Fourth of July. Surprisingly, I... <laughs> don't don't pre-order Starfield. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it, it, You know what? Not pre-ordering Starfield costs you nothing. Wait till lunch day. You can download it. You'll be happy. 
if it'll you dodge the bomb. Yeah, it'll be the same price. You may miss out like on a on some DLC you probably won't see for about 40 hours of gameplay. And some DLC uh, that's probably going to let, let's be honest, it's probably going to make like uh, an annoying like um compatibility issue with like mods and stuff anyways that you'd want to disable so. or it'll or to like completely ruin the progression of the game where it'll give you something early that you shouldn't have yet and ruins the pacing and, and difficulty of the oh game or something God. hang on do you want the image of what the uh pre-order bonus is <laughs> yeah sure <laughs> come on save i'm on the clock here all right you can put this up on screen. This is what you get for pre-ordering <laughs> Starfield. <laughs> yeah, let me pull this on. Okay, so let me drag it over. Oh, God, it looks... That looks... <laughs> getting some Fallout 76 vibes there. Yeah. That'll be 800 you, atoms, please. You'll miss out on all this, whatever this is, but um, <laughs> looks kind of phallic, actually, but... You know, you miss out on all this, but you will save, you'll, you will potentially save what, probably 70 bucks now. It's probably 70 mm -hmm. bucks in pre-order. If it's another dud, like Fallout 76 is, you'll save that money. And then, uh, if it's, if it ends up being bad, you'll save probably 50% of your money. If you buy it in like three months, waiting for and the first sale, you will literally hear about how good it is on September 1st. So like, mm -hmm. e even if you wanted the early access benefit, you could still get it. Cause it doesn't like it comes out for normal people on the sixth so yeah yeah and they're really like the more you buy into it the more the worse it's going to get like i think diablo 4 had a four or five day early access for like 20 dollars extra or something it's getting they're getting they're getting pretty ballsy with this like if you if you keep on buying into it it'll it will get worse they will start giving you like two weeks early access for 40 bucks that's 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 going to happen if you keep on buying like, no there's, stuff. there's like a there's like a correct amount of early access to give because the problem with early access is that that gets the word out fast on uh the game's quality and then that might end up with canceled regular pre-orders but then if they do what you said before where they do early access at the same time as review copies mm -hmm. they might kind of yeah but you're right there is if they go too long then people will kind of get the word out but if they i think yeah. five days is crazy yeah that is I was that is a lot like two days because two days is not like fast enough for the word to get out quickly enough the first time I heard about it is like it was a Friday release, and if you buy it early, you get it on Tuesday. But then it's they've gotten more and more. Uh, they've been trying to. It's a, and then there's the ones that have staggered releases. Like if you buy the the the, the deluxe edition, you get two extra days. If you buy the premium premium edition, you get four <laughs> days. It's like oh my god, we're back to yeah. we're back to augment your pre-order again. <laughs> yeah, so uh, it's a. Uh... Friday for pre, uh, the special edition pre-orders and Wednesday for the regular people. So it's literally the first weekend is going to be the pre-order people. So like you could wait till the third and they're like, that's the weekend. So you're going to hear all about the game's quality. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, don't pre-order. It doesn't, doesn't cost you anything. You'll miss out a couple cosmetics looks like, but you'll be happy in the end because you'll know you're either buying a good game or you, you dodged a bullet. So you know what though if if you want the watch go ahead and buy it <laughs> go ahead and buy like a samsung gear or whatever yeah, whatever's like, out there and actually you send, just, yeah. paint, just paint it white like no that's, <laughs> that's not gonna see that's not gonna get you late at twitchcon you need the, you need the watch you need the constellation watch yeah exactly i think you have to get laid to get the good watch <laughs> like pre-order people are gonna get the shitty watch <laughs> The, the one with like the the nasty like plastic band that's just yeah. like gonna fade after a year or two it's a plastic band that's only gonna fit the most dainty of wrists so it won't even <laughs> fit like the average <laughs> starfield player's wrist remember the uh the fallout 76 thing where you just stick your phone into a plastic case mm -hmm. oh yeah that was great hey it's kind of smart for making the pip boy cheap i guess i guess so Anyway, thanks so much for coming on, guys. Uh, good luck on your upcoming stream. I might hop on and say hello as well. All right. Thanks. I'll talk Thank to you guys later. See ya. Bye.